This just happened yesterday, so it's fresh in my mind. I'm not quite sure what to think of it, because it was just so bizarre and unbelievable. Maybe I was just sleep deprived. So last night at maybe 2300, I was walking around my block. My town is relatively safe, so I didn't feel in danger. Plus, it was a pretty night. I had been walking for around five minutes when a pale woman with blonde hair and a white dress caught my eye from across the street. She was about my height and looked to be around my age, too. I didn't actually pay attention to her after I first noticed her. While I circled the block again, she was on the same street, a couple of feet in front of me. She was standing on the curb, staring at the cars passing by. It was a main road, so even that late, people were still driving on it. I said hello to her and she turned her gaze toward me. I couldn't see her face super well, but from what I think I saw, she had no pupils, no color in her eyes. She just stared at me. After a while, I asked if she was okay. She didn't respond and simply pointed at the road. I was really confused and I didn't understand. Right then, a red car started coming down the road. She stepped into the road and the car slammed into her. It was a bloody mess. The driver immediately stopped and jumped out. It was a man in his mid-twenties. We both spoke about it, freaking out. He called the police and I went around the car to see the state of the girl. But once I circled around the car, she was gone. Not as in dead, gone, as in she wasn't there at all. The blood on the road was gone too, but not gone from his car. After the police arrived, they concluded that it was some kind of big hoax. A hoax by some kid who didn't know what they were talking about and some guy who just went along with it. The blood on the truck was brought into investigation, only to be found as paint. Nothing else was put up about it. I'm still not sure if what happened was real. It felt so real, but I don't believe in the paranormal. I don't know what it was. Was it some kind of waking dream? I remember it like it was a real event. I feel like I can't leave the house now. I don't understand anything, and I kind of feel like I'm going crazy. Has anyone else experienced anything like this? When I was 17, my 13-year-old sister died. I was moved out and living in Michigan at the time, and she was living with our mother in Texas. She and a friend that was staying the night with her snuck out to meet her friend's boyfriend, and at 1.50 a.m. in the middle of downtown, she was struck by an oncoming train and died. A little side note that I find strange is that that night, I had the feeling that something was coming. I was too afraid to sleep. I left the light on all night and I pushed my mattress far to one side so that I could line the bed frame with my crystals and hopefully protect myself from whatever was coming. I messaged a few of my friends even, telling them to stay safe. It never crossed my mind that my younger sister was in danger. At 5 a.m., I'm up watching TV with my roommate and my mom calls. She asks if I'm sitting down I run into my room and sit, and I ask her what's up. She tells me that Nan is dead and explains what happened. I swear my soul left my body for a moment. I heard my own screams like I was underwater. I barely remember the rest of the day, but I was able to go pack and I was on my way to Texas in a plane very early the next morning. I listened to how it's going to be on repeat for the whole ride. When I finally made it to my mom's, I bypassed everybody and went into my sister's room and sat on her bed, soaking up the last of her scent. The week was a blur. I held my mother, wrote the obituary. My older sisters and I planned her memorial. 
I wove together a crown of flowers from our yard for her to wear while she was cremated. I don't think any of us ate a single morsel of food, despite loving community members pummeling us with casseroles. Exactly seven days after her death, nearly to the minute, my older sisters and I were hiding behind the garage sharing a smoke. There was a light directly above us, illuminating the space we were in and shrouding the rest of the farm in an even blacker darkness. Suddenly I hear, Josie's on a vacation far away, come around and talk it over. So many things that I want to say. You know I like my girls a little bit older. Quietly at first, we all joined in for the chorus, confirming that they heard this song as well, and the next verse was louder. We joined in for the chorus again, and she's louder still, surrounding us. It sounded like she was singing from the darkness, directly next to the garage, and inching closer with every word. She sings the entire song, and then suddenly my sisters take off running and I follow. It's strange, I was scared. I mean, I was sure it was my sister, and yet I felt fearful. We all run inside and stand in the dimly lit living room, talking over what just happened. Two of my sisters swear that it was my mother singing on top of our old windmill, so the sound was traveling. My other sister and I swear it was Nan. One of my sisters creeps upstairs to check on my mother, and she's fast asleep. At this point, we all run outside, shrieking Nan's name into the dark, trying to get her to come back. She doesn't. We googled the song lyrics, and they were just absolutely perfect for expressing what she was trying to. She sang the whole thing, loud and clear. It still rocks me whenever I think about it. Absolutely crazy and unbelievable. About five years ago, when I was 14, my best friend and I, both female, went for a walk on a hiking route in our village. We had always known that it existed, but we'd never gone there, so we didn't know how long the hike would take. About halfway through, it started to get really dark outside. The route was a road through the woods that had no street lights whatsoever. So we called one of our guy friends that had a crosser bike to come so that we wouldn't be alone. He came and we continued our walk in complete darkness. He turned off the bike because it was loud and decided to just push it. We didn't use our flashlights because the moonlight illuminated our path. As we were walking and talking, I heard something about 20 feet away in the woods that sounded like a loud scream through crying. I immediately stopped and looked at my friends because I thought I was the only one who had heard it, but their terrified looks told me that they had heard it too. The two of them jumped on the bike and I ran after them to the first streetlight. Yeah, I know, they left me behind. We were panicking and trying to find an explanation for that sound. Maybe some kind of animal? Until I remembered a story about the Drekovac. I live in Balkan and I don't think the name has a translation but I guess I would call it maybe a howler or a screamer. Basically, it's a mythology creature characteristic in the Balkans, and there are probably 20 different beliefs as to what it is. This is the only paranormal thing that has ever happened to me, and to this day, I get goosebumps when I tell the story to somebody because I remember it like it happened yesterday. I've always had an open mind when it comes to spirits, ghosts, specters, whatever you want to call them. I'd never personally experienced anything until the night that I'm about to describe. A little background. I was about 23 years old and I had been in the US Air Force for about five years. I had moved from Texas, where I was raised, to Alaska. 
I had been deployed a couple of times and had been halfway around the world at least twice. While traveling, I had seen the dance clubs in the Philippines and seen the party scene in the areas just off base in South Korea. I was married to my first wife, and we had since moved to a base called K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to be exact, about three and a half hours northeast of Green Bay, Wisconsin. For some reason or another, the first wife and I had several of our friends come over and we were having some kind of movie or game night. In our base house living room, we had two TVs running. One had a movie, another had a game system, and we were all just playing some games and having fun. We were one seat short for the number of folks we had over, and we would take turns standing as somebody would get up for some reason or another. Move your meat, lose your seat rule was in full effect. I was sitting in the middle seat of our couch, and a friend, Fox, was standing near some windows behind me to the right. I thought I heard somebody whisper my name from the kitchen area that was behind me to the left. I craned my neck over to see if there was someone in there that I wasn't aware of, but nope. I figured I was just imagining things and I got up to check the kitchen and head to the bathroom. The bathroom was right near there. When I came out, Fox had taken my seat, so I started standing where he had been. From where I was, I could see our whole living room and kitchen area, just watching the movie and people gaming. Then I heard it again. Somebody whispered my name, but louder. Fox craned his head around to look into the kitchen, just as I spun my head over to look in there. Fox, did you hear that too? Yeah, he said. Someone said your name. From where I was, I could see everybody that was in my house at once and nobody was in the kitchen. Fox could see everybody except me. I trotted into the kitchen and turned on the light, and that's when I saw a shape outside of the kitchen window on the little porch where the door was. The best way to describe what I saw next is this shape was something that looked like The Undertaker from WWE. Big, broad-brimmed hat and all dark colors. The shape turned and stepped down the steps, and turned out of the little bit of light that was coming from my window. I was a young buck and I was thinking, ain't no way someone's gonna peek into my windows, so I beat feet to the door and out into the night. But there was no one. When I came out of the door, I had a clear view for about 75 to 100 feet in all directions, and there was nothing moving out there. Most of my neighbors had dogs and none of them were barking. It was silent. No barking dogs, no insects, no engines, nothing. A couple of my friends had joined me outside and none of us saw or heard anything. Now I've been six feet tall since I was 18 years old and I went back in and had my ex-wife hold her finger where the shoulder of the shape was. I went outside and the shoulder of this thing was around four inches higher than my shoulder. So this thing was at least six four. No one in the house other than Fox heard my name called, and nobody saw the shape except me. The fact that Fox did hear my name is the only reason I don't think I imagined it. That was the night that I became a true believer in the supernatural. This happened in 2009, during my summer holiday when I was eight years old. As we had done for many years, my family and I went to Cordoba, Argentina, and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened at that cabin, like objects moving around, strange noises, or even items that just disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when I suddenly got up in the middle of the night. I looked in front of me, and there was an old, creepy woman who was just staring at me. She didn't say a word, so I just closed my eyes, and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran to my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. 
One day, I struck up a conversation with the owner, and he was telling me about some strange noises he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision that I had had. He just answered, You are not the first one that that has happened to. Many people have reported having visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night. I will try and give as much detail as possible and keep this from going on for too long. This happened back in the summer of 2015 when I was serving in the United States Army Reserves. I was stationed in southern Alabama in a transportation company. Sometimes my girlfriend would come with me on drill weekends and we would crash at a friend of hers apartment, which is where this incident took place. This particular weekend, we were in a large convoy in the middle of nowhere, on some back road out in the sticks, well over a hundred miles from the city. That was when I got the most confusing, bizarre, and downright creepy phone call of my young life. She was in utter hysterics. She was crying and screaming, wondering why I would frighten her so badly, what my problem was, and asking me how I even pulled it off. After I was finally able to calm her down, this is the story that she relayed to me. Sometime that afternoon, her friend was at work and she was at the apartment by herself. Suddenly, there was a loud bang on the door. Not a knock, several loud, violent bangs. After looking through the peephole, she saw me, but there was something off. She says that I was wearing my army uniform and it looked like me but I had this very angry, aggravated look on my face. She opened the door wondering why I was home so early and apparently without saying a word, I angrily blew past her, shoulder checking her into the wall and quickly walked down the hall, taking a left into the bedroom, slamming the door behind me so hard that the whole place shook. She was of course very alarmed and confused about why I was home so early and in such an agitated state. I mean, that is so out of character for me. I'm not a violent guy at all. On top of that, if something did happen to set me off, she would have been the first to hear about it. So she's walking behind me, trying to get some information out of me. She opens the bedroom door behind me and sees the closet door slam shut. So she proceeds to run over to see what I was doing in her friend's closet and claims that when she opened the door, it was completely empty. That's when she had a panic attack and called me. Imagine my shock and confusion hearing that story, knowing that I was well over 100 miles away at the time. She finally believed me after I sent her a photo with my current GPS location, which only served to freak her out more. I thought that there must be some kind of rational explanation for what she saw. I'll be honest and save it, she did smoke a little weed here and there, but at the time I know she was sober and it doesn't usually cause stuff like that. She didn't mess around with hard drugs or drink, and she had no mental illnesses of any kind. Over the years since that happened, I came to learn about doppelgangers. I don't know what they mean, what they represent, or why they come around. All I know is that they're creepy as shit, and a girl I dated for several years came face to face with mine, and it put the fear of God into the poor girl. Take this story for what you will, and I honestly don't care if you believe it or not. I just wanted to get it off my chest. To preface this entire post and give complete transparency, I've been a long time lurker of paranormal and ghost related subreddits and websites since I was a little kid with access to the internet. I have always been a believer in the paranormal. However, I have also been a very hard skeptic, as I have never dealt with anything paranormal in my entire life, until this event. There's a ton of people on subreddits like these that conjure up BS stories to practice their writing, and it bugs me to no end that there are unfortunately no sure ways to tell what's real and what's somebody's fictional narrative writing anymore. 
It blurs the line between reality and fiction, and with people's experiences like mine. With that said, this event messed me up, and it still keeps me up at night to this day. I have nothing to gain from retelling this experience here. I was convinced by some of my closest friends to post my experience, even if this did happen a long time ago. This happened almost a year ago. My girlfriend and I visited her parents' house, which was her old home in Alabama, specifically Crenshaw County. For those that don't know, that's basically in the middle of nowhere, the boonies, the sticks. Being from a large city myself in Southern California, I'm completely out of my element. I've already visited her parents once before with her. She's always told me her house was haunted and that the woods were sketchy at night. But when I visited the first time with her, nothing happened whatsoever. So I chalked it up as some tall tale to creep me out, play with the city boy. That is until we visited her parents the second time. Her father works in Montgomery for the weekdays, so he's gone a lot. And her mother had to be in Atlanta for three days due to a job. We were home alone for those three days, unless you want to count her cats as well. The one-story house is in the middle of absolute nowhere, with the nearest house down the road from us aways. One of those nights around 12 a.m., I'm sitting in my bed with her, completely asleep. I'm scrolling through Facebook and Twitter when I began hearing what sounded like my girlfriend's voice coming from her. I turned to look at her to see if she's sleep talking, but nothing. She's quiet. I continue going through my notifications for a bit and I hear her again. This time though, it sounds like it's coming from outside behind the bedroom wall, toward the same direction as my girlfriend and much louder and echoey. I get up and I look around to see if any television is on or if any of the cats are making noises, even though the TVs aren't in the direction I heard the voice from, but nothing. The TVs are off and the cats are asleep or just quietly lazing around. I even checked her phone, which was on the nightstand to my right, just in case it was playing audio or something, but nothing. It was just charging. I go back to bed with her and continue going about my business, but this time I'm looking out for the voice. This time I hear it again, but much clearer and louder. It sounds exactly like my girlfriend's voice, and this time I knew for sure it was coming from outside. I know this because she's sleeping on my left, and toward my left is also the wall, on the other side of which is a clearing and then all dense woods. After this, I shift all of my focus and all of my attention to the loud voice, seeing if I hear it again. This is the part where I internally start saying, no, nah, I'm done. I'm not finding out what you are. I've seen way too many movies and YouTube videos, and I know that I'm not going out there to find out. I heard the voice one more time, yet this time it didn't sound closer, just a little farther which leads me to believe that it's something physically moving around the clearing bordering the woods. The scariest thing about the voice that got me freaked out though, it was still clear enough that I started making out human speech, but it was messed up. Like it was speaking in phrases using my girlfriend's voice, but none of the words made any sense. It's like it was trying to speak English, but it came out reversed or something. At that point, I did one final check around the house to see if all the doors were locked. My rational mind was thinking it was probably just a lost somebody in the woods. Definitely not a Wendigo or a skinwalker or whatever. I made sure the curtains were closed and I just went to bed. I told my girlfriend the very next morning and she seemed rightfully freaked out, but we ended up cracking jokes about it to cope. I posted this experience to Facebook about a week after, and a lot of my friends threw around thoughts that it could very well have been something paranormal. A friend of my girlfriend who studies cryptozoology asked me a ton of questions relating to the incident and basically flat out said, yeah, that's a Wendigo. Yet, I don't know how credible of an opinion that would be. I'm inching into believing it, 
because what I heard that night was exactly my girlfriend's voice. I swear I could make out my name in the garbled up speech that I was hearing, but I'm not too sure on that much. Like it was trying to lure me into the woods. Whatever it was, it had my girlfriend's voice, pitch, tone, and patterns just right enough for me to listen, but not enough to get me out there with it. I haven't been back since, but we are planning to go back in October and to go to Disney World with her family. I'm just hoping that whatever it was isn't there anymore. So I was talking to my buddy today and he told me a story that happened to him around September of last year. He was driving around 9.30 to 10 o'clock at night on a kind of secluded road in a suburb of the city of Huntsville. There are woods on both sides of this road. As he was driving, he thinks he sees a deer heading toward him. As he sees it more clearly, it turns out that this deer is on two legs has antlers, and is running toward him. He said that it was mostly dark in color and was running pretty fast from the side, so he slammed on his brakes to try to avoid it. As soon as it got close to his headlights, it disappeared. Your guess as to what happened is as good as mine. My theory was that it jumped over the car while my buddy was swerving to avoid it. He said he still has nightmares about it, and that he also isn't a big ghost person, but whatever it was, he swears he's never been that afraid. I have no idea what this could be. I don't know any of the legends around North Alabama that match his description. We've started to refer to it as Antler Man, but beyond that, we have no idea. Back when I was 18 or 19, I had decided to go into a church in Cherokee, Alabama with my once friend, we'll call him Joel, and his family. I had gone in and Joel and I were directed to the basement with all the other people under 20 to do something. I forgot what it was, but maybe five to seven minutes in that basement, I got the most blinding headache I've ever had and excused myself outside to get some air. I waited for everybody to get done, and then we headed back to where Joel and his parents lived. The whole ride, this headache did not go away. I stayed at their house maybe an hour or two while this headache just continued to get worse and worse, so I attempted to drive home to Crooked Oak. As I'm driving, the headache becomes all but blinding, and halfway home, in the night, on this dark road, I stop at this little tiny backwoods church. The pain was so immense that I couldn't focus on anything. At that point, I literally was wishing to be struck dead to escape this. I stumbled out of my Jeep and I landed on the first bit of grass I could find and I almost passed clean out. After a good stretch of time, once the pain had left me, I went to drag myself to the Jeep with my senses returned. And that's when I realized that I was laying on somebody's old grave. I have no idea why it helped, and I didn't do it intentionally, but there it is. To this day though, I refuse to go near that church. My husband's parents live in a tiny town in Alabama. They've lived there for a long time. We went to visit them a few years back and we were excited to get out of town for a bit, see some different scenery. His sister was graduating college and we were going to celebrate. She's also an avid ghost hunter and believer. So when I told her about some of my experiences, she was excited to take me to some of the haunted locations around town cemeteries, old abandoned houses, 
even a Hell's Gate, which we didn't actually end up going to, as I told her I had a bad feeling about it and refused. We drove around almost all night, just looking at different locations and talking about the history of the town. A lot of residual energy and weird feelings were about as we went to the different places. We came to a cemetery in a new portion of town. Fancy houses surrounded it on three sides. On the third side was a small canyon area of land. Nothing really felt off. The cemetery was new and didn't have many headstones yet. It was fenced off with ornate wrought iron fencing. We didn't see anything lurking. No shadows darting from tree to tree or headstone to headstone. It was just there. After walking around to the open side where there were no houses, I asked his sister, let's call her Beth, how come there were no houses on this one side? She shrugged and said that they stopped building months ago, even though this was supposed to be a new subdivision. They had purchased all this land and probably needed to figure out a way to build it up, since it was very canyon-like. We decided to get a closer look at the canyon area, although we couldn't see much since it was dark and our only light came from the streetlights. We had walked far enough to be outside of what they could illuminate. Far off in the distance, I saw what looked like a campfire. I pointed it out, but she couldn't see it. Neither could my husband. Beth began to have a sinking feeling, and before she could say anything, I started getting a massive headache, and I heard pounding like drums. I got flashes of images in my head, people dancing around a big fire. The night sky seemed blacker and darker than it had before. Beth grabbed my arm and said we needed to leave. My husband was already halfway to the car. As I turned my back to the canyon, it was almost like I had a twinge of fear run up my spine and a shiver. We ran back to the car. As we drove away, I could feel a black mass following our car as we drove the winding streets back to the main road. It felt big and foreboding, like it was flying behind us. I started to panic, and I felt my throat and chest tighten. Once we crossed the main road, it was almost like it couldn't follow us past that point, but I could feel it, watching us, as we continued back to his parents' house. I asked Beth if she had seen anything, but she refused to talk about it. None of us slept that night, and my headache didn't subside until morning. I did some research on the area the next day, and I found out that it had been home to the Chickasaw Indian tribe back in the day, likely still was in some ways. I have Blackfoot and Choctaw blood, and later thought that maybe since I was a neighboring tribe, they didn't want me there. I still don't really know what happened, but we've never spoken about it since. In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm gonna have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life, but here, on the wilds of the internet, though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. 
For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10 minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes. Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart. But I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop, until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the boards settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen, moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them, and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated, the same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, Oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now, my twin's room was the coldest in the house, and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency. My twin was starting to get depressed, sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. In that digital camera my twin was playing around with, there was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study, where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, Ouch! very clearly 
into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year, with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend, and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake, and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange, and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening, and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom, and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone, I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk, filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen, where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was alright. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later, my second episode of a sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. A weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur, and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath, and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me. 13, and three. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious. Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, 
and I still do every time I tell the story. So this is a true story that happened to me, which I'm weary to share, as there have been many times where I've opened up only to be met with ridicule. But I hope you take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off of Highway 82 in Alabama called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there, and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings. Bryce, the residence hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall, the bigger of the two, I'll share with you now. My second visit to Old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was me, my girlfriend, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with an anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left, and then a quick right, and you are in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand, and my camera in the right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left, at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom, and shined the light that way. Nothing. I moved the camera and light, thought I saw it again and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white, illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction over the course of just two frames, she's behind the door halfway, and in the next frame, she's gone. My heart felt like ice water had run through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger one, maybe 10, hair parted in the middle, an unusually large forehead, and was deformed in some way. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. This is where it gets even weirder, though. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that windows grow back, and if you do any damage to them, spirits will follow you home. I broke a window on accident. I was laying in bed one night at about 3 to 4 a.m., I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was, and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing, tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless, as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of maybe 20 seconds. Once it covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. I cringed tightly, and for some reason I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped, and the whole incident left me on the verge of tears. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to legend, it makes sense. This started a few years ago, and so far, there's been no explanation of the things that keep occurring. 
I live in the southern United States, near a national park, in a fairly rural area. So, our first guess was that this had to be some kind of wildlife. Something that was just scaring us for no reason other than to get into our own heads. However, after a ton of internal explanations, we finally came to the conclusion that we had none. The first thing that occurred was fairly brief. It was shortly after the death of my uncle, who was fairly close to us before he passed. He was a veteran, and while in the army, he had volunteered to have shock treatments that altered his personality greatly. This had occurred during the Vietnam era, while he was stationed in Germany. My grandmother was in the bathroom, and I was in my room, just playing a game, when out of the blue, the wall sounded as if somebody was beating on it, trying to get our attention. Three loud knocks, then nothing. We were worried that something had happened to our neighbor, an elderly woman, and she needed our help. But after we went outside to check, there was nobody there. Fast forward a few months and we started hearing footsteps on the roof. They started out light and easily explainable, something along the lines of a cat walking on the roof. We had seen it happening a few times, so we thought nothing of it, until the footsteps started to get a bit heavier. Eventually, it started to sound like something that weighed more than I did was sprinting across the roof every night from one end of the house to the other. Things got worse after that. We started to find dead animals around the property. While some of it could be explained as roadkill, we do have a lot of problems with people speeding due to a lack of police presence in the area. But there were a bunch of random things we would find dead nearby as well. We would find crows and ravens with broken necks lying in our backyard, the occasional snake. And at one point, we found a deer that literally walked onto our property and dropped dead. There was no visual wound anywhere on the deer's body when we found it. We started to hear things inside the house soon after, see things out of the corner of our eyes that would vanish before we could turn to get a good look, scratching mainly. We've put rat traps and every kind of poison we could think of in the walls, but there are no sign of any vermin. We would hear whispers at night, like somebody was trying to talk to us. We're rational people, we check to see if there were cracks in any of the windows or door frames that could make the wind blow in and sound strange. But from everything we've checked, there doesn't seem to be any opening that could make that noise. One of my old friends, who, before this story, was as skeptical as I was, was sitting in my living room playing something on our PlayStation when he thought he saw somebody walk past the window. Not too scary, right? Well, my windows are nearly 10 feet off the ground, our house is raised to allow water to pass under it to prevent any water damage, and the place he claims to have seen the man wasn't near any stairs. He came to visit another time about a month later. We were sitting and talking to one another when he said he had to use the bathroom and left to do his business. He goes, and when he comes back, he's pale white and terrified. When I asked him what was wrong, he was evasive to say the least. So we got in the car and we drove down to Sonic to grab some food and talk. He told me that he saw somebody staring at him from my room as he was walking back, smiling at him with yellow eyes. He doesn't really come around anymore, at least he doesn't stay past nightfall. I don't know if what he claims is true or not, but it still scares me to think about just how scared he was. I've tried cleansing the house with sage. We have a crucifix in every room. Near the front door, we have three. We've even duct taped the back door shut and have it locked to be absolutely certain nothing can get in. But still, everything persists. Update. It's been nearly a year and the activity got much worse after I shared my story. At first I thought maybe I had angered whatever was in the house. However, I think my experiences deserve at least some form of documentation. Whether you can believe it or not is up to you. First of all, I'd like to talk about a story that I originally didn't share. Obviously, everybody in this story will have aliases. One year prior to sharing my story the first time, my younger cousin had committed side following a manic episode. He had hanged himself saying that he wanted to see his grandfather who had passed away earlier that year. One year later, just two weeks before I shared my story, his older brother followed suit. 
just through a different method. Whether it was paranormal, or just mental illness or depression, I don't know. But following some of the experiences that I've had over the past year, I think there could at least be some kind of connection. Then again, I'm not even sure if I'm sane at this point. The month following my first story was extremely active. I would feel sick and nauseous almost constantly, and sleep was a constant struggle. Even now, I find myself unable to go to sleep until morning, thanks to the anxiety and the feeling of being watched. Knocks on the walls are a daily occurrence. The smell of excrement has become a normal thing. I wake up with the sheets pulled off my bed so often that I actually had to buy clip-on straps and connect them to the bed so that they would stay on overnight. And it gets so cold that even in the middle of summer in central Alabama during a heat wave, I found myself having to use multiple blankets just to stay warm at night. These are the normal events that happen almost every day, but some nights it gets much worse. Thanksgiving of last year, I had a terrible nightmare that culminated in me waking in a cold sweat just before I smelled smoke in the room. One of the electrical outlets had caught fire. For those who have been in a fire, you'll likely know some of the things that occurred. The smoke inhalation caused me to cough for weeks. I was barely able to speak through my scratchy voice, and ash had gotten into my PC, leading to it needing heavy repair, taking months to finally get fixed. I spent the next few weeks sleeping in a different room, more afraid of a fire breaking out than I was of a paranormal experience. Since I didn't sleep in my bedroom, I would sleep in the recliner in front of my TV, usually falling asleep to YouTube that I played through my PS4 or some kind of music to calm my nerves. Nightmares at this point were a regular thing. I didn't bear them any second thought. And although, ironically, they seemed to get a bit better outside of my bedroom, they still happened regularly. Some nights I would wake up to the heavy footsteps moving on the roof before finally falling back asleep. Some nights I would wake up to something violently shaking the chair I was sleeping in. Others I would wake up to see a shadow figure in the mirror placed behind my TV. Nothing could compare to the things that were going to happen once I moved back into my room, though. Shortly after moving back into my room, I remember having a nightmare and waking up to a figure standing near the foot of my bed, pointing down to the electrical socket that had caught fire previously. It was as if it was mocking me. The tall and thin figure was almost featureless, with its yellow eyes depicting almost a joy in them. I don't remember much from that afterward. I think I may have fainted due to the fear. The nightmares afterwards started telling me to do things, like an invasive thought that I would keep having dreams of walking to the cliff outside my house and jumping off of it, the feeling of falling before waking up in a panic, usually just after I would see that figure in the dream. Then it wasn't just in my dreams. I would start having these thoughts throughout the day, too. The same sort of invasive thought of going out to the cliff and jumping. I'd like to note that I am in no way suicidal. I've never had one of those thoughts in my life before. It's only been since these paranormal things have started to occur. I eventually started to get angry over really simple things. Small, inconsequential things started to infuriate me, which would always come back to, you should just jump and I started to question why. Once I really started to question those thoughts, the activity started to worsen. It got more violent. I'd feel pains like needles pricking into my legs at night. I'd hear growling around the house. At one point, I even woke up feeling as if somebody was sitting on me and choking me. The nightmares eventually became less about self-harm and more about violent acts being inflicted upon me usually by the figure that I previously described. Insects began to be a normal sight around the house. Flies, roaches, spiders. It seemed like we were getting invaded by anything and everything that I hated. The walls of my room at this point looked more like an insect graveyard than a paint job. Granted, I don't know if insects are connected in any way to the paranormal, but it never happened before. I just wanted to make sure I got all the details down. 
I've considered just documenting things, getting a spirit box and an EMF, just seeing what I can do with them. I'm afraid it'll just anger whatever's here, and that it will lash out and get somebody else hurt. If it were just me living here, I'd be fine with it, but I don't want to risk it hurting my grandmother. She's had experiences too, but according to her, if she just ignores it, then there's nothing to worry about. Once, she told me about a shadow figure that she saw when she woke up. She told it, you aren't real, and just went back to sleep. I don't know how she can do that. Maybe it's morbid curiosity, but I can't just deny the things I've been seeing and experiencing. Anyway, I just had to talk about it to someone. I'm afraid if I talk to anybody else about this in real life, they'll just think I'm crazy. At times, I think I'm crazy. But this stuff has been happening, and I have no idea why. In 2017, one of my good friends lived in Portland, Oregon. He was offered a job in Long Island, New York, and took it. He asked me to fly out so I could road trip with him across the country so he wouldn't be alone. Of course, I agreed and flew out from JFK to PDX. We have many stories from this road trip, but none stranger than what happened to us in Ohio. After a few days on the road, we had entered Ohio. I wish I remember exactly where this took place, but I honestly don't recall. All I know is that it was past Zanesville, heading east, where we had stayed the night before. My buddy was driving as I was reaching toward the ground, trying to grab my phone that I had dropped. He suddenly said, This old lady next to us keeps pointing at me. I think she wants me to pull over. I, always paranoid, said, F that dude, keep driving. But he pulled over. A black Escalade with plates from Alaska pulled in front of us. Out hopped a woman, no younger than 60, and said, I'm glad I got to you boys when I did. Your tires are smoking. It's important to note that we were towing his Camry with the U-Haul we were in. Side note, what happened in Zanesville was that we got stuck in the parking lot, couldn't back up, so we had to rehitch his car. We realized later he had left the emergency brakes on. Anyway, after she said this, we looked at each other, completely puzzled, and immediately at the tires. They were absolutely smoking, looking like they had bullet holes in them. This is where it gets strange. Not even a few seconds after we kneeled down to inspect the tires, she was gone. No goodbye, no sound of a car pulling off, just gone. The whole interaction from her getting out of the car to her vanishing couldn't have been more than 15 seconds in duration. I didn't have a doubt in my mind that she had literally vanished. My friend looked at me pale as a ghost, confirming exactly what I was thinking. I don't know for sure what would have happened if we hadn't stopped. I don't know if the car would have caught fire or anything else. But I do know that, real or not, to us she was an angel. I've tried to look into stories like this, but haven't had any luck finding anything. What do you think? I have struggled with the idea of sharing my experience mostly because I don't even know if it actually happened or if it was just a dream. One night in the summer when I was about 10 or 11, I was awoken in the middle of the night. I could hear the horses running around the pasture as if something had happened to startle them. I decided to get up and go check on things. At that time, my family had a massive old barn and we lived in the middle of nowhere. I walked through the door of the barn and found a very large man as wide as snow, climbing into the hayloft. I remember being startled, but not scared. He turned around and looked at me and slowly lowered himself back down. He took a few steps toward me before he knelt down and put out his hand like one would do to a stray animal. As I looked at him, I felt like he looked sad and tired and not at all like he would do me any harm. 
I decided to take his hand and walk him toward our kids' hangout space, which was just a space in the barn where we had some old couches, a few toys, and a radio. As soon as he saw the radio, he became more animated, ran toward it, and started messing around with it. That went on for a little bit, and I kept asking him what he needed the radio for. He never said a word, not one word. He wouldn't give me a name, so I just started calling him Radio. After some time, he sat the radio down and sat down on the couch. I brought over my favorite horse book, and he started thumbing through the pages. I started showing him all of my favorite horse breeds. Eventually, he gently took the book from me and closed it as if to say, I'm done. I got up to put the book away and he laid down on the couch. I remember him being so large that his head was on the armrest while his legs hung over the other armrest at the knee. He was a giant, pure white, and I don't recall any hair. His eyes were jet black, but they weren't huge or angular. If anything, they slanted downward a bit and were very beady. After he fell asleep, I decided to go back into the house and go to bed. I put a blanket over him before I went in, so he wouldn't get cold. I woke up in the morning and the whole experience came flooding back to me. My feet were dirty, as if I had been outside during the night. I grabbed some snacks and ran out to the barn. I ran to our hangout space and found everything as I would have expected it. The blanket was on the floor, the book was sitting on the table, the radio was out of place, but he was gone. It's important to know that I had a habit of sleepwalking at this time in my life. So, I guess it's possible that this was all just an elaborate dream. At first, I thought he was just a very, very strange person, and I hoped that he found safety. The memory never left me, and by the time I was a teen, I had decided that I had dreamed the whole thing and I let it go. Then, Prometheus came out and I agreed to go see it with friends. When the tall white alien came on screen, I nearly jumped out of my seat. It wasn't an exact likeness, but it was like seeing a ghost of someone I had once met. At the time, I knew absolutely nothing about aliens, and the only one I had ever heard of was the classic Little Green Men. Nonetheless, I forced myself to let it go and move on. That memory could not be real, so I must have dreamed it, right? As time passed, I started wondering how I could have imagined a being that I had never heard of or seen any imagery of. Could that have really happened? Could radio be real? This happened in Calaveras Big Trees National Park in the Sierra Nevada Mountains of California on Highway 4. There's an overlook that affords a vista of the Stanislaus River Valley. For those familiar with the park, it is where Oak Trees Parkway turns into Big Trees Parkway. As you drive from the park entrance and head down into the valley toward the campgrounds, my father, my little sister, and myself at 12 years old were in my father's truck headed up the hill away from the campgrounds, driving toward the park entrance with the intention of going shopping in nearby Arnold. As we came upon this overlook, I saw at least four or five cars parked on either side of the road. There were a good number of people standing around and looking into the valley at something. The next thing I know, I was gradually coming to consciousness from some sort of stupor or hypnotic state. It was like gradually awakening from anesthesia. I was sitting straight up and my eyes were open. I looked around the cab of the truck. My dad was driving and my sister was sitting there. Both were in a kind of trance state, not really saying anything. After about a minute, they also started moving around like normal and talking. We had exited the park and driven down Highway 4 almost to Arnold, a distance of about six miles, and all of us are missing that time. If I remember correctly, half an hour to 45 minutes was missing. I don't know if it's simply missing time or a potential alien abduction, and I don't know what everybody was looking at, but we still can't explain it to this day.
This happened three to four years ago, and I've been thinking about it recently. It was late one night, around 11.30 p.m., and I'm driving home from my job at Sonic. I was taking US 64 home, which is a fairly desolate stretch of road with houses and farmland on either side. I was in my 99 Ford Explorer, and I was just driving along at about 65 to 70 miles per hour with the radio on a low volume. As I'm driving, through my sunroof comes a bright green ray of light that envelops the interior of the vehicle. This lasts for about two to three seconds and then disappears without a trace. After it happened, I just sped up and got home as quickly as possible. I was only about five minutes away anyway. That's really about all there is to the story, but I was young and it really freaked me out. I've pondered and pondered, but I have no clue what it could have been. I wasn't tired because I woke up around five or six that day, and I have no history of illnesses that could have caused that. I wasn't on any medications, nothing like that. I've told a few people and they don't think I'm lying. I've never been the kind to lie about that kind of stuff, but nobody can give me a solid answer either. Some have said maybe it was a laser, but I don't think there's any way that a laser could completely cover my vehicle in green light like that. There was also a farm I was passing by and no street lights. Has anyone had any similar experiences or can anyone offer any insight as to what happened? It would be much appreciated and would ease my mind. So I'm in my bed, covered in sweat, shaking and scared. This is my second experience with them. The first time they watched me, we weren't in the same room, but I could feel them watching me, and I saw their light from the space in the doorframe. It was greenish yellow. Time distortion happens when they initiate contact. Also, I don't remember hearing any sound at all during either encounter. This time was horrifying. I woke up and saw faces on my ceiling. They weren't detailed, but they looked human. Their features were outlined with a pink light. They're interdimensional and are invisible to my knowledge. I felt two of them grab my arms. I struggled physically. I think they were really latching onto my consciousness, but our auras are human shaped, so really they were grabbing the energy in my arms. I could feel their grip and their strength. They're smaller and weaker than us, but they have large hands and long fingers, and I could feel them pulling me. Although I got out of bed and struggled physically, pulling and jerking my arms out of their grip in a spasm of defensive flailing, it dawned on me that they were trying to separate my consciousness from my body. So in reality, my physical struggle made no difference. After the struggle, it seemed like about a minute or so long. They let go. I'm not on drugs, although mentally, physically, and spiritually, I am exhausted. I believe they come for us when we are vulnerable. I survived my encounter and was able to share it, but now I wonder, when people die or have heart attacks or strokes or just collapse, were they victims of some kind of alien abduction? Are their corpses just hollow vessels left behind by interdimensional soul thieves? I don't know. All I know is that I've been experiencing unexplained phenomenon, and I believe them to be alien. I don't know anything else beyond that. I just went out for a walk before bed. I saw what I thought were very close shooting stars a couple of times. The third or fourth time I saw it, I gasped because I noticed that there were different colored lights coming from some kind of flying object. Then I saw it zoom off, leaving the very bright shooting star kind of trail behind it. It was there for a split second, but I saw it. 
very bright. It quickly descended from the sky right by my house. I rushed inside and looked out a window, and I saw it zoom off again away from me. The things I'm seeing lately, it's getting harder to deny their presence. I know it's not the longest story, but I've been seeing strange things a lot, and I'm pretty sure they're aliens. Growing up, I had seizures every now and then when I would fall asleep. I wasn't diagnosed with epilepsy, but for some time, I was having them until I finally grew out of my late teens. Due to being able to choke and hurt myself when I would have an episode, my parents placed a baby monitor in my room. Also, my room was connected to my brother's through our bathroom. It was basically a short hallway, and we can see each other's beds from each other's rooms. Both of our doors were always open when we would go to sleep, just in case if my brother needed to be there for me. Now, on another side note, I saw the movie Dark Skies, so you guys can have a better understanding of this alien that I encountered. The movie alien species, I believe, are supposed to represent the greys. They're a species of alien that are known to have telepathic powers, and even be to the point where they can alter people's memories of certain incidents. In the movie, the alien is causing the family's son to have horrible nightmares. In a sense, to break the family down emotionally, maybe so that the abduction would be easier. Anyway, I don't think this encounter had to do with an abduction, but more in the sense to just torment. So, I'm probably around 12 or 13 years old when this took place. My brother was about 16 or 17. One night, probably about an hour before my brother and I would have to wake up for school, I woke up to my brother walking down the bathroom hallway into my room. I remember just randomly waking up to him walking toward me. When he got into my room and there was more light from my nightlight, I saw that he was crying. He told me that he had a dream that he found me dead in my bed from having a seizure. He said that it was so vivid and surreal that he had to come and see me to make sure I was okay. Now at that point, I'm a little freaked out, and I call into my baby monitor to get my parents upstairs. When my parents come upstairs to see what was going on, they decided that him and my mom would go downstairs and get ready for school early. Now for some reason, I remember that we ended up in my brother's room, my dad and I, because there was still an hour to sleep before the day started, and my brother's bed was a real-sized mattress that could fit both my dad and I comfortably, and he wanted to stay with me. At some point, my dad falls asleep, but I stayed up for a little bit longer before I completely passed out. Before I fell asleep, I swear I saw a long, gray, ET-looking hand coming from the bottom of my brother's bed. I remember seeing the hand come from underneath the bed, and whatever it was placed it so quietly at the side of my bed, literally a few feet away from me. I don't know if I'm describing this well, but imagine someone laying underneath the bed and they bring around the arm on the side. I remember that when I saw it, I was filled with dread and I was beyond scared, way too scared to touch it to see if it was real. Then suddenly I woke to having to go to school, even though I don't recall falling asleep. For some reason, I never gave a thought about that specific part, about the hand, until I saw dark skies and I had kind of a eureka moment. I don't know if that thing was tormenting my brother with these nightmares or what happened. I don't even know if it's real sometimes, but it was real to me. Has anyone else ever had a similar experience? What do you think it was? When I was around eight years old in approximately 1995, I went to visit a friend's house just up a path and through a court from my house, about a minute away. On the court is a set of flats, which creates an archway that you have to walk through. As I walked back home and through the archway, I heard a low humming noise. I looked over my shoulder to see a typical movie-like shaped spaceship 
the round disc shape with the dome on top and the circular lighting. The lights didn't shine as such as it was daytime, but I can only now explain them as looking like LED lights, which is why they were so noticeable in the daylight. The UFO was small, no bigger than about three feet wide and maybe a foot and a half high. At that point, I think it's coming for me. So I'm so scared I just start running for home. I'm about 30 seconds away, but the corner to the path is coming up. I'm still trying to watch this thing chase me, and as I get to the corner, it's just behind me. The low hum is deafening. I mean, I can feel it within me. I have to take my eyes off of it for just a second to turn the corner, and as I do round the corner, the light, whether it was natural sunlight or the LED type lights, went really bright and sounded like a jet plane thundering overhead. I look up as I round the corner and it's right above my head, so close that the breeze it created whipped up my hair. Then, just as it had appeared, it disappeared, suddenly, no visual sign of it but I heard that jet plane noise and low humming noise move away from me. I get home and I tell my mom and dad, they don't believe me, or they say I must have mistaken a bird. I told my friend the next day and she rolled on the floor laughing. I stopped telling people after that, but I can still remember it like it was yesterday and still can't shake the feeling that it was coming for me, even though it was so small that I wouldn't have even fit in it. I don't know that that matters, though. I still don't want to know what would have happened if I hadn't made it home. So, two nights ago, I was laying in bed, scrolling Reddit, looking for something to read so I could fall asleep. My dog was asleep next to me and my fiance was playing Xbox, but sitting on the couch and on the other side of the room. I wasn't sure what time it was when I felt him crawl into bed, but I instantly fell back asleep after he did. Again, I'm woken up, not sure what time it is, and my dog was up, moving on the bed, I guess trying to get comfortable. My eyes are completely wide open while I'm looking around the room for a half-filled water bottle when I see a bright flash go off literally right in front of me. Thinking my fiancé was messing with me, I waited to see what his reaction would be when he asks me if I saw something. I tell him how bright the flash was, and he said, yeah, I know, it was bright enough to wake me from my sleep. He thought he was dreaming. We started asking each other different questions, like if the TV was on. We have some beer neon lights on the wall behind our bed, so we thought maybe the plug was moved, but the whole extension cord we have them connected to was disconnected and nowhere close to the outlet. We quickly felt weird vibes, like we weren't alone in our room, and we both jumped to each other to hide under the blankets. My dog is the biggest chicken, so she was already under there. We woke up around the same time in the morning, and it was the first thing we talked about. My fiancé thought he'd been having some kind of dream, and we always feel weird when we bring it up. I know this sounds silly, but has anyone else seen any random flashes or had some similar experience? What do you think it was? I'll cut to the chase and tell you what I experienced and saw when I was in a dreaming state, but was nonetheless very real to me. It's hard to explain, so I'm going to do my best to sum it up. This may be long, but please hear me out. My identical twin and I have had a sleeping disorder known as sleep paralysis as long as we can remember. Them being severe, we would experience false awakenings, believing we have actually awoken just to realize that we were still dreaming. It happened during a false awakening, but I immediately knew something was wrong, unlike other times where it takes me a bit to realize I'm dreaming. I'm laying horizontal, almost against a hard surface, and there's something, a light maybe, 
blocking my main view. I'm frightened, and out of my peripheral, I focus in on the walls. Remembering what I saw after is what sometimes bothers me at night right before I go to bed. The walls didn't ever seem to meet. There were no corners. Smooth, metallic, no edges. Everything was curved, making your perception confused. I couldn't tell if I was in a small room or a very large space. The walls almost seemed to move in a very unnatural way, but still were completely solid. The word kaleidoscope comes to mind, but it's not quite right. It was like no other place I have ever been or seen, completely alien in design. If you have severe sleep paralysis, sometimes you can feel yourself come back. I had that feeling before I actually woke up in real life. I'm not looking to discuss whether or not my experience was fake seeing as I was in a dream state, although because it felt and still feels so real to me, it leaves me with questions. Has anyone experienced or heard of anyone who's been abducted and could visually explain the inside of the craft? Does anyone know of information connecting geometric shapes with extraterrestrial beings? I would be grateful for any help on the theories on ET craft designs, or any information on some similar experiences to mine. My first sighting was when I was 10. It was a massive floating ship shaped like a huge manta ray. When I saw it, I felt like I had been on it for a while, but I shook off that feeling and ran home. The memory surfaces periodically, and sometimes I think I can remember what the inside of that ship looks like, and I remember not being alone in the ship, but I have little idea who I was with. Much later, I saw a craft landing in the cow pasture at my parents' house in a rural country. I feel compelled to go inside the house, and it was like I had forgotten what I had seen. I lost a few hours of time that day. I always assumed that I must have watched TV, but later I realized I literally have no memory of the next few hours. Later, I began seeing lights in the sky, and I would ask out loud, are you here for me? and the light would bob and weave up and down, or left to right, or it would flash brighter for a moment, like it was communicating. Again, I would go inside, and soon after, I would lose memory of what I was doing for the next several hours. This happens often, still to this day. I have a lot of theories, and sometimes I remember parts of conversations with people about my life, my personal feelings, my aspirations, good conversations about how I could improve my life, but I can't remember any faces of the people that I talk to. I do benefit, though, as my life has steadily improved over the past 10 years, so I'm not fearful about the encounters. I'm just aware that they're taking place, and I don't know if I'm ready to remember more yet. This happened probably about two years ago, except my memory of when it happened is really hazy and I struggle to place it on my timeline. I would say I was about 15 years old and it was the middle of the night. I live in a two-story house and the second story is quite high, so I sleep with the curtains wide open as I like to look at the stars. For reference, the window that's in this room takes up almost the whole wall. I woke up one night and my room was completely bright. My bed is in the corner opposite the window and all I could see out in my window was a blinding light taking up the entire window. My bedroom was completely lit up and I could barely look out the window because it was like looking into the sun. I sat there for probably about two minutes absolutely paralyzed with fear before I decided to grab my phone and film it. 
The second I grabbed my phone, the light went out and my room went back to dark. I couldn't make out anything through the window as my eyes had to adjust since it had been so bright. And once I could see, after about maybe a minute, there was nothing out of the ordinary. I wrote myself a note to look at in the morning because I needed evidence that it hadn't been a dream. I eventually got back into bed and tried to sleep, but the adrenaline and fear kept me up for hours. I managed to fall asleep eventually, and when I woke up, the note was exactly where I left it. I spoke to my family, but they were all adamant that they hadn't seen or heard anything. I have explored every logical possibility, including sleep paralysis and night terrors, and even the possibility that I was hallucinating. But I've never hallucinated before, and I haven't since. I have no history of mental illness other than depression, which I wasn't struggling with at the time. And the same with night terrors and sleep paralysis. The note I left myself has proved to me that I wasn't asleep when it happened. This was during a time when I had some weird experiences happening while I was asleep. I would wake up with strange bruises and scratches all over my body almost every day. My memories from around that time are very hazy, and I can only remember bits and pieces. That time of my life is almost blurry to me, and I usually have an excellent memory. Any possible explanations? I'm a lucid dreamer, and I can control my dreams and my nightmares. But last night, I had a dream that was very different from anything else. I was working on the floor of my factory job and running the forklift, like normal, until out the bay door there were fireworks. It's more like a plume of light and an explosion coming from the other side of the valley. I live in the desert. We don't have valleys where I'm at. We decided to go outside after seeing these lights fly away into the sky to the left of us. Once we get outside of the bay door, the ground is illuminated like a full moon times ten. We were now in the backyard of my childhood house. We look up to the sky trying to find the light source, but it was just a night sky. When we looked to the right, there was a typical looking alien and when it noticed us, it screeched and jumped up toward us, but it dissolved into the brightening light. I woke up in a scream, and I couldn't sleep until daylight. My cat, who's pretty aware as well, stared at the wall behind me for a good 30 minutes. Now, I can dream about scary stuff, and when it happens, I can usually alter it. I can always control what I'm dreaming about, but this was different, and I haven't dreamed about aliens in over 10 years. What is this supposed to mean? Have they decided to come back? Why me? Six years ago, my boyfriend at the time, husband now, woke me up sweating and shaking in absolute fear. I asked him what was wrong, and he began stuttering and telling me that I would never believe him. He went on to tell me that he was woken up around midnight to this person standing at the end of the bed. Yes, my first thought was sleep paralysis as well, but he sat up and was ready to attack if he needed to. In his head, he heard a voice that wasn't him telling him that it was okay and that they weren't there for any bad reasons. He said he felt immediately calm from that. He also noted that he was shocked with what a light sleeper I was and that his movements hadn't woken me. This being was unnaturally tall and had to crouch a little due to its height and us having been asleep in the basement. He said that this being reached out for a greeting and again began hearing a voice in his head saying, hello. Nothing much else happened that night as my husband was frightened. All he remembered at the time was that the last thing he heard from it in his mind was, 
I'll see you again soon. And then he said it felt as if time had started again, not realizing that it ever felt like it stopped until that point. And then he was back in reality, and that's when he woke me. What he thought had only been about a 10 to 15 minute encounter had actually taken over an hour. These visits continued for months, minimum once a week, max three to four times, but my husband got less and less frightened every time. This thing and him built a sort of friendship from what he explained to me. It had a name, but for the life of me, I can't remember what he said it was. It answered any and every question my husband had. I won't go into what those were here, but after a while, it just stopped. He stopped waking me up in the middle of the night or telling me about it the next morning. But the times were always the same. He would be awoken around midnight and they would have discussions about literally anything my husband was curious about. And then he would come back to reality and time would unfreeze again between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m., having only felt like the encounter had lasted a short period of time. Once it stopped though, I can't emphasize enough just how much it stopped. I mean, full stop. It was like for him, it never happened. It's been six years, so I know this is choppy, but it's hard to remember everything with it having been so long ago now. I forgot about it for so long and I don't know what prompted me to remember it just about a week ago, but now I just can't stop thinking about it and the oddness of it all, and how it just stopped so suddenly. He's literally never made mention of it ever again, and I've never brought it up to him this last week in fear that he may think I'm crazy, which I don't know why that's my fear, but part of me thinks if there's a chance he's completely forgotten it, whether it be on his own or something else, he may think I've gone insane. Anyway, if you have any ideas or similar stories, please let me know. I'm trying to figure this all out and what happened to my husband, as it's literally keeping me up at night. My first ever encounter was when I was around seven and my family was all around the table. I will never forget the order we sat in, nor what happened. My mother sat in front of me while my sister was beside me. Father was next to mom and my back was turned to the kitchen. My brother sat next to my mom in front of my sister, a family of five. We were eating. And then the window straight across from my dad at the right of my direction shone with a very bright light. Everyone seemed frozen, but my mom and I. My mom told me to run, run and hide. My mind was blanked out and I didn't think at all. I just got up and ran to my mother's room where I felt my mind was telling me would be the safest place. Once I entered my mom's room, I went straight to her king size bed with a huge light underneath. There was nothing under my mom's bed because she kept everything in bins at the foot of her bed and closet. The foot of my mother's bed was facing the door while the head was against a wall next to two big windows. Then it was her closet across from where you were laying so you could see it. Then the bathroom was right next to that. Once I got under the bed, I saw that the light was still on. I looked through the cracks and it was quiet. And then I saw about six sets of feet that were not human. Then I felt them start to surround me. One almost touched me by getting on the bed and reaching down through the crack. There were two through the crack, three in front, not showing their faces, but trying to reach further under. One was at the foot of the bed. Then I looked near me and saw a face that was gray and had huge eyes. I felt like I couldn't move, but when I looked closer, I saw a whole galaxy in its eyes. It was so pretty how the colors merged like a sunset, and for a second I almost forgot it was an eye. Then it moved or flinched and I came to my senses. I looked around and they were still moving to get me, while the one that I looked at was staying still and looking at the closet. Then I heard the closet door opened and I saw Nega. 
Nega was my childhood imaginary friend that taught me the greater lessons than what is now being slowly forgotten. After seeing her, I relaxed and I saw them try to fight. And then the tall, gray-like humanoids were gone. I looked at Nega and then I looked at the bathroom to see another creature that had orange eyes that I know commonly stays in my mother's bathroom. Nega hushed me and then I seemed to have forgotten what had happened until I turned 14. After this, I just carried on with life. I never saw my imaginary friend again, but old friend still lingers from time to time in my memories. I will never forget this Wednesday night as long as I live. It was the summer before seventh grade, sometime in July. It was Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. The evening before, my family had watched the old school show, Unsolved Mysteries. I awoke in the night, lying on my right side, awake, but my eyes still shut, completely silent. None of us ran fans back then to aid in sleep. I was awake and basically waiting to fall back asleep again. However, I decided to open my eyes. On the right side of my bed, right there, was a being seemingly fixated on a plush bear that I kept in bed with me. And this being fit all of the descriptions that I've always heard or watched on television of an alien. Shorter, pale gray skin, and those awful eyes, huge, black, and slanted, staring at my bear, right by my bed. Honestly, I cannot put into words how I felt right at that moment. I was only just about 12. At some point, I pulled my covers over my head and felt an awful rushing through my body of super warm, then cool, then warm again. Only later in my life did I understand that I was most likely feeling shock. I couldn't scream. I felt frozen. Too scared to scream, maybe. What if I did scream? My mother and stepfather and two brothers would hear me. What the heck would they do if they came running into my room and saw this thing? What would it do? Is it going to kill me? Abduct me? What if it already had and it was returning me? All of these thoughts plus a million more just raced through my young mind. It's awful just recounting it all. Again, how could I ever forget something traumatic like this? So, being such a brave 11-year-old and after what felt like 12 hours, I decided to try and scare it. I decided that I would thrash my legs up and down from under my covers as hard as I could. I know, horrifying, right? I was so petrified though. So I did this and then remained under my covers, just waiting. Nothing happened. So I stayed under the covers. This had to be at least close to going on two hours from when I first opened my eyes and saw this thing. As I lay wide awake, I heard a noise. To this day, I still can't explain exactly how it sounded. The sound felt as if it surrounded me and was coming from outside. It was crisp, clean sounding, maybe mechanical, but maybe not, lasting only about two seconds, a sound that I had definitely never heard before and have never heard since. As soon as I heard the sound, something in my mind told me Oh, they're gone. As crazy as it sounds, I firmly believed that the sound was their transportation leaving. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night or early morning. It took me so long to confide in my family about this terribly scary incident. Of course, they did not believe me. However, now, from time to time, my mother will mention it and suggest that maybe that's why I suffer from insomnia now. 
very well could be. This is the first time that I've shared this story publicly, though, and it would be reassuring to hear any other stories of similar happenings. In my life, I've had three UFO experiences. For context, I am a 40-year-old male living in the southeastern United States. I will focus on the second one, since it's the most unquestionable event of the three. In 2015, I was living in Lexington, South Carolina, which is right outside of Columbia, the state capital. On October 5th of that year, we experienced a thousand-year flood that shut everything down and caused major damage throughout the Lexington, Columbia area. My job requires me to be at work at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, same job I have now as I had then. My job was shut down on account of the flood, but my great and wonderful company decided that I needed to be there the next day to assess the damage, despite the fact that I would have to drive through a flood. Anyway, I woke up at 2, went downstairs, made some coffee, and per my usual morning routine, I stepped outside onto the back porch to have the coffee and enjoy the stillness of the twilight hours in solitude. It was lightly raining, not enough to mind it, and the sky was totally overcast with low clouds. That's important. We were in the suburbs about two blocks off of one of the main drags through town, Sunset Boulevard, 378. We weren't in the sticks, but we weren't metropolitan either. The sky was a slight orange from the streetlights reflecting off of the cloudy sky. Our house was at the end of a cul-de-sac. There were tall, lined trees lining the back and sides of the property. So I'm drinking my coffee, leaning on the banister of the deck, and in front of me in the sky, I can see something moving in my direction. My first thought was, oh, it's an owl, or some kind of large bird, judging by the shape. But slowly, as the shape got bigger and bigger, I realized that it looked smaller because it was far away, and once it was overhead, it came into clear view. It moved slowly, but it all happened so fast at the same time. It was overhead, over the house, over the pine trees, but under the clouds. It was a black triangle with a textured pattern on the bottom, the only side I could see. The texture is difficult to describe. Adidas makes this soccer shoe called the Nemesis. If you Google it, that's kind of how it looked. Embossed lines, perfectly black. The trees were probably about 40 to 50 feet tall, so I estimate that this thing was probably 60 to 80 feet off the ground, pretty low. It was about the size of your traditional Walmart parking lot. It made absolutely zero noise whatsoever. There were no lights. It moved as with intention, with no deviation in direction, like an air hockey puck perfectly gliding on a fixed trajectory. It was slow, maybe faster than a bicycle, but slower than a car. I don't know, 20 miles per hour if I had to guess. Once it made it over the house, I chased it through the gate on the side of the house, yelling to myself at 2.30 in the morning, what the F was that? What the F was that? In the front yard, I was just looking at it. It just quietly and discreetly skated off into the darkness, perfectly straight on, totally indifferent. I regret not getting any pictures. It just didn't occur to me. It came and went so quickly. In the moment, I just didn't know what to think. It's like my brain had nothing to reference against what I was seeing. It wasn't a bird. It was definitely not a plane. I thought maybe it was a drone, but it was so big and totally silent. It was difficult to process in the moment, but I know what I saw. There's no question about it. Anything outside of your scope of understanding or knowledge is the definition of alien. If I were to make up a story about seeing a UFO, a black silent triangle is probably the last thing I would have come up with. I wonder if the flood had anything to do with its presence. It seemed too wild for it to not be connected somehow. 
The third encounter I had in my life was when I was stargazing with my son, on the same deck, at the same house. We have since moved, though. I was playing with the Google Sky app because I'm lame, and uh, it took a while to get a smartphone, so I was amazed at all the apps, even though they'd been out forever. Anyway, we were finding stars on a clear night, and then identifying them with the app. One particularly bright star stood out to the east of us, and I overlaid the phone with the star. The app showed nothing in the sky in that region. We calibrated it as well. As soon as I said, hey, there's no star there, it zoomed across the horizon, stopped, then zoomed up, then blinked out, like an old tube TV turning off. Its movements were very smooth and precise, if I were to hold up a yardstick in front of my field of vision with my arms extended, this thing went from one end to the other in a second. I couldn't tell you what that is in actual distance, but it must have been an incredible distance to travel that quickly and to stop on a dime and then redirect and disappear. My son was too young at the time to think much of it. I had heard from the wacky world of UFO conspiracies that UFOs can tell if you notice them, and I had always thought that that was baloney. But I have to admit, this thing tore off the second I noticed it and said something out loud. Pretty weird stuff. So, call me crazy, and I'm sure some people will, that's okay. But I swear this happened to me when I was 16. What's weirder is that it happened on the same night that I had an alien abduction dream. My mom wasn't home. She worked nights looking after the elderly at a nearby retirement home. I lived a normal teenage night playing video games, messaging friends, and watching TV. I went to my room and went to sleep. I had an extremely intense nightmare that I was abducted by aliens. All I remembered is looking up in my dream and seeing my whole field of vision turn completely white as I simultaneously heard this really loud buzzing or humming sound. I wake up drenched in sweat, heart pounding, and it's around 5.30 in the morning. But what's weirder is that I'm not in my bed. Confused as heck, I look around the room, and to my surprise, I'm somehow in my mom's room, frozen in fear and confused. I tried to figure out what was going on. After about 20 to 30 minutes, I finally calmed myself down enough to get up. So I get up, and when I go downstairs, I can see through the door to our backyard, which is made of glass, and I can clearly see that the gate to our backyard is wide open. It's an old fashioned wooden gate and it hadn't been opened in years because it was covered in vines and was always left locked. I go to investigate and as I go to unlock the back door, the door handle goes down with no resistance at all. And I realize, crap, this door is already unlocked, which only added to how shook up I was to be honest. So, hesitantly, I go into the backyard anyway, and I look at the gate, which is also open. I look for footprints or boot marks, thinking that somebody must have kicked the gate open. Nothing. I look more closely. The old rusty lock to the gate, which hasn't been opened in years, is still there. Not bent. Not damaged. Not broken at all. Just a bit rusty. The same as it's always been. I lock that gate back up and look around the yard. Nothing's missing. I go back in the house. I lock the back door and take a real good look around and nothing's missing. I go back to my bedroom and double check that I did get in my bed that night and yep, I definitely did. The bed's still messy. I thought, did I sleepwalk? Did I go into the yard and then somehow go get in my mom's bed? I checked the carpet and floors in the house, which certainly would have been dirty and muddy if I had walked into the yard and then back in. And nothing. 
I called my mom and explained everything that had happened, and I asked if she had messed with the gate or unlocked it lately. She confirmed that she hadn't, and was just as surprised and confused as I was. To this day, I have no explanation as to what happened that night. Just to confirm, I was very into sports as a teenager. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't take substances, and I was completely sober. I also remember feeling oddly terrified of the sky as it began to get dark out that evening. I remember sometimes that if I was playing football or soccer with friends after that and it started getting dark, instead of walking home like I usually would, I'd kind of hustle. I'd constantly look up at the sky, feeling fear. And I remember a number of times where I decided to just run home instead because I was scared, even months later. All of this still confuses me, even to this day. One night while driving home, I saw a huge bright light, probably a little larger than a full moon, straight ahead of me in the sky. It changed colors from green to yellow, red, blue, and then two other similar lights showed up next to it. They changed colors for about 10 to 15 seconds. Then they all became one big white light and completely disappeared. Then they all came back, changed colors more, and then disappeared for good. I've just never seen anything like this but I was wondering if anyone else had similar sightings. The year was 1976. We were living in the Middle East. My father was in the secret police called Savak. It was common that a helicopter would land in our backyard and pick my dad up for a mission or something like that. One night, I saw a bright light and it got my attention. I thought it was my dad returning home on the helicopter landing in the backyard, but I guess it wasn't. But I don't remember anything after the light got really close. I woke up in bed the next day. Well, I thought it was the next day but I found out that a few days had actually passed. My father was standing next to my bed with two well-dressed men. One was American, I think, and the other was a translator. He introduced one of them as Mr. John and told me they wanted to talk to me. I was confused and they asked a lot of weird questions. Soon after my dad took me, my brother and sister moved us to the UK. We lived there for three years until my next strange encounter. Once again, one of the original two men, Mr. John, with a new guy, questioned me once more. A few months later, on the 4th of July, 1979, we moved to the US and we have lived here ever since. As time went by, I asked my dad questions about the moving and the men questioning me, but he would never talk about it until recently when he was diagnosed with dementia. The things he said were incredible, too incredible to be true. I thought it was the drugs or the disease. I thought that's pretty cool if it was true, but there's no way. Well, he's in a nursing home here in Laguna Hills, California, and I went to go visit him. When I walked into his room, to my surprise, he had a visitor, a man, not just any man, but the one that had met with me twice before, a face that I'll always remember. The only problem was that the last time I saw him was 35 to 40 years prior, and he hadn't aged a day. I was older than him. He saw me, pulled his cap down to cover his face, and left without a word. I asked my dad who he was, and he said to me, that's Mr. John, and remember, by safe moon. I can't make heads or tails of it to this day.
About two months ago, I was driving home from my parents' house late at night on a route that connects New York to Connecticut. My town in Connecticut directly borders New York State. The town has some serious hills bordering on small mountains. At one point on the route, the trees thin out to the left, revealing a large hill or small mountain, which can be seen pretty clearly from different perspectives for about two minutes. As I was driving on this particular night, I noticed two large, slow blinking and slow moving rectangular lights low in the sky. I couldn't see any specific features of any craft surrounding these lights, so my perspective could be off, but it seemed to me to be only about 20 meters higher than the top of the hill. I'm guessing the distance or height by how fuzzy the edges of the lights seem to be and by how large they appear to be in addition to the multiple perspectives provided by my consistent 40 miles per hour speed on the road. When I spotted it, it was nearly directly forward in my line of sight, off to the left just a bit. In the two minutes that I watched it, it moved maybe a half a mile farther to my left. For reference, the top of the hill that I mentioned is about a mile from that road in the same direction to the left. That would mean a speed of about 15 miles per hour. The lights were blinking too slowly to be standard aircraft strobes, on for about two seconds, off for another two, in a regular rhythm. They were moving and blinking in unison, which implies that they were both part of one larger thing. They seemed to be set about 30 to 40 yards apart from one another. There was no noticeable sound, and no witnesses aside from myself that I know of. I had always thought that if I saw a UFO, I would love to follow it, but I was too freaked out and I didn't do that. I felt like an instinctive horror. I couldn't bring myself to deliberately get closer. If there is a next time, I will try harder to overcome that. I was 10 years old. My brother and I were the last ones off the bus from school every day. We were nearing my house, which is in the Midwest countryside. Lots of cows and trees and fields, stuff like that. Anyway, about a mile away from my house, I look out the window and I see an orange blimp in the sky. Standard American football shaped blimp. Surprisingly, I didn't think anything of it because a day or so before that, a bunch of kids and I at recess saw a blue blimp in the sky. I watched it, thought it was cool to see a blimp this far outside of town, especially near my house, and wasn't about to think another thing of it. After a few seconds, the blimp shifted from a football shape to a star, literally just shrunk before my eyes into a tiny shiny dot that resembled a star in the night sky except it wasn't a star. It was just a blimp a second ago. Not even two seconds after it shifted, it launched even farther into the sky, shot down to its original height, and then shot completely off into space. It was the most bizarre thing I had ever experienced. I was a quiet kid, but being the last kid on the bus besides my brother, I shouted about it. When I got off the bus, I ran to my mother to tell her, like a crazy old man yelling about the end times. My mother said that I was crazy, naturally, and I never told my dad, because my mom shut me down pretty hard and it killed my mood. Fast forward years later, shortly after I turned 22, my dad and I took a short road trip to go pick up a car he bought halfway across the state. We talked about a lot and somehow got on the topic of UFOs. He told me that when he was 12 or 13, he and his brothers were playing down by a creek near their house, which by the way was only a few miles away from our house. They saw an orange football shaped object in the sky. I was absolutely blown away when he said that. My father is skeptical and doesn't believe in this kind of stuff, ever. But when I shared my story, he paused 
and said that it was very odd to have seen the exact same thing behave the exact same way more than 30 years apart. On the evening of September 7th, 2006, my friend Jen and I were driving home from a friend's house near to where the Big Ear Radio Observatory used to be. It was somewhere around 10 p.m., near the corner of Cheshire Road and Route 23 between Delaware, Ohio, and Lewis Center, Ohio. We were driving down Route 23, heading south toward Lewis Center, when Jen saw a bright light very distant in the sky. We both jokingly said, it's probably a UFO. So we keep driving and we eventually lose sight and forget about the distant object in the sky. Then, as we're coming over the precipice of a hill, just beyond where the golf course is now, where the telescope once stood there, was an enormous glowing football-shaped UFO hanging right above our heads, steadily moving over top of Route 23, heading toward Lewis Center. It was the most frightening and awe-inspiring thing I have ever witnessed. We stopped on the side of the highway and got out of the car. It was the largest thing I've ever seen. I felt like an ant beneath the giant glowing boot. The object looked like it was engulfed in some orangish reddish plasma, almost like what the surface of the sun looks like close up from space. It looked as though it had flames bubbling and churning within it. I tried to take a video with my Motorola Razor, but the phone just would not pick it up at all, even though it had been working just fine and had nearly a full charge. It slowly begins to back away from us a bit and begins floating toward the town of Lewis Center. We follow it back to Lewis Center, where my friends and I watch it for nearly an hour, and eventually it begins to gain altitude in a dizzying display of lights. Then it flashes and blasts it away in the blink of an eye, leaving behind a wispy blue teal vapor trail. I found out later on that the Big Ear Radio Observatory in Delaware, Ohio, was where they had received the WOW signal in 1977. This object took up a large portion of the visible sky as we came upon it. I'm an airman. I have been trained to observe and identify aircraft, I would estimate the object to be the size of an NFL football stadium just floating above the tree line highway and houses and buildings. The object was witnessed by at least five people other than myself. As it was gaining altitude, glowing bluish purplish orbs began to cascade out of the main shaped object, one after the other. Each time they would appear, they would revolve around the main object intensify until all I could see was a spinning blue glow around that main football stadium object. And then in the blink of an eye, it shot off into a flash of light in front of it, like the Enterprise going to warp speed, leaving only a bluish trailing haze behind. The whole experience was the most profound thing to have ever happened to me in my lifetime up till that point. Thank you for hearing my account of what occurred. I'll start out by saying that I've seen my fair share of strange things in the skies, but one memory will always stand out amongst the others. I've done the math and I believe it was fall of 2005. I was in sixth grade, outside on the phone with my first boyfriend. I'd say it was between six to eight o'clock Eastern time at night. It was dark outside and only our back porch light was on. I was talking up a storm and I was watching my two dogs roam the backyard. Out of nowhere, it was like somebody turned on a blue light above us, the dogs and I. It was a bright, beautiful electric blue. 
I immediately looked up and saw what I can best describe as the shape of an eye, but perfectly symmetrical in the same blue color. It was lined with an almost holographic looking light, a constantly changing rainbow of colors. I stared for maybe two seconds before it closed up, leaving only the colorful outline. It immediately shot to the left like a shooting star and disappeared. In shock, I told my boyfriend I would call him back and I immediately ran to my parents who were folding clothes in the bedroom. I shouted at them, I just saw aliens. They laughed at first and told me to stop joking, but my father knows my eyes. He saw my panic and quickly changed the subject. I've never forgotten this moment. I can still see it so clearly, even to this day. What did I see? Why did I see it? Can anyone help? I can't quite understand this one myself, so maybe you guys can help. This was on the 11th of July, 2019. My boyfriend and I, he's now my husband, were camping in the mountains, very high up. This area is so high up and remote that there is virtually no light pollution, so you can see almost every star in the sky when it's a clear night, like this one was. We were just relaxing, staring at the stars, usual romantic things you do in the mountains, when we started noticing the stars acting very differently. They appeared to zigzag and go upward, almost like they were playing with one another, weaving near each other and away again in circular motions. We were just amazed by it all and couldn't take our eyes off the sky. This went on for about two to three solid hours. That wasn't the strangest part though. Where we were camping, there was a clear view of an opening between two other mountains. At around 2 a.m., maybe 3, I noticed this bright light between the two mountains. It was really bright, so I nudged my partner to look over too. We were staring at this massive white-yellow looking star go upward quickly, then noticed it was going toward us. My partner is a man that isn't easily scared, and this really scared him to the point that he nearly broke my nose trying to hide fully in the tent with both of us screaming as this star just stopped right above us. When it was above us, right before we both panicked, it seemed to have a diamond type shape and it was super bright. But that isn't the strangest part. When we were in the tent, the light didn't shine through the tent. This thing didn't make a single noise so it wasn't a drone or anything like that. It was far too big. And what seemed like seconds later, we were both calm looking at the stars again, like nothing happened until sunrise. If both of us hadn't experienced this, if it was just one of us, I could try to make an excuse for it. But we both confirm each other's stories and saw the same exact thing, and I can't explain it. To top it all off, when I'm talking about it, or in this case typing, it feels like I'm lying and my partner feels the same way, like it never happened. It feels like I'm making it up, and the more I try to remember about that night, the more I can't remember. And he feels the same way too. It's like whenever I go to tell my story, something is actively trying to get me to believe that I didn't see what I saw or to stop talking about it. Has anyone else ever experienced anything like this? Does anyone have some answers? I'd love to know.
This Sunday gone, my girlfriend and I, who live in Adelaide, Australia, had just gone on a dinner date. She is a 26-year-old female and I am a 24-year-old female. We went to her house to drop off her doggy bag. Then we drove back toward my house, southward. About halfway between our houses, I noticed three lights in the sky in a perfect triangle. It was very odd, and the lights were fairly obvious in the dark sky, especially because there were also stars visible, so the lights were very visibly different. They were a lot brighter and bigger, though not by much. I pointed it out to her, and immediately she said, Holy cow, what the heck is that? At first I thought I might be seeing things, but when she reacted, I knew it wasn't just my eyes playing tricks. We quickly noticed that the lights were moving at about the same speed we were, and had started to flash green and red sporadically. We decided to follow it for as long as we feasibly could. It was a bit of a thrill, if I'm being completely honest, following the mystery lights in the sky, but it also didn't last very long. Maybe five minutes past my house, the lights took a turn, sped up, and just disappeared. We pulled over to see if we could find it again, but we didn't have any luck. We kept talking about how strange and cool the whole thing was. I am telling my story here to see if anyone else has seen something like this or has any ideas of what it could have been besides a UFO. Our first thought was a helicopter, but there's no realistic way for a perfect triangle of lights to come off of that, and they moved way too quickly. If anyone has ideas, I'd love to hear them. This happened three to four years ago, and I've been thinking about it recently. It was late one night, around 11.30 p.m., and I was driving home from my job at Sonic. I was taking US Route 64 home, which is a fairly desolate stretch of road, with houses and farmland on either side. I was in my 99 Ford Explorer, and I was just driving along around 65 to 70 miles per hour, with the radio on low volume. As I'm driving, through the sunroof comes a bright green ray of light that envelops the interior of my vehicle. This lasts for about two to three seconds. Then, it disappears without a trace. After that happened, I just sped up and got home as quickly as possible. I was only about five minutes away. That's really about all there was to it, but I was really freaked out. I have pondered and pondered, but I have no clue what that could have been. I wasn't tired because I woke up at around five or six that day, and I have no history of any illnesses that could have caused this. I wasn't on any medications. I've told a few people, and I don't think that they believe I'm lying. I've never been the kind to lie about that kind of thing, but no one can give me a solid answer either. Some have said maybe it was a laser, but I don't think there's any way a laser could completely cover my vehicle in green light like that. There was a farm that I was passing by, but it wasn't lit and there were no street lights. I have no idea what it was that I encountered. My mom is very religious and no nonsense. She grew up brethren, which is basically an old form of Baptist that doesn't really exist anymore. Despite her upbringing, she's always been interested in aliens. I think it's because her dad also had an obsession with them, but I don't know why. Maybe he saw something during his trucking and military days. As a kid, I always caught my mom watching those alien and UFO shows. She really wanted to see a UFO for herself. One night she was traveling down the Appalachian Mountains in Western North Carolina, coming from a festival in Eastern Tennessee. It was fall, so the leaves were beginning to become bare and you could see through them. 
She was driving along with my sister and my grandmother when she sees what looks like three to five lights in a circular shape. It's getting really close. My sister and grandmother notice it too. Soon it appears to be behind them, very low to the ground. My mom opens the sunroof and windows, but there's not a sound coming from anywhere. Then something my mom describes as an opaque white column comes down onto the road behind her car and is following. Like the distance between the white column and the car never changes. My mom went from curious to freaked and guns it. I think the total time it followed was probably less than a minute. Eventually, it went away without a trace. When my mom finally got home that night and told me about it, I thought she would be excited, but it nearly scared her to death. She said she had always wanted to see a UFO, but that once she did, the experience left her terrified. I remember she complained about being unable to sleep for the next few nights. This was 10 or so years ago, but she still doesn't seem to talk about aliens with such frequency anymore. This isn't my story, but it's something that happened to my parents just a bit ago. They live in Western New York, upstate, and are really open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens for reasons other than this encounter, but that's a story for another day. It might be a good time to add here that my parents do not use drugs or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory, cognizance, and intuition go. I'm going to copy and paste a message that my mom sent me and just read it for you, if that's okay. I just figured I'd put some feelers out there and see if anybody else has experienced something similar or has any sort of explanation. Quote, Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a freaking UFO or something. Between Randolph and Steenberg, there was this huge, really bright light blinking on and off in the sky directly in front of us, and it was falling from the sky except it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that is not a falling star. And even though I thought that it might have been a plane, I knew that it was too bright and going too fast to be one. Plus, as far as I know, planes don't make a habit of going straight down. Then all of a sudden, it was gone, like mid-sky. And I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or into the trees. So right then I said, did you see that? And dad goes, what the F was that? He said that he was thinking the same things that I was. And at the same time, we both noticed there are no hills. There is no mountain. There's nothing for this thing to go behind. It was just cornfields and open space. This thing just disappeared. Next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky, and it shot directly upward, back up into the sky. I was looking out my rearview mirror, and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around. But the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad was turned around watching it, and it started following us. We had that same eerie feeling we had when we saw the Bigfoot that one time, and we were saying, what the F is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. They have no idea what it was that they experienced. And yes, they do also have a Bigfoot sighting, but that's a story for another day as well. Either way, they've been trying to figure out what in the world they saw. So I thought I'd share their story and see if anybody else had any ideas. In my life, I think I have seen a UFO twice. 
I just want to know what everybody thinks. Number one, I was 14 and I was in Spain. I was looking up at the night sky when suddenly this kind of round thing flew low overhead. From what I remember, it was round with yellow and small white lights around the underside. It was really odd. I remember seeing it, but my family says it never happened. But I know what I saw. Number two. This one originally looked like a star. Sitting outside the back of our house one night, we were all looking up and we saw this star moving across the sky. We were all like, oh look, a satellite. We were tracking it going west. But then things got strange. It stopped and started going west. You might say, oh, well, perhaps it was a plane. Planes don't move like that. It stopped again, then went north, and then it just disappeared, just blinked out. Did I see a UFO? Back in 2011, on a family vacation in Jamaica, my siblings and I were sitting on the beach stargazing. That is, until we noticed this one point of light that was moving unnaturally and without sound. It had the brightest color and it looked kind of like a dim star, except that it was moving in circular and figure eight type patterns. For perspective, the patterns were no bigger in diameter than the little dipper's cup. It was moving with the pattern and speed reminiscent of when one uses a laser pointer to get a cat's attention. 15 to 20 minutes after noticing it, it just faded away. Could this have been a weather balloon? It definitely wasn't a plane, a helicopter, or a satellite. At least none like the ones I've ever seen. I'm trying to find images of weather balloons from the ground at night, but every image is too close up or simply doesn't look at all like what I saw. So recently, I've been having really weird things happen at my house. Not only somewhat ghost related, but also UFO sightings at the same time. I just wanted to tell a couple of stories about my first ever UFO encounter. So I was lying in bed. It was around 1130 at night and I'm leaning to the side of the patio door from my bedroom. I'm thinking for a while when I look through the blinds to see what looked to be a glowing object hovering above my neighbor's house. On the rim of this craft, there seemed to be a color changing rainbow and then a few lights around it blinking. My neighbor has this really rich friend that sometimes comes to visit in his helicopter. And that's what I thought it was at first, but I swear there was absolutely no sound. I also suspected that maybe it could be a star that flashes, but it was way too close. If it was a drone, it would have made some sound, especially that close. I was amazed at this craft and I didn't know what to think. Once I got back in bed, I heard what sounded like a plane circling my house. I didn't see it, but I heard it. I thought it could be a plane, but it sounded almost fake. I'm guessing if it was the UFO, they were trying to mask the sound of it or make themselves appear like something normal. When I took a look back at my neighbor's property, the craft was gone. Another story happened about the same time that I saw this other thing. Again, it was around 1130 at night. And again, I was lying in bed, looking out the window and just sort of daydreaming. Again, I could see a light. It was glowing really white and almost pulsating. I didn't want to go see what it was in fear that it could be ETs. From these experiences, I've decided to see what it is and investigate it. I really want to go confront them, 
I really want to go see what they are. A few years ago, I temporarily lived in a cabin out in the woods with my friend due to some unexpected life circumstances. One night, we had another friend over, and all three of us had a smoke session in the backyard at about 3 a.m. That was when we started to hear a strange noise in the woods. It kind of sounded like a humming engine coming closer to us. Suddenly, my friend shouts in confusion as he explains that he briefly got blinded by a distant light. A few seconds later, my other friend notices a flying object near the treetops, about 40 meters away. When he points out that the object is see-through and that you can actually see the outlines of the treetops behind it, we are all just stunned and we just look in awe, in complete silence, until the object spirals away super fast up toward the sky in a manner that is certainly not possible with any known technology we have. Then it disappeared. We rushed inside, and my friend had the brilliant idea to have everybody draw what they had seen simultaneously without looking at each other's to confirm what we saw. We all showed our pictures at the same time, and we all drew the exact same thing. We kicked ourselves over not recording the event for proof, but later realized that all of us had left our phones inside while going out to smoke. We joked about the light scanning us to see if we had any recording devices on us. We all went to bed, with both of them sleeping upstairs, and with myself being downstairs, alone. As I lay down, pondering over the experience and feeling a bit uneasy, I suddenly see two orbs floating around the room. One was red, and one was blue. I get a bit freaked out and pretend to be asleep while I watch these orbs float around for about five minutes, then they disappeared. Eventually, I fell asleep, and when I woke up the next day, I was eager to share my experience. They informed me that when they woke up and went outside, the door handle crumbled in their hands, like all of the components of the door handle had been dismantled. It was a very surreal experience overall. Aliens, advanced technology not known to the public, I don't know, but it certainly gives me this childlike hope that there's more to this life than the dull reality we live in. Back when I was a child, I had a weird UFO experience. My dad had bought a new Ford truck after his beloved Bronco had to go. We went on a visit to my grandma's place on the reservation. We picked her up and we all went fishing together and had a really nice picnic. I remember that I had this really cool Disney swimming pool. Anyway, we were all driving home when this huge aircraft of some kind appeared on the way to San Carlos, Arizona. It was not on some secluded dirt or back road. It was on Interstate 70, between Globe and Paradox. It was huge. It was like the size of a Zeppelin. It had lights all along its length, which flashed blue, red, yellow, and green in about one second. We were stunned. It sat there for quite a long time in one spot, we passed an ambulance coming the other way, and also a police officer, who pulled over in our lane looking up at this thing. I was very young, but I was there with my parents and my grandma. My grandma has since passed on, but my parents still remember it. My mom calls the lights on the side of the UFO windows, but to me they just looked like a row of extremely bright lights. It stayed stationary for a long while, before suddenly moving south to the top of Mount Turnbull. Then it went straight upwards and disappeared into the sky. The moon was out and the only clouds were above the summit. 
I think about this experience from time to time, and sometimes I doubt myself as to whether or not any of it happened. But there were three adults in the truck who saw it, and the police officer on the side of the road, too. I wish I could find the other people who saw it and ask if they remember it, too. I live outside of Melbourne, Australia. This is the crazy experience that I just had recently. I was outside on my deck having a smoke, and I looked up at the sky. Suddenly, two stars appeared directly on top of each other, evenly spaced. Then a third star appeared directly under the second star, again evenly spaced. Another star appeared blinking and moving toward the first star, then went down toward the second, then down to the third, and then away. It was moving very slowly, and each star was blinking in a pattern. I called my partner outside to verify what I saw, and he confirmed that I wasn't crazy and witnessed the moving stars slowly move in patterns that normal craft or satellites couldn't move in. It was going up and down and away and then back at a consistent slow speed. Something clearly had control over it. It was remarkable. We checked again a little bit later and all three stars were gone. I chatted to my housemate about it. Sadly, he was in his room at the time and didn't witness it. He said that my friend and her partner that live about 15 minutes away witnessed the exact same thing months ago. I called my friend and she confirmed that they saw the exact same thing. And then her partner confirmed it as well. They even confirmed the direction they had seen it in from local landmarks and buildings, which completely matched the direction that we had seen it in. So four people have witnessed something similar in a space of like three months in our small town. Super weird. I'm going to try to make this short by stating just the simple facts of what I witnessed during two separate incidents. Incident number one. This is going back to the late summer of either 1989 or 1990. I was at work with two coworkers near Rhinebeck, New York. One of my coworkers was outside smoking when he called to me and another coworker to come outside and see something. When we exited the front door, we saw the classic V-shaped craft hovering above a tree in the front yard. It was directly above the tree, which was just about the height of the building, two stories, so maybe 30 feet. I ran up to the tree, which put the craft those same 30 feet above me. It had five to seven white lights with the largest at the bottom center of the V with the others running up from it. It made no noise, and even though whatever it was blocked out the sky, I couldn't make out a structure or body. It very slowly and silently started heading across the street and over a hill. My two co-workers went inside, but I remained in case it came back. It did. When it reappeared from behind the hill, the shape had changed. The lights were now in a straight line, and were more of an orange color. It headed back toward my location, changing shape as it moved. The light formations just kept shifting. It took on the shape of a diamond, then an X, then back to a V, before it moved directly over the building. It kept going in that direction and then headed south and out of sight. Incident number two, I was at home. Having recently moved into a new apartment, things weren't all organized and my new bed had not arrived, so I fell asleep on the floor. I should also mention here that I am an incredibly heavy sleeper. During the night, I woke up from a sound sleep and sat straight up. This was something that I had never done. 
Anyway, the corner of the room was lit up with what looked like dozens of very pale, multicolored lights. Staring at them, I noticed a shadow of a figure out of the corner of my right eye. It looked as though it was moving closer, and then, well, that's all I remember. The next day I woke up not immediately remembering what I had seen. All of the clocks in the house were either stopped at or flashing at 3 a.m. Even the VCR flashed that time and was also playing even though there was no tape in it. I had to unplug everything that had an electronic clock in the apartment in order to reset and fix things. It wasn't until I was doing that that I remembered what had taken place. I've been told that I should try hypnosis regarding the second incident, but I'm not really sure that I trust the practice. One of my friends is actually a licensed hypnotherapist, or whatever you call them, but I still don't know. In all honesty, I don't know if I want to know. I thought I'd share a few stories that I heard from my ex-boyfriend's mom that I thought were pretty fascinating. We're all from the same reservation, so I can explain the setting pretty well. Basically, there's this one bush road that takes you from the reserve deep into the woods until you get to another town. But that stretch of dirt road goes on for about 45 minutes. I think it was an old logging road once, but now we just call it the limit. And we use that area of the forest for camping, fishing, ski-doo riding, and four-wheeler riding. Stuff like that. It's also just a chill road to drive down with your friends. If you're from a small town, you know how it is. Anyway, she had two paranormal experiences on this particular road, which isn't entirely out of the ordinary. My dad has even had an experience on this road too. It's kind of known for all sorts of strange things happening, but it's fine. Nobody's scared of it. I still go drive down it to watch pretty sunsets. It's just chill like that. The first story is about a weird time loop. She and her cousin were driving down this road to go get some water, since there was also a natural spring around there. On their way back, their car stalls out and just won't start up again. This happened back in the 80s, so there weren't any cell phones you could use to call for help. So they started walking. They weren't too far and they had plenty of daylight left, so it was fine. But as they're walking, they see another car stopped in the distance. They think, oh cool, we can get a ride from these guys. But as they get closer, they see that it's the same make and model of their car. They get even closer and they realize that no, it's the same car. They're confused as heck, but can completely verify that it is their car by looking in the windows. The sweater she left in the back seat, the empty pop can her cousin was drinking out of. Everything inside was exactly as they had left it. And honestly, they just didn't know what to do. They hadn't turned off that dirt road at all. They hadn't even walked far enough to make it to another trail that they could turn off on. They thought it was weird, but figured they should just keep walking, as it's all they could do. They keep going, and sure enough, up ahead, down the road, there's a parked car, the same as before. This time, they are tripping out, and they run up to it, and yep, it is 100% their car again. Her cousin gets a stick from the woods, and leaves it on the hood of the car saying that if they keep walking and the same things happen, at least they can see if the stick would have been moved. They take off walking and it happens again. This time, the stick is gone. She described the feeling of being afraid that the time loop would just go on forever, but it didn't. The next time they walked down the road, they realized they were able to walk farther and eventually they made it back to the reservation. They got help and towed the car, but never got an explanation or figured out what happened with the car and the time loop. She has no idea why the stick that they left on the hood of the car disappeared. 
And I don't have any idea either. The second story is about a UFO sighting she had with some friends on that same road. This happened years later, after the first incident, maybe in the early 90s, and it was during the summertime. She and her friends were riding around in a car, having a few beers, not the driver obviously, and listening to music. One of their friends commented that there must be a four-wheeler in the woods, but that it's weird since there were no trails there. They look over to see what he's talking about, and all they can see are these white lights emanating from deep in the woods. They could see that there's a source of light, but they couldn't see the object itself through the trees. The driver slows down and turns down the music. She says that there wasn't anything too alarming about what they were seeing at that point, but that there was just this feeling that something wasn't right. And she said that everyone felt it because all of them got quiet as they looked out the windows, which were wide open. When things got quiet, they were able to hear a low humming. She had a hard time describing the humming, just that it was very low, but that it almost felt like ringing in the ears. They all heard it. They were silent looking at the lights, but then whatever it was shot up directly into the sky and they saw a UFO. This was so long ago that she told me about it and that it happened that I wish I could describe more about how it looked. But she did say that the second it shot into the sky, it changed into all sorts of colors that seemed to rotate around the craft. It paused right above the tree line for a few seconds, and then it just took off right into the horizon, lights changing again when it moved. Those are her experiences. It's weird too, that everyone's experiences on this road are so vastly different. There are some sightings of creatures from our Algonquin folklore. There's Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, time loops. And then I have other friends who just heard really creepy singing that got closer and closer with no source. We also just found out that our entire reservation is sitting atop a huge uranium deposit. Apparently it's the largest in our province, but I'm not sure. Nuclear mining companies keep trying to build mines and we keep refusing. I'm wondering if that has something to do with it, because the amount of paranormal things that happened around here is pretty wild. I've had over a week to think about this, and I can't come up with a satisfactory, rational explanation. I live in the north coast of Northern Ireland, not far from the Giant's Causeway, just to give some reference that people might know. Just over a week ago, I was sitting watching television with my wife. I sit by one of the windows sometimes because there's a plug-in for my laptop there. My wife was sitting on the other sofa, so she couldn't see out of this particular window. It was around 8.30 and perfectly dark outside. If I looked out, I could see the lights of our local town, Ballymoney. It's tiny, more of a village, really. Just as at the scene, we're about three miles out, surrounded by farmland. Anyway, I'm watching TV and occasionally glancing out the window when suddenly I see this bright light just over the fields. It's multicolored, and it kind of blooms, growing larger. At first I thought it was a firework, which would have been bizarre enough in late March, in the middle of the lockdown. Except it's too slow, if that makes sense. It brightened into maybe three different colors. It was hard to judge distances in the dark, but if I had to guess, I'd say that it was two acres or more away and larger than a family car, hanging maybe 80 to 100 feet up, pretty low. Eventually, it faded and disappeared again, not behaving anything like a firework and far too large to be a flare. I said at the time that I thought I had seen somebody letting off fireworks. A few minutes later, I glanced out again and there's a smaller light roving around in the same spot, but it vanished almost the moment I looked at it. 
This light was maybe a third of the size of the original and was moving left to right. I've thought about it ever since. The annual Ballet Money Town firework display is much further away and we can always hear it from home. Yet this was soundless. Helicopters and drones don't have lights like that. And again, if there had been a chopper out there so low and so close, we'd have heard it. A drone still strikes me as most likely. We wouldn't have heard it inside the house. And I guess it might have been rigged with powerful lights, but they would have had to have been incredibly powerful. So I don't know. I've never ever seen or heard a drone over that area in the daytime, and I'm out there all the time. Honestly, I think maybe I saw a UFO. No lights in the sky were reported in local news or on social media though, and I haven't seen anything since. So, who knows? Tonight, August 4th of 2019, at around 10.15, my aunt and I were on the porch when my aunt saw something in the sky. It was like an outline of a circle, and part of it was gone, kind of like how an eclipsed moon would look at first. We noted that this was not where the moon usually is. Usually it's behind our house. So eclipse and moon were ruled out. The thing was bright yellow and had an orange-red tint to it. It almost looked like a fireball. It's night, and the sun is on the other side of the planet at this minute, so wasn't that either. We thought it was a shooting star at first, but it wasn't moving anywhere. It started like flattening out, like spreading. Then it started to shrink into a smaller form and kind of looked like a star. Then all of a sudden, it disappeared. A few minutes later, it suddenly reappeared and got bigger and bigger. It looked as if the moon would have been over the sun and coming off of it moving toward the way it came in the first time. The light around it kind of spread out again. Then suddenly, it started getting smaller, like the dark part of the eclipse was going back over. Then it split into two and completely disappeared. We waited to see if it would come back, but it didn't come back for the third time. I started doing some research and found nothing for solar or lunar eclipses that described what we saw. No meteor showers, no eclipses even happened in our area, no comets, nothing of the sort for that night. After doing some more searching, two other people saw almost the same thing three days ago around the same time. My aunt stepped back outside and called me over fast. There was what looked to be a pretty low plane flying with two large wings. My aunt says it looked like it had four wings, two on either side, and I'm telling you this thing was big. One side was bright red and the other was bright green. Planes in our area normally have a small light that flickers on both sides. It wasn't like this at all. This plane was coming from the same area that we had seen these mystery light things in. And when the plane got behind our house, I ran to look at it and I couldn't see it at all. It was big, like I said. It shouldn't have been out of view already. My aunt and I have been trying to come up with a logical explanation, but nothing makes any sense. I don't want to claim aliens, but I don't know what else it could have been. I will start by saying I was a devout skeptic before this experience. It has changed me. It was the summer of 2016, a few months after my sister was born, and my family and I had some old family friends over at our house. We'd been hanging out nearly all day, and it was getting to be around the time of sunset. My friend and I, who I'll refer to as Adam, went on a walk to the ponds in my neighborhood 
and stayed there for what I remember being about 30 to 45 minutes, just enough time for it to become dark enough to see the stars. At this point, we begin the short walk back to my house when I noticed a star in the sky, which appeared to be moving. I tell Adam this, and he says that he too can see it. At this point, we're standing at the end of my driveway, looking up at the sky. We watch the star for roughly five minutes, when we notice two other stars, all of which are moving toward each other at around the same speed. Now this is where it begins to get really weird. Adam pulls out his phone and attempts to record it, but it ends up being too dimly lit for his phone's camera to see, sadly. Nearly immediately after Adam had put his phone away, all of the stars had stopped in a blank patch of sky, devoid of all other lights and stars, and formed a large triangle. These lights then began moving as one unit and turning clockwise in the sky. They remained in this formation and movement for nearly five minutes before stopping, then proceeded to move at a speed which I've never seen before, away from each other, and disappeared into the night. Based on the reactions of people back at the house, both Adam and I were visibly shaken up. When we tried to explain what had happened, they shrugged it off, as us just not knowing what we saw. I know what I saw, and so does Adam. Green Cove Springs has a history of military and government establishments and compounds, none of which are currently active. However, there is a significant amount of military infrastructure still in use as housing and places of business. It makes me wonder if this had something to do with some sort of test flight. Either way, we saw what we saw, even if we don't know what it is. Ever since I was 13, in 2008, I've developed an interest in aliens and UFOs. I've grown enough of an interest to actually create a scrapbook of pictures of UFOs, declassified government documents, newspaper clippings, and things like that. All of these things were available from Google. I even recorded my own UFO sightings here and there, but I eventually threw them out because I was worried that I was sticking my nose where it didn't belong. In any case, this is one of my UFO experiences. It was somewhere between 2009 and 2011. I was around 14 to 16. It was around 8 or 9 p.m. and I was looking into the sky to see if I might get lucky and find a UFO. I noticed a large triangular shaped silhouette facing west into my backyard. It was huge and it had a red light at the center. Parts of the craft warped into a boomerang shape. One part was invisible at times and the other part wasn't. It was as if it had some invisible shield that was on and then off. It was able to change its shape from a boomerang and then into a triangle and then just disappear. In the past, I've had other UFO experiences but this one was the most convincing one of my whole life. Does anyone else have any UFO experiences? If you do, I'd love to hear them. Before I begin, let me give you some background. I was about 13 at the time, not under the influence of any narcotics or medications, nor have I taken any mind-altering substances since then. I had just come back from a class trip to Washington, D.C. It was late, maybe around 7 or 8 at night. My father picked me up at the airport, and we began driving home on the highway. And that's when I saw it. It was an unknown distance away, and looked close and far at the same time. It was a gray steel color and had 
well, it was honestly very stereotypical for the most part. It was in the shape of like ravioli. It was a round, perfectly circular ravioli shape with a bulge on both sides of the middle and a ring of lights around it. The lights were all large and gave off a light that was very hard to describe. They were blue, yellow, and white all at the same time. And yet they didn't give off any kind of flare or beam. And when the craft moved, they didn't give a typical trail that you would get when looking at a light moving out of a car window. Now, the craft moved so perfectly, it looked as if it wasn't moving at all. It matched the exact speed of our car, which if you've ever driven down I-95 is really quite an impressive task. I tried to get my father's attention because I needed some confirmation that I was indeed seeing what I was seeing. In those days, things were a bit strained between us due to some issues at home. So he grumpily brushed me off and kept driving. It felt like this went on for a while, but after the event, I realized it couldn't have been more than a few minutes due to the time on the dashboard clock. Things got very odd very quickly. The craft, while keeping perfectly matched with our car, started moving on its side where it was nearly impossible to see except for the bulges. It then did something that I will truly never forget. It split in half, but in a way that was so mechanically perfect, I knew right then it wasn't man-made. The way it split was as it was moving and there was no jittering or stalling or any evidence of anything mechanical that could have allowed it to separate, let alone be held together in the first place. After it split for a few moments, it kept pace with the car then each half, while still on its side, shot across the sky at blinding speeds in separate directions. And that's the story. Make of it what you will, but I swear by this sighting. It was an amazing experience that showed me we truly understand nothing about our universe. I wanted to share a few UFO encounters that I've had. The first was when I was about 11. I was riding home with my dad in the car. I looked out the window and saw a ship. It was shaped more like a small city, black with multiple spires. I told my dad and he saw it as well and gunned it home. The odd part was his reaction, which is connected to the next encounter. I asked about the ship and he went ape shit. started screaming about nothing being there and that we never saw anything, even though he described it when I pointed it out. Fast forward to about four years ago, which makes me around 34 years old at the time. I was at work at the hotel and the housekeeper calls me over. It's Veterans Day, so I figure she wants me to check out the parade. Instead, she points out a white sphere in the sky. We stare at it, and it moves at an insane speed, then splits into six smaller spheres. I tell her, congratulations on your first UFO sighting. It keeps moving around the parade, and I tell her not to worry. It's probably just observing. The thing is, when I asked her later if any more weird stuff came out, I got the same reaction total freak out screaming about not seeing anything and it not being real. It was like the mind couldn't handle the situation and completely melted down. This final one is a bit more interesting. I had let my dogs out at night for a potty break, then a head count as they came back inside. Before I went in, I noticed a star bigger than the others. Not being a runner, I stayed put. It got closer and I got a better look. It was a four pointed star with mini points about the size of a pressure cooker, all pulsating different colors. I decided to try some telepathy. I mean, I didn't do anything fancy like cross my legs and say, "Om." I just thought in my head, like you do when you have a grocery list. I asked it if it meant any harm. Give me red for no, 
and green for yes. I got a red for no. I asked if it came from the stars. It turned green. I asked if it was just here for recon. Again, green. Finally, I thought, okay, you can be on your way. And it flew higher and farther. My point on the last one is to try to stay calm. It might scare you, but it's the best way to remember what you saw. I didn't get any missing time or the usual stuff like strange markings. It was just an odd encounter. I saw a UFO. And I just want to know if there's some kind of explanation for what I saw. I didn't have my phone with me, so I don't have any evidence. But I did see a UFO. At first I thought it was a glare, but the moon was behind me and I was seeing Orion's belt and some other stars in front of me. The first one I saw was on the left. Then I realized it was moving in one direction, so it couldn't be a glare. It was going northward. I also don't think that it was a plane because of the lockdown. Planes weren't really allowed to fly, and if they were, it was really limited. I definitely know what a plane looks and sounds like, and this was not it. The thing that I saw was just silently cruising in the sky. Seconds later, I saw one to the right. I saw small dots emitting light. It was as small as what stars look like at night, but they weren't twinkling, and the lighted dots were aligned in a constant position. I also saw that it changed its angle a bit after I saw the lighted dots. I asked myself if they could have been birds, migrating or passing by, because sometimes flocks of birds fly in a V-shape, but that doesn't explain the glow. I'm not sure how high it was exactly in the sky, but it was definitely in the zone where a plane might fly, but it was way too big to be a plane. It was cruising for a good few seconds until it literally just vanished. Would there be any other explanation? Is that what a stealth bomber looks like at night? It was definitely a UFO because it was an object flying in the sky and I didn't know what it was. So it was an unidentified flying object I just want to know if it was alien or not. So I'm currently 16 and this happened when I was three. I'm from New Zealand. We have this RNZAF Air Force base called Ohakia. Apparently, a lot of really mysterious things happen around Air Force bases, so I'm not sure if this is common or what. But it may be 2.30 in the morning. My dad and mom and I are in the car driving back from Wellington. I have family there. And we're maybe 10 seconds past the base of this tree. Well, it's a tree-like thing. Those big, tall bush tree things that farms use for privacy. All of a sudden, there's a light slowly moving along the tree line. My dad thought it could have been a farmer out trimming hedges, but my mom says, not at nearly three in the morning. So we pull off to this rest area and watch this light. It's completely stopped moving and it's just spinning when another light joins it and spins in a counterclockwise triangle. Maybe two minutes later, another comes from literally thin air and joins the triangle, now having three points, and they just spin and spin and spin. Then they stop, then they start again. After about five minutes, which seems like 10 years, they stop again and stay still for maybe five seconds. Then one flies straight up into the sky and disappears at warp speed. The other two lights just keep spinning when another flies off to the right and disappears. So now it's back to just one light spinning, it starts to move along the tree line again, and then it just flies off to the left 
and disappears also, never to be seen again. All this started and ended within 15 minutes. After that, we just drove back. But we're all looking around, amazed and terrified. To this day, we've never seen anything else like it. One night, my sister's friend, who we'll just call Sally, was still at our house after my sister had fallen asleep at about 10 p.m. She asked me if I would walk her halfway home, and I said yes. It was just down a hill, and then you just walked one street, and then there was like a cut to over to her street from there. But mind you, it's the middle of December, and it's really cold. So we walked to the stop sign, and we were both like, nope, and turned around, because it was freezing cold. We could easily beg my aunt to give her a ride, because it wasn't that far. So as we're walking back, we stopped at my next door neighbor's house, which isn't actually occupied. It's completely rusted out. It's actually owned by a sheriff that comes by like once a week to work on it. It's been like that for about the last three years but my old neighbor lived there for about 20 years before he finally sold it to the sheriff for like $5,000. Anyway, we stopped at the house because we kept hearing weird noises from the side of the house. It almost sounded like cats, so we started calling them. Then they started hissing in a weird way. And then we saw their legs. They were long and skinny and super pale. I don't know what it was, but we just ran to my house and we told my cousin's dad to go look. And he didn't, of course. Maybe it was just a weird cat. But those legs were so abnormal, I've never seen anything like it. And their sound changed when we became aware of it and started calling it. It was like as soon as whatever those things were knew that we knew they were there, their whole demeanor just changed. It was so weird. It started on my commute home from work. I got about halfway through the 20 minute walk and at roughly 10.10, I saw these two flying objects that were blinking red and white. I didn't think much of it, being as I live near an airport. That is, until I saw them fly toward each other, hover for a moment, and then depart in opposite directions. It's something that I've never seen drones or planes do before, and it got me really suspicious. I began following one of them, and it kept variating between moving very quickly, slowing down, and hovering in midair. I kept on the trail of that one up until I saw two more on the opposite end of the horizon. I began chasing them down, one by one, trying to get videos and keeping notes on what I'd seen. The main thing that spooked me, aside from the weird movements, was the oblong shape of them. They were just far enough visually that I could only really see the shape through the horizontal row of blinking lights, of which there were three on each flying object. Each one would blink the same pattern, the red lights flashing one after another, and then a white flash at the end, occurring uniformly every few seconds. I only saw them do bizarre movements a handful of times, otherwise I was just chasing them as they sped by. There were at least five of them throughout my entire voyage, all around the town. I would truly love to believe that they were just regular aircraft, but every single thing about them was weird. I took a couple of videos, but they didn't really come out. My camera can't shoot that well in the dark. If anybody can point me in the direction of what these things might be, or what the light patterns might mean, or really anything at all, let me know. It's been haunting me all night.
An aswang is a monster in Filipino mythology that preys on pregnant women. Unlike the grisly attacks usually shown in horror movies, however, these monsters apparently just prey on the life essence of the unborn baby until it dies and the mother miscarries. The scary part is that these monsters are also part human, meaning that during the day, they could literally be anyone. This happened in Metro Manila in around 2011. My cousin told me the old man with the new neighbors asked me if he were pregnant. I was shocked. I never even told my family yet. I was 21 and worked nights in a call center. I never go outside when I'm home and I was only a few weeks along, so I know I wasn't showing yet. How did this nosy old man know? She said the neighbors were new in town, coming from one of the more popular provinces in the Philippines, where witchcraft and aswangs are still the norm. They were friendly enough though, so no one really had anything bad to say about them other than the nasty rumors that they knew about Oswang. When I was about eight months along, I was watching late night TV with my brother at around 2 a.m. Something big landed on our tin roof, strong enough to rattle the windows. My brother and I looked at each other with wide eyes as we listened to the footsteps. Yes, footsteps. Stop right above me. I was never a prayerful person, but at that moment, I called on gods and saints and angels and anything to protect my baby. Then I remembered my grandmother's story about how she escaped an Aswang attack by placing a pillow between her legs to mask the baby's scent. So I did just that. We had no idea how long we waited, seconds, minutes, but then we heard another jump and silence. Until this very day, I'm glad that my brother was with me to vouch for me. I still couldn't believe that it happened and that it happened to me. Then I remembered the nosy old man. Could it have been him? Was he really an Aswang? Something weird and mysterious and unfinished, I suppose. But all's well that ends well, right? It was the year 1995 and I was a 20 year old woman. I worked as a dining room manager at a popular breakfast restaurant. All of the employees would meet once a week at a local bar to hang out. I had to use my older sister's ID because I had just turned 20. I was excited this particular night because the manager that I had a huge crush on was coming. That night, I had decided not to drink too much and that would probably be the main factor in my survival. The guy that I had a crush on chose not to drink either. When closing time came, we all decided to go over to another coworker's house because we were still having fun. As I was leaving to get in my car, the guy that I had a crush on asked me if I wanted to ride with him. He said that he would bring me back to get my car in the morning. I happily agreed and I jumped in the car. As we were pulling out, he decided to do a huge burnout to show off. We got about two miles down the road when we saw police lights behind us. He pulls over and the police officer makes him do the whole, are you drunk dance. He wasn't drunk, but the police officer searched him and found a single pill that was not in its prescribed bottle. They decided to arrest him and take his car. I had told them that I was only 20, but they didn't seem to care. They told me to walk to the gas station and call somebody to pick me up. This gas station was the only place open being that it was the middle of the night. I didn't want to wake my family up, so I decided to walk the two miles back to get my car. I was afraid though, because I was aware that there was nothing open in between that gas station and the bar parking lot that my car was in. I started walking, keeping my eyes open for anything creepy. It wasn't too long before the typical abductor's vehicle pulled up. It was a big, black, windowless van. I was walking northbound, which made the passenger side closest to me. A man who was about 30 asked me if I needed a ride. I, of course, said no and continued on. He continued to ask a few more times, but he realized that I was not budging. 
I had that gut feeling you get when you know that something is just wrong. He just continues driving at my walking pace. He's looking around nervously. I had no doubt that he was trying to figure out how to get me. I was thinking of what I would do if he tried. I decided that if his car stopped, I was going to run to the other side of the road back towards the gas station. At this point, I was about halfway back to my car. After keeping at my pace for a while, he drove off. For a minute, I thought he had given up, but he just went down a little bit and then turned around and drove past me. I watched him turn around again and head back toward me. He pulls up to me again and asks me to get in. I said, no, I don't need a ride. He just drove at my pace again. He would pull off every time another car drove by, but would come back after. Then, as we were getting close to where my car was, I was trying to decide how I could get to my car safely. The bar was in the corner of an L-shaped small shopping strip. There were about five stores on each side of the bar, with the bar being in the corner. My car was right in front of the bar, which was pretty far back from the street that I was walking on. He pulled off again, but this time, he pulled a little past the area that my car was in and parked, turning his lights off. If I had to keep walking straight, it would have been hard for me to get by where he was parked. I decided to count to three and run toward my car with everything I had. I had my keys in hand, pushing the unlock button as I ran. I kept my eye on what he was doing as well. He pulled toward me, slowly, but I think he was wondering what in the world I was doing running into a closed, dark parking lot. As I reached my car and jumped in, he pulled right in front of it. As I was locking the door, we made eye contact. He looked shocked that I had a car. I backed out and took off. I watched behind me, making sure that he wasn't following me. After I got home, I debated on calling the cops, but I thought nothing would come of it, so, regrettably, I didn't. It was about a year later, while watching the news, that I saw him and his van again. He had kidnapped and murdered a young woman. They actually believe he killed more than just her, though. I was devastated. I'm not sure if I had called the police if anything would have changed, but at least it would have been on record. I learned that people looking for victims will often drive around to bars at closing time, hoping to find a drunk woman walking home alone. I really do believe that not drinking that night saved my life. In 2014, my grandmother turned 86. She lives in Vietnam, and we live in Canada, but we decided that that should be the year we finally visited. It was my first time visiting my ancestral homeland. We've never really been able to afford a family trip to Vietnam before, but my mom convinced my dad, since she hadn't seen my grandmother, her mom, since 2006 when she visited us in Canada. We bought tickets in April and scheduled for August. Unfortunately, my grandmother passed away in June. It sucked hard. Anyway, the Vietnamese have this superstition that for 49 days after someone dies, their spirit is still hanging around our mortal plane, waiting to be judged or reincarnated or whatever. So maybe three weeks after she died, one of my aunts was just tending to her market stall, per usual. This frail old woman, most likely homeless, suddenly walks up to the stall. She starts talking to my aunt, saying something along the lines of, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I didn't want to leave you all so early. Speaking distinctly in a maternal tone, almost on the verge of tears. It was pretty shocking and unexpected, obviously. Right after she said that, the old woman's whole body shook. A couple of seconds later, this lady regained her senses, looked around kind of confused, and walked off. 
My aunt told us this when we visited in August, and I couldn't sleep that night, so thanks for that, auntie. They also believe that my grandmother chose to speak to my aunt through the old woman, because frail, weak people close to death themselves are believed to be easier to take control of. That's about all I know about that, but I thought I'd share. I went on a trip to Cambodia years ago to visit relatives. I was always a skeptic and a non-believer in anything paranormal. To this day though, this is the experience that made me a believer. One night, my dad and I decided to stay at my cousin's house. They have a large multi-level home outside the city of Phnom Penh in a small village named Svai Rolom. The bedroom I was staying in was upstairs and had its own bathroom, and I was excited to get cleaned up before dinner. As I was in the shower, soap in my hair, I heard somebody call my name. I don't respond right away because surely they can hear that I'm occupied and showering. A second later, I heard my name again, this time slightly louder and closer to the bathroom door. Annoyed, I turned off the water, grabbed a towel, and answered back, yes. When I didn't get a response, I opened the door and looked around the bedroom. The bedroom door was closed and nothing had been moved. I assumed that whoever it was, they must have just left. After I finished my shower, I headed downstairs to the backyard where everybody was, and I asked who had just been looking for me because I heard somebody call my name while I was in the shower. Confused, everybody said that they had all been sitting right where they were, just talking. I brush it off, thinking that maybe I was just exhausted from the day. It was a warm night and there was a full moon out. So we enjoyed our dinner outside. The electricity turns off all throughout the village at a certain time and it doesn't come back on until morning. So I headed to my room when we had 15 minutes left so that I could get ready for bed. I was exhausted and I quickly fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up to find that I couldn't breathe. I could move, but I couldn't breathe. I was choking for what seemed like a few seconds. Suddenly I was able to breathe again and I calmed down. I fell back asleep only to suddenly wake up choking again. This time it seemed slightly longer than the last. I panicked and sat up in bed, trying to gasp for air. When my breath finally came back, I stood up and walked around the room, wondering what was going on with me. I had never had an episode like that. I was young, in excellent health. What could it be? After about 30 minutes, I was starting to feel sleepy once more, so I laid down. Once again, I woke up and it was happening all over. I'm gasping for air. I sit up in bed and I still can't breathe. I quickly sprung out of bed and I was still choking. My breath hadn't come back. And just as I thought I was going to pass out, I was able to breathe again. The moonlight was bright and was coming through the window. As I was standing there, catching my breath, I thought I saw a shadow quickly move across the wall in front of me. I sat in bed, and for the first time in a long time, I said a prayer. When I started to feel calmer, I went back to sleep. Nothing happened for the rest of the night. The next morning, I decided not to tell anybody about what had happened the night before. We had a busy day. There was a Buddhist ceremony at the house and a blessing. I was meeting with friends of family and other relatives, and toward the end of the day, I was talking to my older cousin, who's from the United States. She tells me that the monks are there blessing the house because there might be some restless spirits. She went on, giving me an example of the very room that I was staying in that belongs to my other cousin. He refuses to stay in that room at night 
because he always hears somebody calling his name and pulling at his legs in the night. That was the last night that I stayed in that house. My family has experienced paranormal activity. We were living abroad in Southeast Asia, where spirituality is an integral part of life. We moved into a building on a hill overlooking the jungle when I was three, in an affluent neighborhood of the country's capital city. The building had many apartments and one big house at the bottom of the hill, which is where we lived. When I was five, we were hosting a dinner party, when all of a sudden we hear a bang. A guest bathroom, with doors on opposite sides of the room, had shut and locked itself on both sides. My dad had to use a screwdriver to open the lock, and there was nobody and nothing to be found inside. Creepy, right? It gets worse. My auntie came to visit shortly after, and she claimed to see an old woman every night wandering the top floor of the house. An entity my mom told me a few weeks ago she would often see when we lived there. The spirits were not malevolent, but seemed disturbed, apparently. Before we left, we got a monk to come and check the place out. He said that the building had been constructed on top of an old Buddhist burial site, something that is not usually allowed, and the spirits were not able to rest peacefully. Furthermore, he indicated that the banana tree outside of our kitchen was a hub for spirits to hang out. My parents confronted the landlord, who confirmed that the place was haunted. I'm not very spiritual at the moment, but some odd stuff has happened. My parents now always practice feng shui in our house. We moved back to said country a few years later, and we went to visit the place. I was 12 at the time. Sure enough, the building was completely abandoned and the landlord had put it up for sale. This just might be one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. My family and I had just moved into a little house, nothing too fancy. We'd only been living there for a few weeks when paranormal things started happening as soon as we entered the attic. It was like we disturbed the demon or spirit when we went in there. Everyone who went up there had a bad feeling about it. At first, I was the only one who realized what was happening. I remember me laying in bed, everything a silent stone. I was peacefully watching TV and then I heard whispering in my closet, which was right in front of me. As I laid there, paralyzed, I remember thinking to myself that I could get up and slowly check. Keep in mind, I was only seven or eight. As I sat there negotiating with myself, I finally was persuaded to go and check. It sounded like at least five people whispering, but as soon as I opened the closet door, nobody was there. The only thing there was all my clothes but they were swaying back and forth. And it couldn't have been the wind or anything like that, because I checked if the closet doors had made a little wind and the clothes didn't move. This went on every night for about two weeks. Then my family started to catch on. My grandma had been staying at the house visiting and had to sleep in my room with the dog. The next morning, my grandma tells me that my dog was growling at the closet all night and that something evil was in there. After that, the whispers stopped, but the weird noises, things being out of place, and things like that didn't quit. After a while, we got used to it, but that's when things just got worse. This one night, I had to take a shower, and I went to bed as usual. No whispers or anything, I just went straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up with three scratches down my stomach. I thought it was the dog at first, but this is the weird part. My mom and grandma both described it 
as if it looked like something went inside me and scratched me from the inside out. At seven or eight years old, I got a little freaked out by that. After that occurred, we blessed the house, but things just didn't stop. My mom and I rode our bikes to the store, and when we got back, we saw a little girl standing in our backyard. So we searched for her, thinking she was lost or something, but we found nothing. Our yard was fenced in, too, so I'm not sure how a little girl would have gotten there. Then after that, things stopped. I mean, we would occasionally get a few things here or there, but nothing too serious. A few years passed, and we eventually moved out. I don't know what it was. A demon? A lost spirit? I'm just glad I don't have to deal with it anymore. Back when I was a kid, we used to spend summers on an island called Mindoro. It was an underdeveloped province from the Philippines, and it tended to have folklore around Oswangs. One of the more famous ones was the Nuno Sapunso. It's a dwarf-like creature that lives in a punso, or a termite mound. As a kid growing up near Manila, these folklore weren't something we really believed in. Well, one time, being the kid I was, I pissed on a punso as I was making fun of it, taunting the Nuno. Next day, I had a pretty high fever. A week passed and it never went away. We went to an albulario, a shaman, and he told me that the Nuno got mad and we had to give an offering. So that's what we did. I think my grandma gave it fruit or nuts or something, but I can't remember. After that, my fever eventually died away. It definitely taught me a lesson or two about being respectful. When my family still lived in Vietnam, my sister was led into the ocean by something. We still don't know what it is. She was neck deep, and people kept calling her frantically, but there was no reaction. Somebody ran into the water and had to pull her out. She remembers nothing. My parents took her to a shaman type person, and they said that my sister and the ocean are not friends, and it would most likely be how she died. My parents are refugees. They came over to New Zealand on a boat with my siblings. My sister and my brother almost died on that boat. They're still alive and healthy today, but it's interesting in context of what that shaman said. It's still one of the scariest things that's ever happened to our family though, just watching her walk into that ocean like she was being called. I was talking to an old friend about maybe going on an impromptu ghost hunt this month, and during the conversation, we reminisced about some of the creepy stuff that we had experienced over the years. We remembered a particular event that stuck out with us, and it's one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced. The story begins with my friend, who we'll call T, and myself searching a hidden attic-like space in his house for a supposed stash of money allegedly left there by a previous tenant. Truth be told, I think that was just a story his mom told us to get us off the Xbox for a while. It was the heyday of Halo, and she was probably just sick of us sitting in front of his TV. But whether or not the story she told us was true, we wound up in this small and low ceilinged attic space, which could only be accessed by a tiny door hidden in the wooden panels in the wall. We'd known about the door for a while, but had never bothered to go in, mostly because the door seemed like it had been sealed somehow, and we couldn't be bothered with actually using our brains and finding something to pry it open. But the prospect of finding free money in a dusty old room was too much. 
so we called a few friends to come help search the place. And after a few pries with a putty knife and a flathead screwdriver, we cracked the door open and began to explore. At first it didn't seem like much was in there, some old clothes and papers scattered about, and a desk in the corner. But through the gloom and dust, we could see something against the far wall, which turned out to be a very old cot of some kind. It was either busted in half or was meant to fold in half, but either way it was folded over on itself, and we could see something covered in cloth and sandwiched between the two halves. Of course, we wouldn't be good treasure hunters if we didn't look at the covered thing, so we start making our way over to the folded cot. I take a few steps forward, and my foot goes right through the floor like it's made of wet paper. Luckily, though T was right behind me, he had very quick reflexes. His hand shot out and grabbed the back of my shirt to keep me from falling forward, and probably all the way through the floor. We took a second to laugh at the situation, and realized that we should probably stick to the sides of the room, as the center was most likely the weakest, and probably the most likely to collapse under our weight. So we tiptoe all the way around the wall of the room, until we get to the cot, where we start unfolding it to get to the covered thing. This is where things got strange. As soon as we touched the cot, the room got very cold, which was odd because we were in an attic in mid-July. At the time, we thought nothing of it. We were certain we had found the stash. We were moments away from being rich. So we unfold the cot, which took all of our combined strength from how rusted and decrepit the thing was. Honestly, I was surprised it didn't just crumble to dust at the first touch. Finally, we got it unfolded and found that it was in fact a decently sized wall mirror that had been wrapped in a sheet or a thin blanket. As soon as we uncovered the mirror, the tiny door that we had come through slowly swung shut. Again, we didn't think anything about it. Must have been a gust of air or something. We were a little disheartened by the lack of money, but T's mom had sent us in there with her camera to take pictures of anything interesting, so she could see what was inside, since she wouldn't be going in herself. So we snap a couple of pictures of the mirror, the cot, and the random debris lying around. Now here it's important to note that the mirror's reflective surface was absolutely caked with dust. You could barely tell that the mirror was a mirror, the dust was so thick. Yet the base of the mirror, which looked and felt like it was made of some sort of ceramic, was practically pristine. When I say the base, I mean the part of the mirror in which the reflective surface was set, not the actual bottom of the mirror. I found that to be very odd, as the whole mirror had been covered by the sheet. So why would any of it be dusty at all, let alone just a specific part like that? So we snap the pictures and are about to call it quits, when we hear the dogs barking downstairs. That usually meant that somebody was at the door, so we carefully make our way along the walls and out of the room to head downstairs. It turned out to be our friend, who we'll call B, who had come to help us search for the supposed stash. After we told her about the attic room, she wanted to see it for herself. So naturally, we took her up and showed her the tiny door. Before we even set foot into the room, we told her about the crappy floor and to only walk along the walls. Of course, she either didn't take us seriously, or she just didn't understand what we had said, because she takes a couple of steps toward the cot and falls almost all the way through the floor, practically right through the small hole that I had created earlier. So she's sitting there with her upper body still in the attic, and her legs dangling down through the ceiling of the kitchen. It was at this moment that I heard one of the most hilarious sentences I've ever heard. Through the now large hole in the floor, we could hear T's mom on the phone with someone when she said in a very flat and nonchalant tone, I have to go now, there are children falling through my ceiling. So we get V out of the floor and have a good laugh about the situation. And once we're sure she was okay, we all agreed it was probably best to just leave the room alone before we caused any more damage. We get out and all the way downstairs when T pipes up that he'd forgotten the camera and a flashlight in there. So I agreed to go back in with him to grab them. 
We thought it wouldn't take but a second, as he remembered setting them both down on the floor, close to the hole, when we were helping B get out. But when we got there, we were a little confused. We couldn't see the camera or the flashlight anywhere. We looked all over the floor, thinking maybe we'd kicked them around on our way out, or when we were helping B, but they weren't there. We were about to go check if he had maybe set them outside the door or something when we were shutting it behind us, when T stopped dead in his tracks and whispered my name. I looked over, and in an instant, I knew what had made him stop. The mirror was covered up with the sheet again, only this time the outline of the camera and flashlight could be seen under the cover. We stood there and stared at it for a good minute or two before T got brave enough and started making his way along the wall to get over to the cot. I followed on very shaky legs and I watched as he pulled the cover off the mirror to reveal that his camera and flashlight were indeed hidden under the sheet along with the words, help me, scrawled in the dust beside them. It was like something out of a horror movie, and honestly, if I hadn't been there, I wouldn't believe it. The nope factor must have been too much for T, because he snatched up his stuff and made a beeline for the door, with me close behind. We slammed the door shut behind us and never went back in. T's mom thought we were making the whole thing up, until we went back and looked through the camera. We had pictures of the cod and the mirror, both before and after messing with them. One of the folded cot with the covered mirror still hidden, one of the open cot with the covered mirror revealed, and one of the uncovered mirror, which showed no writing in the dust. But there was one final picture, which convinced his mom that we were telling the truth, and that she should never open that door again. The last picture was taken seemingly from atop the cot, and clearly showed the giant hole where B had fallen through, which meant that after T had put the camera down so that we could get B out of the hole, someone else had picked it up from beside the hole after we left, carried it and a flashlight over to the mirror, and snapped a picture after setting it down. That had to have happened very quickly, because we were only out of the room for three minutes at most. T realized he'd forgotten his camera almost as soon as we'd gotten downstairs. The only ones that were there were T, his mom, myself, and B. His dad and older brother were at work, and even if they had come home, they would have had to pass us on the stairs to get up to the attic. There's just no way that I can logically explain the writing on the mirror, and to this day, I still think about what was in that attic with us. Growing up, I dealt with what every child that comes from a military family has to deal with. Constantly making new friends and losing friends because their parents or my father would move to a new station. This time, we were leaving Arizona, and once again, we're going to Germany. But before I, my sisters, and my mother could join him, we had to stay in a small town in Ohio with my grandparents. My father either had to seek out the right-sized accommodations off base or just wait for base housing to become available. In Ohio, it was the kind of town where everybody knows each other. The kind of town that had corner stores that all the kids loved because they had the best candies, and the owner was just the friendliest old gent you've ever met. The blink and you'll miss it kind of town. My grandparents' house was beautiful, huge, and old. I'm not entirely sure when it was built, but judging by the electrical outlets, light switches, narrow doorways, and old doors with the rustic knobs and keyholes, I'd say it was sometime in the late 40s to 50s. It sat next to a creek that my cousins and I would often go play in and catch frogs to torment my sister with. I loved this house, except for two areas that I would avoid, the attic and the basement with the partial earthen floor, low ceiling, and single 40-watt light bulb to illuminate the one room. I went to the basement just once to check on the laundry for my grandmother, and I refused to go down there ever again. I wouldn't even go near the basement door. Both of those areas just gave me the creeps. 
the vibes I got from them just put me on edge. I want to say it was just a child's overactive imagination and that my mind was just playing tricks on me. But I would just be in denial of what I had witnessed in these areas of the house. My older sister and I slept in a bunk bed in a bedroom on the second floor that was in the corner of the house, which was above the kitchen, which was above the basement. And my mother and baby sister shared a bedroom down the hall, which was adjacent to the staircase. Our little bedroom had its own bathroom, which in and of itself was a pretty sweet deal, had it not been for the fact that the attic door was also in the bathroom. This door was unlike any other attic entrance I've ever seen. It was an actual door, child-sized, and in the wall. When it opened, it would creak on its hinges, and there was a hinged set of stairs that you lowered to climb up. This likely added to the creep factor as well. On a previous visit one Christmas, I had gone up to the attic on a dare for my cousins. They told me that there were bats up there, yet had never been up themselves. I was hesitant, but it was during the day, and my cousins were right by the door, so I went in. Climbing up the stairs, I was cautiously looking around, not wanting any winged rats flying at me. And what did I see? A rather large attic that could easily have been another bedroom, a few boxes, my dad's archery set, and a wooden chair. None of this could be considered out of the ordinary, and definitely not scary. At this point, I'm willing to bet that you thought I was going to say I saw a chair move or something, but no. In fact, this was the only time that the chair was worth mentioning just because I noticed it. During our first week, my mother asked my sister and I if either of us had gone downstairs for something in the middle of the night. We hadn't. She had heard somebody walking down the hall from our room and down the stairs. She had called out our names and received no reply. She seemed to just shrug it off and go with the old houses make noises explanation. That same night, my sister was in the bathroom brushing her teeth before bed. She said that it felt like somebody was watching her from near the attic door. We both woke up later with that same feeling after hearing that familiar creaking from the attic door. Something was now looking at us from the doorway of the bathroom. We had both seen it, a shadow standing in the dark. We got right out of there and into my mother's room, telling her we saw a ghost. When she groggily inquired as to why we were in her room, we repeated it, and then she begrudgingly made room for us in the bed. We saw this a couple more times during our stay, but that was the only time we ever hightailed it into her room. The one time I had ventured into the basement, I had been checking the laundry for my grandmother. The washing machine's cycle was done, so I thought I'd transfer the laundry to the dryer. With an arm full of damp clothes, I noticed movement near the wall around the earthen floor. I froze and looked directly at a shadow, walking from one wall and into the next. It was bad enough that I was uncomfortable in this basement, but after seeing this, that was enough to keep me out of the room. My sister and I had shared our experiences with my grandparents, but they simply shrugged it off with the old house explanation and said that we were just making up stories to get attention. Then my mother chimed in with her experiences, and this produced an argument that had us leaving and staying with the other grandparents for a time. Soon after, my father had sent for us and we were living in a beautiful three-story home owned by our German landlord and his wife. Both treated us like their own grandchildren and far better than our own blood. The only incident to report in this new house was a French nanny who got frustrated and gave up trying to teach us French because we just couldn't get past their equivalent of yes without giggling. I'm 18 now, but from the ages of 3 to 11, my family and I lived in a large four-bedroom Victorian home. It wasn't really the location you would expect a haunted house to be in. We were right next to a busy street, in a row of other houses, all very old though. The house had three floors, 
as the attic had been converted into two bedrooms, and a large walk-in storage cupboard separated the two rooms. I lived with my three older half-siblings, and so it was very common for us to swap rooms every few months. I had slept in every room, my parents' room quite often as I was terrified every night, the large room opposite theirs, and the two attic rooms. Each one seemed to have its own different type of horror. For the first few years, I was too terrified to sleep on my own. I barely slept, and when I did, I suffered from terrible nightmares, so I would sleep in a camp bed in my parents' room. That was where I had my first encounter with sleep paralysis. I couldn't have been older than six, but I still remember it vividly. A small boy with a paper bag over his head seemed to emerge from the wall next to my mother's side of the bed and slowly but surely walked around their bed toward me. I remember looking to my side and there was what I can only describe as a tall black stick figure, like one of those drawings, who was looking above me. I couldn't move, I was sweating profusely, but I knew that I was awake. The next thing I knew, he was crouching down to me, and the boy had reached the foot of my bed. It was at that moment that I managed to let out a scream. I have never had anything as vivid as that happen again, but I will never forget it. When I was seven or eight, I started wanting to have my own room. I did a lot of reading to distract myself from the fear, and often I would stay up until the early hours of the morning reading, too terrified to sleep waking up in the morning with my book still in my arms. I was given one of the attic rooms. By that point, my older sister had the room opposite mine, but she had gone off to university, so I was alone up there. I would never dare sleep without the light on, and to be honest, old habits never die, as even now I still sleep with a light on, unless I'm with my boyfriend. Most nights would be me reading in bed as long as I could, until I just had to close my eyes. It was then that the voices would start up, like there was a couple arguing in the hall. On some of the worst nights, I swore that I could hear breathing coming from under my bed. It got to a point where I was so scared, I had to have my dog and cat sleep in my room with me, but they couldn't settle. My dog would just keep crying and my cat was constantly spooked. They hated being in there so I had no choice but to remain alone. The night terrors continued. I'd wake up and I just couldn't stand to be in the room anymore. So I'd creep down to the second floor and sleep outside my parents' door. I don't know how I even functioned with so little sleep. Most times I couldn't have sleepovers as my friends would complain of being scared and hearing things. My siblings had similar experiences when my sister had her friends over, often her friend would recount waking up in the night, and my sister was sitting up in bed, still asleep, but talking to the dark corner of the room. My brother would have his covers pulled off of him at night, and my other sister recalled her toes being pinched while she slept. Everyone had their own experiences in that house, even non-believers. My dad recounted being locked out from the outside of the house when he went to the garden even though he was the only one home, and seeing a dark shadow glide next to the door as he struggled to open it. There were times I would be sitting outside my parents' room at three in the morning, and I would hear the cutlery drawer downstairs being shaken, the TV being turned on for a split second, then turned off, even though I knew that everyone was asleep. I couldn't do anything in that house without the feeling that I was being watched. If I was alone in the house, I would stay out in the garden the whole time, but even then I felt extremely uneasy. I would sit on my trampoline and feel a pair of eyes watch me from the living room window that looked out onto the garden. Our elderly neighbor told my father the backstory of the house when my dad would sometimes recount the strange occurrences going on. He told us years before we moved in there lived a very reclusive middle-aged woman known to be very cold and unwelcoming. She didn't leave often, only to go to work as a gym teacher. She was known to be sadistic, 
He mentioned something extremely chilling, though, which was that she had confided in him once that she lived in fear of the house and that she refused to go into the attic because it terrified her. She died several years before we moved. One of the most chilling things was that once she passed, the house was completely renovated. The attics turned into rooms, as I mentioned. The flower beds that Mrs. Evans had taken so much pride in were torn up and everything changed. The work was mostly done by one man who had been hired to do so by the local council who inherited the house as Mrs. Evans had no family to speak of. Just days after he'd finished up the renovation, his daughter died in a freak lightning accident. I personally have no idea if it was related, but it's terribly unfortunate either way. But the neighbors seemed to think that whatever was in that house certainly did not take kindly to it being changed and decided to take revenge. That's just hearsay, mind you, but it's a little chilling nonetheless. I do believe that there were several entities in that house, including possibly Mrs. Evans herself, but the strongest resided in the attic. I felt things up there that I have never since encountered a genuine feeling of something evil, something that wants to hurt you. I can't even recall how many times people were seemingly pushed when going down the stairs from the attic, or whenever my cat, who was usually the loveliest boy, was near those stairs, he would viciously attack you with no explanation for the outburst. The whole house had its moments. It was in a constant state of darkness and bitter cold, but the attic? I don't even have the words to describe what that was. We finally moved when I was 11, and as if by magic, the nightmares disappeared. I could finally sleep easily. We've moved several times since then, and I have never encountered a house like that again. Honestly, I haven't had any paranormal experiences at all that I can think of since being in that house, but that is fine with me. It was enough for a lifetime. I do think it will always be with me, though. Sometimes I'll have the most vivid dreams that I'm back there, and I'm so glad to be there. Almost as though the house in the attic is calling me back. I have so many stories of creepy things happening, so much so that I'd have to talk for hours to tell them all. But I think it's more than enough for now. My friend Monica has been babysitting for this family for the past two years. She has been taking care of these two girls, both at the age of two. Nothing out of the ordinary has happened in the past, but recently there have been some strange events taking place. One normal day, Monica was just doing her thing, putting the babies to sleep in their own separate rooms, all cribbed up for nap time. After making sure that the girls were asleep, she left the room at about 1.30. A couple of hours later, at 3 in the afternoon, she went to check on the girls. What she found in one of the girls' rooms was very unsettling. The room was a mess. Ripped up diapers and napkins were strewn everywhere. The kiddo was fast asleep as if nothing had ever happened. Above one of the shelves in the room, across from the girls' crib, hung a cross in a sealed box that the family had gotten from the Vatican. They were very specific in telling her to never open the box or touch the crucifix. She immediately noticed that the box was open and the crucifix was on the floor. Mind you, the crucifix had been hung three meters off the ground, much too high for the baby to reach. She also found some angel deck cards on the ground, each attributed to a different saint or angel. She quickly woke up the child and made sure she was all right and unharmed. Then comes the strangest part of the story. After waking her up, she took her into the other room for playtime. Then, playing pretend restaurant, the little girl approached Monica, holding a piece of paper in her hand, which Monica assumed was the pretend menu for the restaurant. 
but when Monica took it out of her hand, she noticed that it was a pamphlet to do with the Wiccan religion and basic instructions for how to practice witchcraft. Monica, now obviously on edge, asked the little girl where she'd gotten it from. The girl pointed toward a book laid open on one of the stairs which was unusual because she knows not to play with the books from the bookshelf and is normally very well behaved. The book was Wicca, A Guide for the Solitary Practitioner by Scott Cunningham. Ever since then, Monica has been a little on edge and she said that she's been having very strange and abnormal dreams. Some other important information to note is that the family is Catholic and they live across the street from Eastern State Penitentiary, an old suspected haunted former prison that closed in 1971. If you have any ideas, speculations, or know anything that has to do with Wicca or the book mentioned, please let me know. Monica wants to know the best ways to keep herself and the baby safe from whatever energy is in the house, because regardless of anything else, she feels that they are definitely not friendly. When I was 13, I babysat a little girl named Emma, one of the sweetest kids you could think of. I was a regular babysitter for her, so much so that when I couldn't babysit for a few months, she called all her other babysitters by my name. This happened after I came back to being a regular babysitter for her. It was about 10.30 at night. I had already put Emma to bed and had been channel surfing. The house was set up so that the front half was open concept. The living room, dining room, and kitchen were side by side. In between the living room and dining room was an open doorway to the back half of the house. At one end was Emma's room, and the other end had her parents, with the bathroom connected to the parents' room. While I was sitting on the couch, I heard something run down the hall to the bathroom. Assuming it was just Emma going to the bathroom, I let it be. A few minutes went by, and I heard the feet heading back down the hall. I turned to tell her to go back and make sure she flushed, because I hadn't heard it, but I only saw the tips of black hair that ran past the open doorway. Here's the problem. Emma is blonde. I quickly jumped up and rushed to Emma's bedroom, throwing open the door. Her nightlight was bright enough to make her out as she sat up and looked at me, rubbing her eyes in confusion. I asked her if she had just gone to the bathroom. When she shook her head, I did a once-over of her room, checking under her bed and a quick peek in her closet. I didn't see anything, so I told Emma I was just double-checking for monsters. I tucked Emma back in, saying goodnight, and as I headed out of her room, leaving the door slightly open, I stopped when I heard her speak. I thought she was going to call me back in and ask me something, but instead, I hear her say, You should have said something. Don't scare her. I really like her. I didn't say anything to the mom about it, and I continued to babysit Emma, or I did until they moved away. I always made an effort after that to include the second child I didn't know I was babysitting. If Emma was drawing, an extra spot was set up. If she was eating, another chair and table setting was set up. It seemed to make Emma happy, and nothing ever startled me again. Still, weirds me out. I'm going to give a little background first before I get into my experience, so you can all better understand. My partner and I are good friends with another couple that we often go over to hang out with. We'll call them Ashley and David. We go to their house about twice a week, and nothing out of the ordinary ever happens. We usually just hang out and talk for hours, with a few beers. David has mentioned a few times that he's seen Ashley's deceased brother around the house, Ashley always rolls her eyes and says she doesn't believe in things like that. 
Ashley took her brother's passing very hard, and she was very close with him. Fast forward to today. Ashley has a son that we'll call Adam. She called me and asked me to watch him since he was homesick from school while she went to work. I agreed and came straight over. Everything was normal. Adam was at the dining room table. He was playing a game on his laptop, still in his pajamas. He's a great kid. He never complains or gives anybody trouble. I went to the restroom, which is down the hallway past the living room. This bathroom shares a wall with the master bedroom's bathroom wall. As I'm doing my business, I heard the water turn on and off twice from that bathroom, followed by talking. I can hear what sounds like two people talking very fast, but it was muffled. I didn't think much of this, figuring that Adam must have wandered in there with the two dogs. He's nine, and he talks to the dog sometimes as most kids do. I came out of the bathroom to find him still in the same position at the kitchen table, and the dogs were sleeping on the couch. I said, hey buddy, did you go into your mom's bathroom and have the water on? He looked puzzled and said, no, I haven't left this table, and I don't go in there. I then went to the kitchen sink and noticed it was dry, so the water I heard being turned on had to have come from the master bathroom. And what about the talking I heard? I chalked it up to maybe the next door neighbors. A few hours go by and Adam is on the couch with me, watching TV, and the dogs were there too. I start hearing things being moved in the master bedroom, almost like somebody was cleaning up, picking things up and setting them back down. The dogs then start to bark and run to the master bedroom door. This repeats every half an hour or so until David comes home. I explained my experience, and he just smiled and nodded. I asked him what he was smiling about, and he said, Ashley's brother's ashes are in the bedroom, and she recently got the ashes of her stepdad from her sister. She mixed the ashes. That's the talking you heard. Her brother and stepdad. They used to sit in the garage together and just chatter all through the night. At this point, I'm creeped out. David is glad that someone believes him now. I told Ashley about my experience, but she refuses to believe any of it. I personally think she's in denial, and I don't really blame her. It's scary stuff, and it's hard to believe unless you experience it for yourself. I have never seen anything paranormal before or after that, and I hope I never do, because hearing that stuff gave me enough chills to last a while. I was babysitting my nephew one night, who was still a little kid in diapers, but could talk. I'm not really sure how old he was, but he was little. My friend Matt had come over, and we were each playing PlayStations on separate TVs, back to back. My nephew starts crying upstairs, where he's sleeping in my mom's bed. I run up to check on him, and he says that there's a man behind the bedroom door. Now the bedroom door is open, and I can clearly see that there is no man hiding behind it. Then, just as I turn back, the door swings back with force over the carpet and bangs against the wall. I picked him up and decided to move him to my room. My room, at the time, was the room in the southeast corner of the house. I get him settled and he's just about to go back to sleep, when the closet door opens, folding in half slowly. I remember the dread that came over me. I took my nephew and yelled down to Matt to pack the systems up. My sister, who I was babysitting for, lived just across the road, so I moved us to her place. As we were about to cross, and I'm not kidding, a power line dropped from the pole and started jumping around at the end of my sister's driveway. I think that night was the second weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. Perhaps it was all just a weird coincidence, but still, freaks me out to this day.
This creepy encounter occurred in the fall of 2001. My family lived in a nice house in the middle of some dense woods. A few of my friends consistently brought their four-wheelers with them when they came to spend the night. We had a huge yellow four-wheeler and rode pretty much constantly that year. The woods behind my parents' house had trails, every which way, that snaked around and down the haulers and to the roads. My friends and I, 11 to 12 years old at the time, had these big plans to get street signs and put them on the trees so that all of our trails would have their names proudly displayed. One day, a friend came to stay and we rode around on the trails for hours. When we became bored of the trails, we took off on the main road to a fire training center about three miles away. The fire training center was down a one-lane gravel road with trees butting up to the side so close that a car would get scratched going down it. At the end of the road was a pole gate to keep people like us out. On the way there, we passed by a small pickup truck with two men in it. When we got to the little trail that went down and around the gate, we saw a dead dog wrapped up in a blanket, blocking the path. We decided to turn around because I didn't want to run over the thing. So we started heading back on the main road, and again, about halfway back, we passed the small pickup truck with the men. My friend and I joke that the men are following us because they know we saw the dog that they dropped off and that they hadn't buried it the way they should have. We get almost back to my house and decide we can probably find another trail around the dog, maybe on the other side of the gate. So off we go. We turn onto the little gravel road and go to the end. There is no other trail, no other way around, but the dog is kind of laying on half of the blanket. So we sit there for a few minutes while I try to convince my friend if she just tugs on the edge of the blanket, we could move the blanket and the dog out of the way without actually touching or disturbing it. She's not budging, but I really want to ride on the other side of the gate. After a few minutes, it's clear that she is not touching the blanket. So we turn around to head back home. We start back down the gravel road and after a second, we turn to the straight part. Panic set in quickly. The small pickup is sitting in the road, blocking our only exit. The trees touch both sides of the truck, so there's no going around it. Two large men sit staring at us. After what feels like forever, I whip the four-wheeler around and go through the trail anyway. We get around the gate into safety. Were they watching me try to persuade her to move the blanket? Could they see us the whole time? Were they still moving until we got to the clear part? What would have happened if I hadn't given up on the blanket? Those questions scare me now as much as they did back then. That gravel road only goes to the fire training center, which is blocked off by a large metal gate. A car that pulls down there is only able to back the entire way out onto the main road. Anyway, we soon forgot about it and it really didn't change much. I like to think that our town is really safe and that the men were just curious about what the heck we were doing going back and forth. But when I read some stories, I think about what it could have been, how it could have gone differently, and it really freaks me out. I was a child of divorce and, as such, was often taken by my dad on weekends when I was a kid. He spent most of that time waxing his car at my grandparents who lived out in nowhere North Carolina since he lived in a condo with no hoses to wash his precious. Ignored, my brother and I were typically left to our own devices and wandered the fields and woods around my granddad's land, which was about a half hour drive from civilization. My family owned the neighboring homes and great swatches of land between and behind the homes, so we could pretty much explore out there for hours. All this said, there were some really disturbing things that happened there, and I personally think they're either too absurd or too subtle to have been my childhood imagination. You can decide for yourselves though, and I'd love to hear what you guys think might have been going on. Here are some things I remember. 
My great uncle was the kind of a jack of all trades. He bought and sold used cars. He also bought wrecks to strip and scrap, dumping the useless husks in a field and the woods up a trail behind his house. My brother and I called this place the car graveyard. On its own, it was eerie, with cars all the way back from the 50s in various states of disrepair. I used to climb inside them, until I got into one that was tacky, with what might have been dried blood. Sometimes I'd find bones out there, deer mostly, but they'd be in odd places, like skulls on car hoods. My guess is that it was just poachers on his land messing around because he didn't hunt, but who knows. I never saw any with skin or fur. One day, my brother and I were going to the car graveyard, but up the trail to it, we started to hear what sounded like pained moaning up ahead, where the derelicts were. We turned tail that day. Oddest, perhaps, from the car graveyard was the one time we actually went really far back to see just how deep the cars went. It continued into the woods for a while, with trees sometimes growing right out of the wrecks. My brother and I saw something ahead that looked like fog or mist, which reminds me of another story, but that's for another day. We didn't think much about it because we were kids, but this was mid-afternoon and the mist was only in one area. We passed on through and felt inexplicably weird and decided to give up on seeing just how far back it went. When we got back to my granddad's place, things seemed off. It was really hard to explain. My dad looked like my dad and acted like him, but he didn't feel the same. My brother felt this same dissonance too, and we got this wild idea that when we crossed the fog, we somehow stepped into another dimension, maybe just slightly different from our own. Maybe it was just stupid kid stuff, but I still remember how oppressive this feeling of not belonging was. We booked it back across the fog again, and when we came back, everything immediately felt as right as rain. We went back as an adult to that same spot. No fog, but there was a particularly off-putting sensation. A few other odd things happened out there, but not in the car graveyard. We heard laughter coming from a hole in the woods. I swore that I saw the stereotypical sheet ghost near the woods, but as soon as I looked, they vanished. I regularly saw a face in the shadows between the trees across the field. It reminded me of Morlock from the 60s time machine. I saw a log truck carrying a bear on its back that was as tall as a house. It was probably some fiberglass thing for a store or putt-putt golf, but it was still a really odd thing to see. I hesitate to add this one because it's just so goofy, but what the heck. One day, my brother and I were messing with my granddad's walkie-talkies, and we saw this really odd-looking bird in the sky. We joked that it looked like a flying monkey from The Wizard of Oz, and said, Flying monkey! Flying monkey! Come in, flying monkey! into the walkie-talkies. Another voice came through and said, Someone get me a flying banana. A bit spooked, we went into the kitchen and took a banana to leave it outside, and we stayed indoors for the rest of that visit. When we left, only the peel was sitting outside. That's about all I got for that area. A few things happened inside the house too, but that's not really pertinent to this story. So, I used to live near an infamous road. It's a thin road with no street lines, has only a few houses at the end, and is lined with thick woods. There were no street lights. We heard stories like ghosts being spotted in the woods, weird beasts, creepy vibes, and a penny thrown off a small bridge coming back to you. Things like that. Urban legends, really. My boyfriend and I decided to drive down it one night in his car. It was a small stick shift car. The road had several pull-offs where you could park and sit. We pulled off at the first one and took some footage of the woods. Nothing happened. So we continued driving to the next pull-off. We parked and shut off the car. 
We heard some rustling, but we both assume that it's an animal moving away from the sound of the car parking. We sat there for a few seconds in the dark of the woods. We heard something hit the car like a rock or something. Then we heard several pounds on the truck and the roof. At this point, we decided to drive off. He attempted to start the car to no avail. He tried this several times before it eventually did start. He then put it in gear and stepped on the gas, but the car stood still. I was freaking out and told him to stop messing around. He said he wasn't. Then the car, while in first gear and the gas was depressed, began to be pulled backwards. Against all logic, the car was fighting to go forward against something that wasn't visible. The taillights lit up the forest behind us and there was absolutely nothing there. Out of nowhere, the car miraculously just jumps forward and we drove away from the pull-off. Blown away by this experience, we decided to find another pull-off. This was stupid. The one we found was before the bridge where pennies are thrown. We go over to the bridge and throw a penny. We hear it hit the small stream. We look back at the car and we swear that we see somebody walk behind it. So we rush back to the car, but there's no sign of anyone. This was the last straw, so we decided to get off that road ASAP. We get in the car and we speed off. As we're driving, something small hits and chips our windshield. It did not sound like a rock. It sounded like a penny. Whatever was on that road wanted us gone, and we haven't gone back since. Last year, I was backpacking deep in the mountains in Montana. I was near Libby, Montana, about three hours west of Glacier National Park. I was hiking alone, and I expected to encounter bears, moose, etc. I'm experienced, and I know how to handle them, so I wasn't scared. But this time, I was way out in the middle of nowhere, with nobody around for miles. Also, no cell service anywhere, and I didn't have my emergency beacon with me. Usually, I expect to see other hikers on the trail, but not here. Nope. I was out there completely alone, and I knew it. Well, it was like nine miles to my camp up at Cedar Lake. About halfway, the trail opened up, and I was in a somewhat clear area and had better visibility of what was around me. There were still trees and green undergrowth covering the ground. A few minutes later, I see something quickly scurry across the trail, maybe 50 feet in front of me. I stopped, froze, and waited. The creature noticed me and then stood up in the undergrowth, but still almost completely covered by the tall grass and shrubs. It was about three feet tall, pitch black, 50 to 60 pounds, and obviously very quick and intelligent. I assumed it was a baby black bear at first, so I didn't move or make a sound, and I got my bear spray ready, fully expecting an angry mama bear to come roaring out of the trees at me. But thankfully, that didn't happen, because I surely would have been attacked or at least bluff charged. All I could see was its face through the tall grass. The creature stared at me invasively for about 30 seconds. I was staring back at it. I didn't move a muscle. Then, suddenly, it huffed loudly at me and then ran through the grass up the side of the hill and I never saw it again. The sound it made was a lot deeper than you would expect from something that small. It was like a bear's growl. You could almost feel it inside your chest. Very unsettling. I stood there silently and waited for another few minutes to see if Mama Bear was nearby and that it was indeed a cub, but nothing came. I gingerly passed through that area on the trail and kept hiking. My research tells me it may have been an otter or a mink, but I've seen them before, and this wasn't like anything I've seen before. It was the way it moved. I only saw it for a second, but it almost slithered on the ground like a reptile, and then stood up on its hind legs and watched me, making me feel really uncomfortable. There was something sinister about it. 
I checked for tracks, but I couldn't find any. I have no idea what that thing was. I live in a tiny town in northern BC. We are surrounded by a lot of untouched forests and beautiful rivers. My family lives out in the country and we're about 10 minutes away from an uninhabited valley. It had an old road going through it from ages ago and it had an old pioneer homestead that we could make our way down to. I think some loser kids burnt it down around 2000 or 2001 though. Even from a young age, I hated going to this place with my family. I had no reason to despise it so much. Everyone that visited was always in awe of how beautiful it was down there. But I always just got this sick feeling in my stomach. My sighting was from when I was very young, so I realize not many will believe it, but it stuck with me. My family was showing a cousin from Australia this place. Our town is boring, so outdoor stuff is really all we have to offer and I was sitting on my dad's shoulders while the adults walked around. Now the road we were on had large shrubs on either side. In BC, we have a berry called Saskatoons, and the bushes on this stretch were tall and thick. Because I was on my dad's shoulders, I could see over these, but nobody else could. I remember looking over, and on the other side of these bushes was this big field with a dense forest on the other side. I saw something massive and stark white walking on two legs into those trees. As a dumb kid, I yelled out, Polar bear! Which my parents obviously ignored because there are absolutely no polar bears here. And that was that. I still have no idea what I saw. But I'm sure there could be a rational explanation involving an albino animal, possibly an overactive kid's imagination. My neighbor, who is also the closest thing that I've had to a grandfather, lives in a spot that overlooks a large field with a valley below. You pass his home to get onto the property that I had my sighting on. A few years ago, he told us of a night that he watched what he thought was a helicopter coming in to land in the large field below his home. Right as he looked at it, it was landing, and then it shot straight up and disappeared into the sky. He's a pretty serious guy, and he said this in front of my parents, so I doubt he would lie. He's convinced that he witnessed a UFO. At that point, I thought, all right, maybe there was something to what I saw. And then, my younger sister had a sighting. She was driving home on our country road after a late shift. She remembered seeing two dark silhouettes of people, no reflective clothing or anything walking in the pitch black and thinking, wow, what idiots. Just then, one of these things turns and glances at her. She told me that it had green eye shine, which she knew that humans shouldn't have, yet it was human shaped. She glanced quickly down at her clock and then back up and whatever she had seen had completely disappeared in front of her. I'm still not sure what I saw that day but given that my neighbor and my sister have seen things that are strange in the same general area, I'm thinking maybe I wasn't such an imaginative kid after all. Before I get into my story, I'd like to give a little background about my dog growing up. His name was Fonzie because he had long black hair with a white patch on his chest. Growing up, he was my best friend and protector. He was a mix of Chow and German Shepherd. And if you've ever met a Chow, I'm sure you're well aware that once they imprint on you, they won't accept anyone but you. And they are fearless protectors which was just multiplied with the mix of German Shepherd. When I was eight, we lived in the foothills of Mount Baker in the Pacific Northwest. It was a not so populated area. One evening around dusk outside my house, Fonzie and I were up to our usual shenanigans. 
He would sit behind me as I shot my BB gun at some targets I had set up on the tree line. All of a sudden, he moved in front of me and started growling, which only happened when he felt that I was in danger. Right after he got between the tree line and me, about 20 feet, a very deep and loud, almost clicking sound came from the trees. Limbs were breaking and you could hear the ground pounding. We were both terrified. He started whimpering, which he never did. We both ran into the house. I looked out the window to see if whatever it was had come out of the woods, but nothing emerged. I told my dad about it, but he didn't believe me. He jokingly said, oh yeah, it was probably Bigfoot. But I've never heard of any Bigfoot story where it charged someone. Black bears tend to stay away from loud dogs, and it was way too loud to be a cougar. So that's my story. It was by far the most terrifying experience of my life, and it still haunts me to this day as a 31-year-old man. I am an avid hiker and backpacker. Most of the time I hike by myself and I sleep out in the woods by myself. I have a good amount of time in the backcountry, and up until this incident, I would never have claimed to have experienced anything even remotely paranormal. Ticks, in my book, are the real scary monsters. This past weekend, I set out for a solo hike in the Catskill Mountains in New York. When I arrived at the trailhead, two other hikers, not together, also pulled up. This area has no marked trails, so any landmark worth getting to is technically a bushwhack. After some friendly salutation, the three of us established that we had generally similar itineraries, and we decided to head up to the highland together. Eventually, one of the guys fell behind, and after waiting for a bit, the other guy, we can call him New Hiker Bro, and I figured that he changed his plans and so we pushed on. We summited two peaks together and then decided to extend the trip a bit in search of an 80-year-old plane crash that is situated in a very rugged area in between the ridge lines of the peaks we bagged. After some more heavier bushwhacking, we found the wreck. I knew that people had died in the crash, but I had read about a number of plane crashes in the Catskills at the time I didn't remember the exact details of this particular relic. I just knew it was there. It's certainly a somber experience when you happen on any place that you know somebody took their last breath, especially in such a violent way. But besides just a general feeling of sympathy and melancholy, I can't say that I felt any sort of eerie vibes. It was a beautiful day, and the post-hike beer was the next waypoint. New hiker bro and I silently walked around the wreck, taking pictures and video, and being careful not to touch anything. Our individual wanderings had put us about 25 to 30 yards away from each other, and in between us was a water drainage, so we couldn't really hear each other, even if we wanted to talk. We explored in continued silence for about 20 minutes when I closed my camera. As soon as my viewfinder snapped into the camera body, I heard a deep male voice that did not sound like new hiker bro say, Nice shot. The best way I can describe the timber of the voice was like a compressed amplified whisper. Almost like Christian Bale's Batman, but with more tonal quality and with sort of a digital texture to it. It sounded close, but also like it was in surround sound. The woods can do some really funky things with sound all very rooted in good old-fashioned science, especially when we're on the side of a mountain, in between two ridge lines and next to a drainage. I just assumed it was somebody, and I looked up from the direction I thought it came, half expecting to see the other hiker that we'd been separated from earlier. We had discussed the plane crash on our way up, so I thought it was just him being funny. He wasn't there, though. Nobody was there in any direction. New Hiker Bro was down the ridge a bit and he was busy framing a shot, 
by now about 40 yards away from me. I made my way to him and asked if he had said something. He had not. To be honest, the creepy still didn't set in until about 10 minutes later. I just figured it was someone's voice carrying from somewhere up the ridge line above us. But as we made our way back to the more established herd path, the more I thought about it, the more the creep creeped in. I distinctively heard, nice shot. I would swear by it, to anyone, on anything. As we got back to easier ground, New Hiker Bro filled me in on the specific details of the plane crash. Three souls on board for a military training mission, post-World War II. They went off course in bad weather. Two of their remains were found. One never was. I never shared what I heard with New Hiker Bro. I don't think anybody wants to walk out of the woods with a total stranger spewing ghost stories in real time. Honestly, I still feel like there's got to be an explanation, but I just can't get over the nice shot part, especially right as I closed my camera. This probably has nothing to do with it, but I also think it's kind of interesting that, like the people on the plane, we walked into the woods as a group of three, and one of us, for lack of a better term, went missing. I was a sophomore in high school when this happened, and I haven't gone back. It's midsummer in New England, and my best friend, let's call him Andy, and I are hanging out. I live on conservation land, so aside from the houses at the very front, there are no other developments, and woodlands that span for acres and acres are all around. The state put down some paths, so I suggested that we go exploring. We geared up, I brought my pocket knife, sprayed myself down in bug spray, and headed out my backyard. We hadn't explored too much, but I knew the area somewhat well, so we decided to hell with the trails. We're going to be real men and forge our own path. We enter the woods, thickly forested with pine, maple, and oak trees, and make notches in the trees on the way so we can find our way back. It's around noon, so I'm not too worried about it getting dark. After all, the sun sets around 8 p.m. in the summer, but just in case. We walk deeper and deeper into the woods. About 15 minutes and the forest is alive. Bugs, frogs, birds, everything in this forest is loud. Slightly irritating, truthfully, but it's nice to take in the sights and the sounds. Soon we stumble upon a peculiar scene. A perfect circle, probably 20 feet in diameter, that spans from the ground all the way to the sky. I'm perplexed. But Andy is curious, so we decide to go in. The first thing I noticed is that the overgrown weeds and grass that surrounded us stopped at the perimeters. All vegetation past that line was dead. Not bare, but dead, crunching under our feet. I don't just mean the grass either, but the tree limbs that extended in were also completely bare. Leaves down the branch until it crossed the line, then nothing. Being the middle of summer, nothing should be dead, and I've never seen a branch behave like that. I'm feeling an extreme unease. I turn to Andy and ask him if he feels it. He says he feels like we're being watched, and I agree. It's then that we notice the strangest sense. The entire forest has gone silent. Not in rest, but in what feels like suspense. I'm feeling very uneasy now, and I know that we need to leave. We run out of there following our tree marks, and when we got back to my house, the forest was alive again. Ever since then, every summer, every winter, a snarl of branches, sometimes leafed, sometimes not, reveals our path through the forest. I swear that whatever was watching us from that circle peers through and wants us to come back.
I do wildlife photography, so I go hiking every Sunday and have been for about a year now. With the frequency with which I go hiking, it might be surprising that I have two experiences, or maybe not, I'm not sure about frequency. Both my experiences take place in the western part of Wisconsin. My first experience was at a semi-defunct state campground in the middle of summer. I say semi-defunct because there was a newer gravel parking lot by the gravel road and a gated off road leading deeper into what used to be a paved parking lot and paved RV and campsites. It's about a mile from the gravel parking lot to the paved lot, and this walk goes just fine. The road continues past the paved lot for about a mile and then splits into almost non-existent trails. It was after I got past the paved lot that things started to get strange. I started to get a feeling that was hard to describe. It just felt wrong. Every step I took came with the thought, you shouldn't take another step. You should turn around. This feeling kept growing and growing in intensity until I got to the end of the road and I just couldn't take it anymore. I turned back and went back because I had the strong feeling that if I went on a trail, something very bad would happen. The walk back to the gravel lot was just fine and by the time I got to the lot, the feeling was completely gone. I looked for agates on the gravel road. The second one I will say I think was probably just a deer, but I'll let you decide. This hike was in the early fall. I went off trail, down a gully, and followed a small creek. All in all, it was a good hike, until I rounded a bend and saw a cave. My initial thought was to go check it out. Then that nagging feeling came and was like, no, something bad is in there. I was admittedly thinking more along the lines of a homeless person or something like that. Not that homeless people are bad, just that I didn't want to get into an altercation. As soon as I turned away, I had that same being watched feeling that so many people describe, and I just had to get out of there. So I backtracked my steps and was about two miles into the hike back, when that feeling suddenly got much, much stronger. Eyes darting all over the place, I was literally almost walking sideways on the trail. Then all of a sudden, there was a huge crash behind me, and to the right. I didn't see anything before or after this crash. This is where I think it might have been a deer, but I didn't see anything. This feeling intensified all the way until I got into my car and locked the doors. It got better as I collected myself in the car. I don't know how to explain these. Could just be an overactive fight or flight response but they stick out so much from all of my other experiences that I can't help but think of them and wonder if I had tuned in to something else. My dad was an outdoorsman all of his life, and he had a few favorite hunting spots in central Wisconsin. My whole family spent countless amounts of time out in the woods of central Wisconsin and know them pretty well. Sometimes we'd take trips to just hang out in the woods throughout the year. Anyway, my dad isn't here anymore, but we still take random trips out into the woods just to get away. My brothers tend to spend more time out in the woods than I do, and more than the rest of the family does, as they went out there with dad the most. It's a sentimental thing. Two years ago, my family was having a get-together one spring or summer weekend. After dinner, my brothers went out into the woods to see what wildlife would be out. As one is a photographer, he's always trying to get shots of owls. Plus, they also wanted to check out one of the spots they like to camp at. I don't remember what time it was when they came back, but they were acting off. Then one of them started talking about something really messed up that was going on not too far from one of their camping spots. My mom and my sister and I, almost at the same time, asked them what it was. They said they were out walking around one of their campsites and wandered off just a little ways from it, only to stumble upon what looked like a bloodbath. They said blood was just everywhere. 
There were also peppers, corn husks, and some rocks that were all situated oddly, with blood all over everything. It looked like someone had even recently dug a hole, like to bury something. Now, at first I was about to say bullshit, because in the past they would come back with some BS story that you could tell they were making up. But this time was different. There was not even a hint of a smile or a laugh on either of their faces. They said that the disturbed ground where the hole was dug and filled in looked like it was big enough to put a small animal or maybe a human baby in. They just couldn't stop talking about the amount of blood that was all over. We told them they should call the sheriff's department as it could be something serious. It wouldn't be the first time that a body was found out in these parts. They wanted to, but then decided not to because they'd been drinking. Naturally, we were pissed at them for just wanting to leave it alone. I kept putting the pressure on them to report it, and three days later, one finally did. He'd been asking some of the people at his work about what they thought it could be, and one had mentioned that in their culture, it wasn't unusual to find a place out in the woods to perform a ceremony and bury a baby if it had passed away. That really unsettled my brother, as cemeteries are where the dead logically go to be laid to rest, and the amount of blood still had him on edge, so that's what made him finally report it. After the area was investigated by authorities, what they dug up from the hole turned out to be a rabbit, not a human. The sheriff did say that he really appreciated him reporting it anyway, because there really are all kinds of strange things that happen out in rural areas. It never hurts to be cautious and report suspicious things. Back in the early 1990s, I was a kid, around 13 at the time of this incident. And I used to stay at my grandparents' house a lot, out in a very rural area in southeastern Arkansas. When I say very rural, I mean it was a series of networked dirt roads to get out to their house. The closest neighbors besides my aunt and uncle, who lived about a quarter of a mile up the road, was over a mile and a half away. This was very backwoods and isolated from most civilization. The closest town was a 10 mile trip. It's in the middle of farmland and mostly woods. They had lived in this house since my mother was a child and had both grown up just a ways down the road. Anyway, there was a general store roughly three to four miles down the network of dirt roads. This was your typical country general store run by an old lady and her husband and its only customers really consisted of the people who lived out there in BFE. One day my grandmother asked me if I wanted to walk to the general store and get her some milk, eggs, and a few other miscellaneous items, and I told her I would. She gave me some money and I headed on my way. It was fairly early in the day and I had plenty of time to get back before dark, which I always made sure to do when I was out roaming about. Things can get mighty creepy out in the backwoods of Arkansas after nightfall. It's a darkness unlike most people who have lived primarily in cities or towns have ever experienced. Me being a 13 year old, I had poor time management skills. I stopped at the bottom of a hill next to this small wooden bridge you have to cross and messed around at the creek catching crawdads and such. And I kind of just messed around the whole way to the store. By the time I left the store, I realized it was quickly approaching dark. This was fall, and darkness set upon the land pretty early in the day. I didn't want to be walking those lonely, secluded roads through the woods alone in the dark, so I hurried as fast as I could, running and sprinting as much as possible. But it wasn't enough. By the time I had made it back to the bottom of the hill near the bridge, it was almost completely dark, and there was an eerie sort of glow brought about by a very bright, nearly full moon that was rising. At the top of the hill, the road was perfectly straight and flat, with woods on the left side and a large field on the right. About a half mile up from the top of the hill is my grandparents' house, and you can see it from there. As I top the hill, I can see the faint glow of the lights at their house, and I feel a sense of relief because I was kind of freaking out a little bit. 
but knowing that I was so close and could see the house offered me a little bit of comfort. The field on the right was somewhat illuminated by the glow of the moon, and my eyes had adjusted to the darkness rather well at this point. As I walked up the road, I heard something from the left, behind me on the wooded side of the road. It sounded like leaves being rustled. I turned to look, and I see nothing at first. But then as my eyes begin to focus, I see something in the ditch. A black, shadowy shape, slowly moving toward me. At first I thought it was a dog, but then I realized it was much too large to be a dog. And then I realized it wasn't actually walking on four legs. It was crawling, like a person would. I stared for a moment, out of sheer confusion, trying to figure out what I was seeing. And then, a jolt of fear shot through me as it dawned on me that whatever this thing was, it had been trying to sneak up on me. At that exact moment, this thing stood upright out of the ditch on two legs like a person. It had the shape of a human, long arms, legs, and was proportioned as such. It stood roughly seven to eight feet in height and was completely covered in black or maybe dark brown hair. Its face was dark in color, and I can't recall seeing much in the way of features due to it being night. It was no bear, that's for certain, or any other kind of animal that I had ever seen for that matter. I immediately dropped the bag of stuff I had been carrying and bolted as fast as my legs could take me toward my grandparents' house. I heard a heavy breathing, guttural, growling kind of sound behind me, and I heard this thing's footsteps running up behind me on the gravel as it gave chase. I didn't turn around. I was certain that it would grab me at any moment. Then I heard it crash off into the woods and let out an earth-shattering, ungodly scream unlike anything I have ever heard before or since. I'm positive this thing could have easily caught me had it wanted to, but for some reason, it let me go. By the time I reached my grandparents, my heart felt as if it would explode from the combination of the adrenaline rush I had from being scared beyond any type of fear I had ever felt before or since, and from full-on sprinting as hard and as fast as possible for about a half mile straight. I flew into the house and, in an incoherent mess of hyperactive gibberish, tried to explain to my grandparents what had just happened. My grandmother didn't really seem to believe me, but did believe that something had scared me and acted rather weird about the whole thing. She tried to convince me that it was just a dog or some other animal. The next morning I woke up and found my grandpa sitting outside whittling wood underneath the shade tree in the front yard, as he often liked to do. I went and sat down beside him in one of the old metal lawn chairs. He was a very rational man, down to earth, and had grown up in and hunted that area his entire life. He knew every square inch of it, mapped into his mind. He knew every type of critter and creature that lived in those woods, what noise they made, where to find them, how to catch them. I had only been hunting with him for a couple of years, but had been going out into those woods with him since a pretty young age, on walks and things like that. He had passed a lot of his knowledge down to me during those adventures. I spoke to him about what had happened to me the night before, and told him that I knew what I saw. It wasn't my overactive imagination. I wasn't making it up. And it definitely wasn't a dog. He knew that I wasn't just some dumb 13-year-old kid. And he knew that I knew the things he taught me. He stopped whittling, looked me right in the eyes, and said, I know what you saw. I've seen it before, too. There's things out in them woods that people don't understand and that a person ought not go fooling with. I remember those words clearly to this day because it gave me affirmation, but at the same time made me realize that whatever I had seen was very real in existence and beyond my understanding. My grandpa then went on to tell me that far back in the woods there are some cliffs and that the bottom of one of those cliffs is a cave. He told me that the cave is where the creature lived. He had once stumbled upon it a long time ago when he was hunting. He said he was standing on the top of the cliff looking at it when a creature fitting the same description as mine 
emerged and began screaming wildly at him and throwing rocks. He said he took a shot at it, missed, and then this thing gave chase. But my grandpa was on top of the cliff, so in order to get to him, this thing had to go around a pretty good distance and then up, which he said it quickly began to do, so he hightailed it out of there in a hurry. He said the whole way back home he felt as if he were being watched, and he kept hearing twigs snap behind him. He was certain that this thing was following him, stalking him. He made it home, and as he reached his front porch, he turned and looked back at the woods from where he'd come, and he saw it peeking out at him from behind a tree. Later that night, he said that he and my grandmother awoke in the early morning hours to large rocks being thrown at the house and ungodly howling noises from outside, and this thing trying to get into the house. He said he could hear it walking around the front porch, rattling the doorknobs, banging on windows, and it sounded like it was muttering to itself in a low, deep, garbled voice. But it didn't sound like a language, just a bunch of gibberish. After a while, the thing went back to throwing some more rocks and howling. So my grandpa grabbed his shotgun and fired it out the front door a few times into the darkness and into the direction of the howling. He said he heard it run back into the woods. He didn't know if he'd hit it or not. He said that was the last he'd ever seen nor heard from it, but over the years, an occasional farmer's cow would be mutilated, or someone's hunting dog would go inexplicably missing, or someone would have a story about some strange creature they'd seen. He also said it scared my grandmother beyond words, and she has absolutely refused to ever talk about it or even acknowledge that it happened, which explains her odd behavior when I told her what happened to me. I know it's a pretty far-fetched story, and you can believe it or not, it makes no difference to me. I know what I saw, and my grandpa knew what he saw, and neither of us have ever felt the need to convince anyone else of it. In fact, until today, I have never actually spoken of it to anyone other than my grandpa, and he passed away roughly ten years ago. This might not be the scariest story, but it sure put fear into us at the time. Years ago, a friend and I decided to go raccoon hunting on a large wooded piece of family land by a lake. We met at his house at about 11 p.m. and set off walking the half mile down the dirt road to the woods. We talked in low voices, catching up on things, and then we quieted down when we reached the fence where the property line was. We loaded our 22s and started looking for signs of our prey. The woods weren't totally quiet. They were full of country sounds, frogs singing on the lake, owls hooting back and forth in the trees, even mice running over the leaves that had fallen the previous fall. I was amazed how much noise a tiny little rodent could make. This whole time, we weren't really talking, just steadily walking through the dead leaves and pausing to listen to the sounds around us. Suddenly, completely out of the blue, the woods went dead silent. No frogs, no mice, no owls, nothing. My friend and I stopped in our tracks at the exact same time and commented on the silence. We stood there for a minute or so in dead silence, listening for a larger animal. We're not in bear country, so it couldn't be that. We listened for branches breaking, something that would indicate why everything went quiet, but there was nothing but the sound of our breathing. At the same time we agreed we should go, we clicked the safeties off on our rifles and got out of there as hastily but also as cautiously as we could manage, feeling a surge of adrenaline as we went. We didn't think to unload our rifles until we were a little more than halfway back to his house. Later. We both admitted that the silence dropping like that triggered something akin to an anxiety attack. I've been back to those woods several times since then, both in the daytime and at night, and I've never experienced anything close to that feeling. I 
I have a few creepy backwoods stories, and this one may be a little out there. It's more than just creepy woods, and I can't explain it. It could have been some sort of mass hysteria or a group hallucination that lasted multiple days, maybe even shared sleep paralysis, but I doubt it. The story starts like this. About 10 years ago, I'm a cocky little brat, 18 year old dude who thinks he has the world by the balls. The world had me by the balls, I later discovered, and I was with my very serious girlfriend of two years and counting. First time I ever dated a girl, and I really felt like I was in love and could see myself marrying this girl. Thank God that didn't happen, but that's another story. So my parents are really strict conservative Christians. They'd never let me and my girlfriend Caitlin share a room at night. Caitlin's parents couldn't have given less of a crap. They let us drink and we had our own bedroom upstairs. Looking back, her mom was kinda not the best mother, but she was nice enough. One weekend in summer, Caitlin and her parents asked if I'd like to come up three hours north to her grandparents' town for their anniversary. This place is hours away from civilization, as secluded as it gets. See Amish people the whole way up northern Michigan. I said hell yeah. Her grandparents are wealthy and fun and I knew it'd be a good time. But too many people stayed in their big lovely house so we had to rent a cabin. In the woods. This cabin is at least 20 minutes from the village or town or whatever. Right away it seemed off. Is back in the woods off this creepy, secluded, quiet dirt road. Everything silent. The houses next to us were dead silent and empty. It was just us. I'm not worried about it at all because I have this wonderful and fleeting confidence that alcohol and the possibility of getting some action this weekend will give a young man. PBR and hormones, baby. So I'll skip the daytime activities as they don't matter here. We just had a regular fun time with family and we returned to our cabin for the night. Our room was upstairs in this sort of loft area. The cabin was oldish and rustic and just empty. Not physically empty, just void of something. The kind of emptiness you can feel. But hey, we're way out in the woods and no one has probably been here in ages. Of course it feels dead in here. That night was when it happened, and I'm positive that I'll miss a bunch of details as I blocked it out of my memory until I saw this subreddit and it all came back. I'm sleeping in this god-awful mattress next to Caitlin, and I drift off and have the most horrible nightmares. They weren't dreams, though. It was exactly real. It was as though my soul was able to move around and interact with the bedroom our bodies were lying fast in asleep but I was awake. My body was asleep, but I was somehow completely mobile without a body. The bedroom was dark and the moonlight from the window lit up the center of the room. And there were so many people there, all deceased, standing in a circle chanting. In the center of their circle, I see a little girl with blonde hair, maybe seven years old, and she's in this white dress, almost glowing in the most disturbing way. The people turn to me as they notice that I'm watching and aware. They slowly approach me, all chanting and murmuring. I can't remember the words exactly, but I'm positive they were performing a ritual and sacrificing or murdering this little girl. It was kind of like the scene from Rosemary's Baby, something that I never saw until very recently, by the way. They came at me with their hands outstretched, looking dead and rotten. And as they begin to strangle me, I wake up. And waking up is usually when everything goes back to normal. But I wake up and I see the rocking chair is rocking, like flying, as if somebody slammed it. At this point, I'm like, nope, F this. I close my eyes and just pray and hope that the sun will rise. It didn't. I fell back asleep. The next dream goes like this. I'm on a roller coaster with all sorts of people, and it's going straight up to the sky, like into heaven. I'm happy and stoked and cheering, and right before we get through the pearly gates, the roller coaster goes down, straight down, into the earth and into the fire and into hell. And I can hear blood-curdling screams for help, 
so much agony and terror. It was the most awful thing I've ever experienced. I could feel the burn of the fire and the pain of the scream surrounding me. Finally, I wake up and the sun's up. I am covered in sweat and I look over to see my girlfriend in the fetal position, shaking and crying. I ask her what's wrong, knowing that I already know the answer, but hoping it was something else. All she could say was, the girl, the girl. I asked her what happened, and she said she saw a little girl in a white dress standing in the middle of the room staring at us and dancing. She claimed she wasn't even asleep. She went on to explain how she'd wake up periodically to see the rocking chair just rocking its butt off. I hadn't even told her what I had seen, and she just confirmed everything, which made everything so much worse. I don't have an exciting end to this story. The next night and the night after, I didn't sleep. There was a Pawn Stars marathon on TV, thank God, and I stayed up all night with the lights on, blasting Pawn Stars to stay awake. I didn't sleep again until the car ride home. Caitlin and I talked about it maybe once or twice and then never spoke of it again. I'll never actually know what happened that night or if I was just crazy. All I can say for sure is I'm never going anywhere near that town again. As much as I'd like answers, I think I'd rather just forget about this one. I want to begin by clarifying that the majority of this post is a prelude to my actual upcoming amateur investigation. What I'll be documenting in this post is essentially a compilation of stories I've been told, some retellings of others, and also what little I've already checked out myself. I will not claim validity to any of the accounts I'm about to give you. All I can be certain of is that I trust dearly the person from which I continue to get a lot of these stories as they are the mother of a close friend I've known for over 10 years. Honestly, some of this stuff gets a little weird for belief, but I intend to put that to the test however I can, soon. The place I call my hometown and current town is a Kentucky county comprised of old coal mining towns that at one time had a bustling economy. Let's call it Arling. Unfortunately, coal mining died a slow and painful death, and so has my home. This saddens me greatly. Arling is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, nestled into the heart of one of the oldest mountain ranges on Earth. The Appalachian Mountains have a tangible, natural spirit to them. I also believe they are host to a variety of things we do not understand. I, along with my girlfriend and roommate, often hike on old trails around the county, in hopes of finding interesting sights to see. We are always looking for somewhere neat to hike far out into the sticks. I had a friend of mine ask some of his work buddies if they knew of any rural pathways to test out. One of them mentioned that his father had hiked a path ascending a mountain beside what we'll call the Old Lake, and that the place scared him to death. The Old Lake is part of a forsaken wildlife management area, about 10 miles outside of town toward the state line, at the base of Mount Mason. The government property lines only go so far. Beyond that is private land owned by a local wealthy family, presumably abandoned as well. The man's father told of how he had once hiked along the ascending trail that follows the creek from the lake and up into the mountains past the wildlife management area boundaries. I will refer to this trail as Lonesome Creek. The man crested a hill and prepared to briefly rest upon a flat spot. He quickly took notice of a shady campsite that had evidently been set up on the flat for some time. The site was unremarkable at first glance, nothing there but a fire pit surrounded by wooden chairs. But he could just barely see something else beyond the tree line. It looked as though someone haphazardly poked big sticks into the surrounding forest. A closer look revealed that what he was looking at were pikes staked into the dirt and adorned with several cat heads. The man's hair raised up as he felt something out there put its eyes on him, as he put it. 
he quickly put distance between himself and Lonesome Creek, and never again so much as visited the old lake. After hearing this story, it dawned on me that I had been told something similar years ago. This story too implied possible ritualistic activity on Mount Mason. As it goes, a mutual friend and his cousin had taken their ATVs on Lonesome Creek at night. Sometime into their ride, the pair spotted a makeshift sitting area right in the middle of the trail. It was shabbily constructed with a few chairs, as well as, quote, something like what a preacher puts his Bible on, a pulpit I think is what he meant. Even more frightening was a recently doused fire in front of the pulpit. Someone had been there just before they arrived. The two riders killed their engines and unseated themselves, looking around the ridge with their flashlights. As the silence soaked in, they could make out faint voices just beyond some trees on a steep incline near a ridge. Needless to say, they didn't bother shining their lights and left in a hurry. They probed no further. Remembering this incident was enough to have me look deeper into this harrowing mystery. The occult aspect of Appalachia has always intrigued me. Everything from folk magic to the blackest of practices pervades the history of the hill folk and their predominantly Scots-Irish ancestors who emigrated long ago. In the spirit of curiosity, my girlfriend and I took a midday ride up to the backside of the old lake, opposite from the frequented dockside where families boat and fish. The road was in rough shape, and upon arrival, it was obvious from the massive amount of trash that the Department of Fish and Wildlife had long abandoned this wildlife management area. We walked up the seemingly well-traveled path against the downward stream of the titular creek. After reaching the marked end of the wildlife management area, about a half mile in, we decided it was wise to go no farther. The sheer seclusion of the place pulled me in, but I needed to take time to plan carefully and gather up a few willing folks to walk along the old Lonesome Creek Trail. A quick check of Google Maps confirmed the garbage-ridden lakeside to indeed be the bottom of the trail. The path appeared to follow the creek up to a massive rocky ridge that wraps around the side of Mount Mason, leading to an overview of the newer, larger lake a few miles over. Finding out where to go was simple enough. I suspected that getting there would not be as such. The following Saturday, I managed to gather and prepare four of my friends to set out to the old lake. Two of us came with firearms and the other two brought knives and mace. Confident yet anxious, we left the dirty lakeside and headed up parallel to the creek. The lower part of the trail was lined with large jutting rocks that formed caves below and continued up the mountainside. These enormous jagged pieces seemed to have fallen long ago from the massive ridge, above which topped Mount Mason like a crown. Past the caves and closer to the lowest part of the ridge, the trail aligned into a rocky old creek bed, now diverted and empty. We stopped to rest at the bottom of a switchback, now at high enough elevation to be cradled by a lower portion of the ridge overhanging the trail's connecting elbow. After some respite under the stone's shade, we began our ascent to the top. The path soon wound away from the creek and continued to repeatedly switch back and forth up the side of a steep, stunningly green hill. Studded into the landscape were small scattered stones lain upon by long fallen trees, all covered in moss of a believably ancient color. From this point on, the trail was faint but identifiable. Despite the trash of the trailhead, this high up forest looked absolutely untouched. After mounting the hill, we wound through thick growth made of a tree I'd never seen. Low-hanging branches of a round profile surrounded the thin trunk, appearing like a cross between a weeping willow and an acorn tree. Beside that, there were quite a few other types of foliage that I had also never seen before. Once atop the hill, we finally checked in on Google Maps to see how far along the trail we were. To our dismay, we were pinpointed way off the trail on the map. This startled me considering there was only one visible trail along the whole path. What was even more startling is that we ended up on a trail not listed by Google Maps. Admittedly, this wasn't too worrisome since the pathway was fairly defined, despite not seeing much action. 
We assess that we should make the best of the situation anyway and press on a little farther to make good use of the remaining daylight. Google Maps showed that we were near a rock crawling and ATV tourist attraction on the state line called Hole in the Rock, a wagon tunnel that cut through the mountain's crown near the top. However, the last and only check-in for the area was five years prior. Apparently, we had found ourselves on an old wagon trail stretching from our side through the tunnel and into the next on the other side. The place was old for sure. Exciting was the notion of trekking through an archaic commerce road, passing over the old Native American land of Mount Mason. Interesting stuff. We resolved to find the wagon tunnel and descend before dark but we didn't make it there in time before having to turn around. I'll go ahead and tell you that nothing exciting happened, about which I am both disappointed and relieved. After hiking back down without incident, as expected, we left behind the old lake. It was hard not to dwell upon the chilling isolation felt at Lonesome Creek. The land was empty and quiet, not at all marred by frequent travel. I'm deadly serious when I tell you that this place had a very different energy than your typical nature trail. It evoked an unsettling combination of serenity and oppression. I found it to be the perfect place for strangeness in the primordial wilderness. Lonesome Creek seemed as isolated from the rest of Arling as Appalachia is to the rest of America. It can be easily ascertained that isolation of the spirit would certainly breed desolation of the soul. Yesterday, I rang up a lady we'll call Marla, whom I've known for quite a long time. Marla has been investigating the weird and wild for almost 20 years and has written a few books about local Kentucky myths, folklore, and paranormal stories. She has, with her own resources, even helped find the identity of an early 20th century cold case victim. Conveniently enough, it just also happens that she and her family live about a mile from the old lake, I knew that if anyone could point me to something, it would be Marla. To be quite honest, I didn't expect the volume or magnitude of some of the things she told me on that phone call. I have no bias toward the truth of the two stories I've already recounted. This is different to me. I believe this woman with everything in me, and I do not consider myself naive. I will relay to you the information she has given me, which consists of her own experiences as well as the accounts of her family members. I will do my best to tell them faithfully. When Marla married and moved to the old Lake Road, it seemed nice enough, rural and quiet. She had her first child in 1993, who would grow up to be one of my best friends. When he was barely a toddler, his maternal and paternal grandfathers often took him into the woods across the road from their house, through their family cemetery and up a long dirt path. One day, Marla received a call from her father, asking her to tell her father-in-law, who lived on the same property as Marla and her husband, not to take her son into the mountains that He said he'd seen some strange folk camping up there who seemed a little suspect. Her father must have been pretty concerned because later that evening, the state police showed up at the cemetery. The authorities informed Marla that they had to run off some people up on the mountain but that they appeared to be trying to set up a site to regularly meet and loiter for whatever purpose. Before leaving the cemetery, the policeman she was speaking to told her plainly, between me and you, they were doing some strange things up there. When pressed, he would not say, just shook his head and declined to answer. About a year later, Marla got the gall to go with her husband up to where the police had run off the loitering creeps. She claimed to have found small animal bones scattered around a clearly once established site and a concrete slab fitted into the dirt and etched with what she described as obviously evil symbology. This was a time before cell phones, so she has no photo evidence. The next weird experience to befall Marla didn't come for almost six years. It seemed to have spooked her more than anything else she's told me. One evening, Marla thought it would be fun to take her son, then age seven, on a walk to the old lake to check out the creek, catch salamanders and find rocks as they often did along the river, which runs behind their property. They made their way to the lake and followed Lonesome Creek up toward the initial incline and past the Mark Wildlife Management Area. Apart from the creek babble, Marla caught ear of what sounded like loud voices farther into the woods. As she and her son continued up to face the second incline, it became evident that a group of people were gathered toward Mason's crown. 
A loud voice echoed from above, booming and fervent like that of a typical Southern preacher. The voice spoke rapidly and was periodically answered by a group of voices which spoke in unison. Marla and her son listened closely. The chanting began to cease and everything fell quiet. The eerie silence was broken by the man's booming voice, angrily shouting in Marla's direction from high atop the ridge. Marla grabbed her son and ran all the way back down to the trailhead, fearing that whomever had gathered there had seen her and was warding her off. Like the others, she's never since been back to Lonesome Creek. Years after her experience with the chanting voices, Marla recounted a time her father and father-in-law had been part of something unexplainable when traveling the trail from the Kentucky side of Mount Mason. Though they followed a path that both had walked many times before, the two men became disoriented and got lost. Marla's father said that an anxious feeling washed over him and suddenly it was as if they simply were somewhere else entirely. They made it home unharmed in an amount of time they described as unusually short, but were never able to explain the event. It was later realized that they had somehow ended up on the other side of the state line on Mount Mason, way out there. This was not her only account of this phenomenon. Just two years after the incident her father described, two fish and wildlife officials showed up at her house in the middle of basically nowhere the men admitted that they had no clue where they were. They told Marla that they were trying to get to their destination on the neighbor state side, but somehow became lost and ended up on the Kentucky side. I find it unsettling that despite having maps and being otherwise very familiar with their territory, they ended up miles and miles off track. Marla noted that both were visibly shaken by the experience. As time has crept almost 20 years past, Marla has searched for answers to her experiences and those of her family, but has found few. The only presumption she's gleaned is that there have been unexplainable forces in these mountains since they were settled and probably long before. Appalachia is closely tied with various oddities and old traditions, both good and bad, benign covens of witches yet existent within unbroken bloodlines, wannabe satanic sects composed of lunatics who gain pleasure through the infliction of suffering, old secret societies once prominent but that have since died with the coal country's prosperous towns dotted across all of rural Appalachia. There is much to be uncovered and there's even more that should be altogether left alone. If you think about it for a moment, this sort of place really is a perfect hiding place for things of a darker nature an isolated mountain range with an ancient soul, wherein you can find whatever old secrets you might be looking for. My dilemma is whether or not trying to find them is a good idea. The things I've written are the only bits of information that Marla has given me relevant to the ill air at Lonesome Creek and Mount Mason. There's much more that she has shared with me regarding other areas in Arling and surrounding counties as well. I fully intend on going back to follow the stream of Lonesome Creek itself up the mountain and onto that ridge. I want to be fully prepared to investigate the secrets of the creepy old wagon trail where dark things surely take place. Interestingly enough, I have discovered that a wealthy old family in Arling owns the suspect property along the ridge. Maybe next time we will find the path to get there. Marla and I are supposed to meet in person so that I can write some of her stories down for good detail. I look forward to that. And I will continue to share with you whatever I'm able. So a little background to set the mood. And this is all 100% true. I grew up in central New York, between Parrish and Mexico. You can look up Happy Valley and see just how creepy it is. Surrounded by woods, farms, fields, gravel pits, and swamps. I'm outside roughly 90% of my day. I do firewood, logging, farming, hunting, fishing, and trapping. I'm certainly used to the creepy shit in the woods. 
So much so that there's a predator light on my walking stick, which is a backwards facing LED light. People deter tigers from leapfrogging on them by wearing masks on the back of their heads, but we only have fishers, coyotes, and the occasional wandering bear. So every night on the wood line, I have a pimp fire pit set up that I use pretty much every single night. It's not uncommon to see raccoons and foxes. We feed the birds and even have a huge turkey and deer feeder. My house is basically a safe haven. We constantly have critters running amok in the daytime and especially at night in the shadows. So you get used to the random ground leaf flutter, twig snapping, chittering critters in the forest nooks and crannies staring at you, wondering if you're going to eat that last hot dog. It can be unnerving, honestly. But then there's my clicky buddy who always says goodnight to me. It began when I moved into a good buddy's house. He and I are very much alike. Hard-working outdoorsmen who hunt, trap, and collect firewood. I've recently gone through some changes in my life and I was lucky enough to move in with him, which is only four miles away from where I grew up. Every night after working or running through a trap line, I'd work on my fire pit, which is in a clearing we made to store firewood right on the edge of the forest. I'd hear this clicking, like a slower version of the predator's clicks. The sound was kind of random at first, but then I noticed it reacting to me moving, grabbing a beer, click, click, packing a pipe, click, building up the fire or taking a leak, click, click. At first it freaked me out, like to the point of carrying a bigger knife than I should. Some nights a loaded 223. A couple of those wandering bears came within a quarter mile of my fire pit, so. I wear a headlamp, I have a lit lantern by me, a roaring fire, a machete, the walking stick, so I'm pretty comfy, even though I'm kind of crapping my pants as I yell at the darkness to come and get me. So when the fire dies down, no more smoke for the pipe or hot dogs for my belly, I'll start packing up my stuff and get ready to head inside. Click, click. I look around for eye shine, nothing. I move closer to the woods, stray a little to reposition my headlamp casting shadows. Click. I've even clicked back and it kind of responded to me a few times, but I could just be stoned out of my gourd. I mean, it's freaked me out so much a few times I've literally built up the fire just to walk away. My fire pit is built for that kind of thing. I'm literally a pro at having fires. When I did, click, click. Now, we do have nocturnal flying squirrels here. And one trick the squirrels, all squirrels do, is that they'll hide on the opposite sides of trees as you pass by. You'll never see or hear them. You won't know that they're there. Unless a friend is walking 20 feet in the same direction and you're both looking up at the trees, the squirrels can't hide from both of you. But I don't think this is what I'm hearing. It would make sense since I can't see whatever's making the noise, but they tend to chitter more than click click. So now it's been over a year or so of hearing this sound and I'm nowhere closer to finding out what it is. I've come to accept it. I'll even leave some food at the edge of the wood line, beginning of a trail for it, which is usually where I relieve myself and then go back to the fire or inside. So almost every night, I'll hear the clicks and I'll say goodnight back or call its mom a dirty name. I mean, I don't speak click, who knows what I'm saying, but I click back anyway. And then I head inside. I suppose this isn't a scary story, it's just creepy, and I wanted to share it. I know it might seem stupid, but this sound has bugged me since the day I first heard it back in May. 
I could swear that I've never heard anything like this. I went with my dog in a pretty offhand natural reserve in Italy for a walk. This one is a particular reserve. It's not like a park. It's wild and no human activity is allowed, except for monitoring and hiking in specific days of the month. It's because it's the habitat of a very rare bird, but I can't remember which one. This means that I was basically alone with my dog, but still, it was a super sunny day and the place isn't dangerous at all. No slopes, no hard paths, only a very big river. And if you avoid getting super close to it, you'll have no problems with it. Everything was great until lunch. While eating, out of nowhere, I started to hear this very strange noise coming from multiple directions in the woods. Now, it was super weird since I've read all the info of the reserve and it says that whenever they make monitoring operations, they deny access and I was pretty sure that I was the only person there. This place only has one entrance and it's totally surrounded by a swamp. There are no cars except for mine and not a soul out there. The closest structure is about 25 kilometers away from that place. My dog started to bark and became so nervous that I had to calm her down for a while. Something like this has never happened before. My dog, a lab, has heard many noises in the woods even louder than this one, but has never gotten nervous. I'll try to explain what the sound was like. The best way I can describe it is that it was like a loud metallic bang, like when you hit a stick against a metallic can, immediately followed by the sound of an engine failing, like when you try to start an old tractor and it won't. It occurred three or four times per minute and lasted about seven to eight seconds each time. The noise made my dog and I very uneasy. I don't know why. I'm used to hiking in the woods, even at night. And in my life, I've heard much scarier sounds, like thunder and lightning striking close to the ground, very close to my house. But this one was somehow dreadful. It made me and my dog freak out. So I decided to pack everything up, head back to the car, and leave the area as soon as possible. The noise never stopped. It continued to occur in the same way I described it. And there's another weird thing. It always sounded very close. No matter where I went or how far I parked my car, around an hour of hiking from the spot I first heard it, it always sounded like it was the same distance away, like it was following us, maintaining about 30 meters of distance. My dog calmed down and fell asleep only when we were in the car and halfway back home. I felt super tired too, as soon as I calmed down, and I barely managed the drive to my home, trying not to fall asleep the whole way. That evening, I had a massive headache and felt very off. So I immediately drifted to bed. In your opinion, what was that? I didn't cross anyone to ask them on the reserve or at the office, it was closed that day. Nobody has ever been able to tell me what produced that noise. Plus, as I said, the reserve is super close to a river and a swamp. Maybe those things are connected. What do you think? My friend and I were hiking in Blue Ridge, Georgia. We were just going camping for one day, and the trail was part of the Appalachian Trail, near the very start of it. My friend told me a story about one of his friends and said that he heard voices and footsteps at night near Blood Mountain. He said that he had to night hike because the noises were so intense. We found a campsite and we set up shop. As it got darker, we got a bad feeling. 
like something was watching us. And then it started. We saw a pair of red glowing eyes about 100 to 150 feet away from our fire. Then my friend goes to dunk his head in the creek near our tent. And he explains that something pushed him into the water. His shirt was soaked and he hit his nose on a rock and was bleeding. After that, we heard a woman's voice. He was speaking, but we couldn't really make out the words. We heard it in front of us, behind us, and to the left of us over the creek. It could have been a hiker, but to the left, there was no trail. And if it was somebody night hiking, they weren't using a flashlight. We also heard footsteps around us and sticks snapping. Finally, we just got in the tent and tried to sleep. My friend fell asleep before I did, and I heard twigs snapping right next to my head outside of the tent. That was pretty much our entire night, but it was very, very creepy. If you decide to go camping in Blue Ridge, just know there are things out there lurking in the night. I live in a part of Alaska where there's nothing but woods all around. I'm the only person who lives in these woods for about 20 miles in all directions, so visitors are always a special event. This time, however, it was a creepy event. I decided to go camping in the woods about five miles away from my cabin because I was stressed out that week and needed to get away from it all. I found a nice clearing and set up camp before nightfall. These woods aren't very quiet. There are always birds chirping, the rustling of leaves, and bunnies and deer running about. It was about 7 o'clock p.m. when the first incident happened. I was listening to the wilderness outside of my tent while the fire was dying down outside. I had my pack strung up in a tree and had my 12-gauge shotgun unloaded to my right. All of a sudden, all the noises in the area stopped. But then I heard what sounded like snow crunching. I thought it was just a deer. The only real predators in the area that I had known about were bears. But this was far too heavy to be a deer or a bear. It was circling my camp. All I could hear was the snow crunching underfoot. It sounded like it was a two-legged animal, slowly getting closer. It did this for hours. I had my 12-gauge ready, but only remembered it wasn't loaded when the animal was about seven feet away from my tent. I grabbed my box of buckshot and put the first shell in. Click. The footsteps stopped. Click, click, click. I kept straining to hear anything but it never came. I fell asleep for a few hours, but woke up at about 2 a.m. My tent was open. My shotgun was right outside of my tent. I felt like I was being watched. All I could see were the stars in the pitch black nothingness, but two stars moved. I didn't know how to react. The two stars that moved were now coming closer. They were eyes. The animal had to have been nine feet tall. It kept coming closer. I could smell it now. It smelled like rotten meat and death. My shotgun was only a foot away from my hand. I carefully grabbed it. I prayed that it was still loaded and that this thing hadn't unloaded it. I pumped a shell into the chamber and took the shot. The light was almost blinding against the dark wilderness, but what I saw was worse. 
It was hairy, too hairy to be a human, too long to be a bear. Its feet were gigantic and they were a darkish color. The face had no hair, but was the same color as the feet. The eyes were huge and were looking right at me. The mouth was wide open and the teeth were long and yellow. The arms were long and hairy, just like the legs. Its height was about nine feet tall, like I said, maybe a few inches less. After the shot, I heard a scream that shook the tent and the ground around it. I hit the animal. I heard it run off into the wilderness, screaming all the way. I started packing right up in the pitch black night, looking up at the stars. Nothing moved this time though. As I was leaving the clearing in which I made my camp, I looked back and saw those same huge eyes shining in the darkness and they moved toward me. I ran through the woods, unsure of where I was going or what time it was. I could hear the leaves snapping behind me. And when I looked back, the eyes were there, but they were closer this time. I saw the lights of my house in the distance through the thick woods. I could still hear the snapping, but it was farther back this time. I made it home and locked my door. The paranoia almost made me pass out. I still felt like I was being watched, even though I closed all the curtains. The only window without curtains or blinds was a very small window that was above the kitchen sink. I was in the living room for about an hour. It was now 5.30 in the morning and the sun would be rising. I looked around the house, still paranoid. I saw the window above the sink in the kitchen, but there was nothing there. I felt relieved for a second until the eyes moved into place there, looking right at me. We made eye contact and I saw the first rays of sunlight come through the window. The animal grunted and stomped back into the forest, shaking the ground and cabin as it moved. I don't see it often anymore, but it does show up. Sometimes when I'm in the living room watching a movie, or making food in the kitchen, I see the eyes. It only comes at night, but it's there. I feel that we've come to an agreement. I stay away from the woods at night and I don't get eaten. I'll update you if anything else happens, but it's been months since the first incident and nothing drastic has happened yet. It hasn't shown up in the last few days actually, but I'm sure it'll be back soon. Where I live, we have had relatively few bid cases. There were almost none at all back in the fall. Because of that, Although we were still living under certain restrictions, we had more public health sanctioned freedoms than many other places. For example, at the time, we were permitted to share our social bubble with one other household and travel within our region. My family and our fellow bubble family decided to take advantage of this by going on a fall getaway. We rented two side-by-side -side cabins in a beautiful waterfront wooded area and had a lovely relaxing weekend. Although there were other cabins nearby, most were not occupied and we saw no other people. Although we did hear a dog barking a few times somewhere not far off. On our final night there, my son decided to sleep in the other cabin with his bubble siblings. Around 11 p.m. he called over, asking for some forgotten thing. It was a very dark night, and there were certainly no street lights in the deeply wooded cabin area. So I grabbed my flashlight and walked the short distance to the neighboring cabin to deliver whatever it was that he needed. On the walk back, I heard a whistle. It was a very human sounding whistle exactly the kind of whistle one makes to call in a dog. 
It sounded very close, but shining my light around, I saw nobody. I heard it again and assumed someone was whistling for the dog we'd heard earlier, so I didn't think much of it. A short time later, another call came from next door. My son couldn't settle and wanted to come back to our cabin. This time, my husband and I both walked over, collected our child and his stuff, said goodnight to our bubble family and walked back. We heard the same whistle again, several times. It seemed to be on the dirt road ahead of us, moving gradually away. My husband commented that the dog must have gotten loose and the owner was out looking for it. Inside our cabin, we continued to hear the whistling, coming at irregular intervals of maybe two to four minutes. At first, it would be loud and seemed quite nearby. Then it would gradually grow fainter, then stop as though the whistler had moved out of earshot. Then it would seem to circle around, coming from the other direction, getting louder as it moved past our cabin, then fading again into the distance. Then it would start all over again. Still not thinking much of it, my husband climbed into the loft to go to sleep, while I started to pack for the trip home the next day. Our son was sleeping in a little room on the main floor to the left of the front door, and the small window in his room was cracked open to let in the unseasonably warm night air. I was standing by that window, quietly gathering his scattered things, while the whistle once again drew closer. But this time, instead of fading as it passed by, the next one was very close and incredibly loud, as though the whistler was just outside my son's window. The blind was down, but I was sure someone was on the porch, right outside. I leapt to the front door, flung it open, and threw on the porch light, ready to tell off some prankster on our doorstep. Nobody was there. I grabbed my flashlight and took a few steps out past the circle of light, then thought better of it and retreated inside. I locked up the cabin, closed and latched all the windows and lowered all the blinds. If someone was creeping around outside our cabin, I didn't want them looking in at us from the darkness. Deciding that I did not want to leave my sleeping son downstairs by himself, I settled on the sofa with a book. The whistles continued. Between each one, I would convince myself it was just a bird or an animal, only to hear it again and be certain that it could only be a human sound. The irregularity of it and the slight variations in pitch and tone also told me that it wasn't something mechanical or electrical or automated. Around 1.30 in the morning, my husband suddenly got up and started to get dressed. I asked him what he was doing. I'm going to find out whoever that is and ask them why they've been whistling for hours, he said. I was horrified. My husband is a pretty big guy and I was as curious as he was, but I also felt deep in my bones that it would not be safe for him to go outside that night. I insisted that he go back to bed and thankfully he did. I sat vigil listening to the intermittent whistles for at least another hour until finally I dozed off on the sofa. When I awoke, it was morning. The sun was peeking around the blinds and the whistling had stopped. I cautiously peered outside, half expecting to see some sort of evidence of a nightmare intruder, but there was none. A little while later, we wandered next door, coffee mugs in hand, to get our friends take on the mystery whistler. Amazingly, they had not heard a thing, despite the fact that the sound was so clearly audible in our cabin and would have had to have passed right by them. We couldn't understand how they hadn't heard it. At checkout, I asked the woman at the kiosk down the road about it, but she just looked at me strangely and said she didn't know what it could have been. When I got home, I searched for audios of bird calls common to the area, 
and then ones not common to the area in the hope of finding that same whistle. Nothing I found was even close, and we still don't know what we heard that night, circling for hours and stopping just outside our cabin door. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by. We were like two peas in a pod. We were both adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad lived there for quite a while. So they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were maybe around 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow. And feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. Anyway, we played in the meadow and stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. Can't explain it, I just felt really uneasy. Anyway, the day faded away into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad picked up his fishing gear, and we all walked back to the truck on this long, winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four wheel drive, but being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open, with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction but didn't see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we'd come. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind whatever it was, seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods, to deer, to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard, and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol, and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent and he was in his own tent not far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke sometime in the middle of the night to hear something or someone walking outside. As I lay still, listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs because it had a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was sounded big, as I could hear its weight, if that makes sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet, but deep, heavy breathing at times. As I lay there, listening, I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite, and then back to our tent, 
almost as if it was walking in a big, repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long. It felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened until eventually I fell asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain, and to this day, it lingers in the back of my mind whenever I camp. I always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. So this happened relatively recently. My friends and I were living at a cabin in Lake Tahoe in California. It was in May, so not snowing, but the nights got down to near freezing temperatures. We had gotten some firewood burning in the fireplace and the three of us were chilling around it. We were drinking scotch and had turned down all the lights all the way down in the cabin. The nearby houses were about 300 yards out and they had their lights down as well. We heard creaking on our roof for two to three seconds, which stopped. That was followed by what sounded like a bag or something mildly heavy dropping on the roof. Then it was followed by the scariest, heaviest rumble any of us had ever heard. The entire roof shook, but nothing else in the house did. So we knew it wasn't an earthquake. We almost felt like something broke the roof and was coming down the stairs to get us. We screamed and picked up the hot fire pokers and searched through the cabin, tapping walls and the attic area. We looked up the chimney for raccoons as they tend to hide there. Also, this wasn't the first night we had had the fire. If a raccoon mama was nesting, she would have fell through the chimney. We found nothing. We saw our neighboring house turn on their lights and they came out with searchlights. They had heard a similar sound. We all thought a bear had run from our roof to theirs, but it's unusual for a bear to do that. The neighbor's dog was quiet through it all. I checked that there was no way out from the chimney besides up. So if something was in there, it couldn't have escaped the roof without popping the lid, which was intact. We don't know what it was. For the next two nights, we had a fire up, nothing. Not sure what it was, and perhaps I'll never know. This incident happened in 1963 in BC. I was 22 and on my honeymoon when I saw a creature, what I would later call a Bigfoot. I saw it in the clear light of day, free of any obstruction, and I have thought about it every day since. My husband and I were camping in the Broken Islands. It was early June and the weather was beautiful. It was about seven in the evening and I walked to the edge of the water and began to wade out. The water came up to just below my shorts. I stood there and admired the beauty. The sun had not started to set yet, and there was a peaceful stillness at that moment. My husband was asleep in the tent, and I thought to wake him so we could cook dinner together. I turned back toward the beach, and it was standing there, motionless. I didn't hear it make a sound. The beachhead was gravel and rocks that crunched and clicked as we moved around were everywhere, but I didn't hear this thing at all. I couldn't understand what I was looking at and just stood frozen. My eyes were going all over its body, trying to comprehend. I thought it was a naked man at first. It was taller than me by a wide margin. 
I was five foot eight, and this probably was over a foot taller. It was lean and lanky, like a basketball player. It hunched at the shoulders, had long arms that hung at its sides in a non-threatening manner. It had long fingers with black nails. It stood with its legs close together and had long feet, just like its hands and fingers. It had a round head and the face looked like a person, but different. Something was off. The body was covered in a brownish hair, but its body outline was still visible. The hair stuck up like an orangutan. The skin on the hands, feet, and face was visible and grayish, dusty and ashy looking. Its eyes were black and I couldn't see any other color. We just stood there looking at each other. I was stunned and it was indifferent. He never looked away, but he had an expression of indifference. I said, hello, in a broken half whisper. I couldn't think of what else to do. He smiled at me. His lips peeled back, revealing large teeth like a horse's. They looked too big and square for the mouth. When I looked at it in the face, the eyes at that moment, I realized that this was not a person. It was like a person, but it was something different. A wave of nausea overtook me. I began to vomit and felt faint. The world started to spin. I moved toward the shore and fell on my hands and knees. I heaved with such force into the dirt. The spinning stopped and I sat up. He was gone. I was there on my knees and just kept replaying the incident in my head for I don't know how long. I stripped off my clothes and cleaned myself in the water. The sun was beginning to set and I got dressed and lay next to my husband. I don't remember sleeping, just fever, chills and dizziness. We left the next day. I never told my husband what I saw. We split up five years later. I live in Texas. I've remarried, had children, grandchildren, gotten divorced again and remarried again. I never told a soul about what I saw. I would go to the library and look for books about monsters, trying to understand what it was, that thing I saw. Bigfoot became popular in the late 60s and 70s. I saw the infamous PGF footage. That's not like what I saw. What I stood staring at, what changed me forever, was something else. I came from a typical Texas all-American family. I wasn't supposed to see this. Now I'm someone with a secret, something I could never talk about in my real life. My interest in this subject has been a complete secret. No one who knows me would ever guess. I have never said this out loud, but in 1963, I saw a Bigfoot. First of all, I don't know if this will be scary to you. It was for me when it happened, and I still get a little frightened when I remember it. I can assure you this story is 100% true. Every time I see those involved, I ask them to remember, and they do, so I'm not crazy. So my story starts when I was 15 years old, in 2012. Three of my very best friends and I, I'll call them Luke, 17, Louis, 16, and Gary, 15, decided to go camping. And since our dads all worked in the military, we had access to some woods that weren't very far from our homes, three miles at most. Of course, we weren't trained on anything, but since I lived some time in the middle of the Amazon forest, I had confidence that I could handle a night not very far from my house. It was July, which is winter here in Brazil, and it was really cold. 
like five degrees Celsius kind of cold. And things were going pretty much as you would expect from a camp in the woods. We pretty much sat there and chatted until about one o'clock in the morning. Then we decided to take shifts in duos to watch our tents for any animals that could be near. We were afraid of jaguars, but probably the most that could get near us would be some capybaras that are pretty common in the region. At around 4 a.m., Gary, my duo, was outside the tent, calling for me to stay up with him. But as it was so cold, I wanted to stay inside, saying that no animal would go near us with the noise we were making. After like five minutes of back and forth between us, we noticed that we could not hear any kind of forest noises, like crickets, owls, or twigs breaking due to animals passing by. A feeling of uneasiness started to grow between us. Now, I know this whole thing of no forest noise sounds a little cliche, but I swear this is real when something weird is about to happen. When this feeling appeared, we stopped arguing and started to pay attention for what was happening around us. We didn't want to wake up Luke and Lewis because we thought we were just being silly and that nothing would happen. We were just working ourselves up. And then, from the middle of the woods, we hear a scream. It sounded like a woman screaming, but at the same time, it didn't. The scream sounded human, but something was off. It had some kind of animalistic tone behind it. It's really hard to explain. I've searched all over the internet, and I can't find any creature that sounded like this. I firmly believe it wasn't a human screaming. Besides, what would a woman be doing in those woods, alone, at night? With a sound, Luke and Lewis woke up, a little disoriented, while Gary and I jumped out of the tent and grabbed some sticks. That was the only thing we had that could serve as a weapon. Needless to say, we did not sleep the rest of the night, as we not so patiently awaited the morning to come. After what felt like hours, but probably was no more than five minutes, the forest resumed its regular noises, and we calmed down a little bit. When the sun rose, we packed our things as fast as we could, and left. When we were getting outside of the forest, we told the military that was guarding the woods what we heard, but I'm not really sure if they believed some random teenagers. I'm still friends with those guys that camped with me, and as I said, Every time I see them, I ask if they remember, and they all say that they do. It was not a jaguar or any kind of animal, like I said, that I've ever heard before. Even after research, I can't find anything that sounds like it. To this day, we don't know what kind of danger we might have been in. My friends, we'll call them Amy and Serafina, have lived most of their lives in the suburbs and cities. They never have been to the backwoods by any stretch of the imagination, but they were even more inexperienced with camping when they were juniors in college. They borrowed a tent, sleeping bags, and a nylon insulated cooler, packed them in Amy's Toyota hatchback, and drove to a state park in southern Minnesota. Down-to-earth Amy noted all the warning signs about black bear thwarting best practices at the park entrance, but didn't push spacey artistic Serafina too much about these. A mix of excitement and tiredness gripped them both after their long drive, the setting up of the two-person tent, and making dinner. They ate dinner at the campsite's little wooden picnic table, enjoying the sounds of the birds. Amy, the driver, was the most tired and turned in for the night first. She was grateful that Serafina had volunteered to clean up after dinner and dispose of the garbage. Amy was asleep when Serafina entered the tent not long after. Hours passed. 
Amy shook deep sleeping Serafina, who immediately knew why Amy woke her and began shivering in her sleeping bag. Fierce and desperate animals were locked in a midnight battle on, under, and around the picnic table. Did you pack the food and the garbage back in the car? Amy mouthed to Serafina. Serafina shook her head and tried to hold in the tears. In fact, Serafina had left their much enjoyed box of Cheez Its right in the middle of the table, and the garbage bag and soft sided cooler right beneath. The growls and snarls outside the tent were replaced on one side of the conflict by squeals and screams and rustling farther and farther away into the woods. There was a moment of silence. Then, snuffling, snorting, and groaning. Something big was outside the tent, low to the ground. It had a musky stench. The girls didn't dare turn on their flashlights. An outline of an enormous, inhuman face, a snuffling muzzle, was pressed into the cheap fabric of the tent. Sarah and Amy clutched each other, shivering uncontrollably, squeezing together in the middle of the tent, as far away as possible from the face pressing into the nylon. Finally, the bear noisily moved off to worry the last scraps from their dinner into the woods. After dawn, when they dared to unzip the tent, Amy and Serafina gasped at the scene. The Cheez-Its box, their used paper plates and towels, all their food and all their garbage had been ripped to shreds and scattered all over the campsite and the nearby woods. There were confused tracks and scratches on and around the picnic table. Worst of all were the bear tracks, which circled around and around their tent, and a snout-shaped shallow ditch at intervals where the bear had apparently snuffled with only one sixth of an inch flimsy tent cloth, dividing it from my friends. It might not be paranormal, but it was still one of the scariest things that ever happened to them in the backwoods. When my dad was little, he used to spend a lot of time at his grandmother's. She lived up in the mountains, and she was one of those people who just took care of everyone. He said that he lost count of all the times that drunks or people on drugs would come in at all hours of the night, and she would always feed them, let them rest, and then send them on their way. She was a kind person, but also one who, what you see, is what you get and she wasn't afraid to tell you what was on her mind. He said that he grew up not being scared of much because of her, and he thought the world of her. But there was one event that happened to him in the woods that scares him to this day. It's one of the reasons that he barely hunts or scouts alone, if he can help it. He was about 17 or 18, and he had stayed with his grandmother so that he could go deer scouting the next morning. The next day, he gets up early and heads out. My dad has a good sense of direction, but for some reason that day, he got turned around and lost in the dense forests of the mountains. He walked and walked, and night fell, with him still clueless on whereabouts he was. Tired, frustrated, and a little uneasy, he stopped to take a break and sat down. He said that it was just pitch dark, so much so that his little flashlight didn't give him much light at all. He was thirsty and starving, and he just wanted to get back to his grandmother's. As he sat there, thinking about where to go, he heard heavy footsteps and twigs snapping behind him. This scared him at first, thinking that he might have come across a bear. He stood up, knowing that if it was, he needed to get the hell out of there, but to not be hasty about it, so as to spook it. He just starts calmly walking away, hoping that he was going in the right direction this time. But the footsteps followed him. They were extremely heavy, thudding behind him a distance away. But as he walked, 
he noticed that they were speeding up. My dad starts walking faster, and as you can guess, the footsteps become faster. In a short time, he hears them now maybe a couple of yards behind him. Scared out of his mind, he turns around and shines his little flashlight to see nothing except these huge hoof prints. In their wake, the grass was dead and everything around it was dying with each step. He starts freaking out and straight out sprints, not caring which way he's going. He just wants to get as far away from whatever that is as possible. The footsteps behind him are following suit, sprinting after him. He only glances back once more, still seeing nothing but giant hoof prints and dead grass, leaves, and things like that wherever they had landed. By now, he's not sure how long or how far he's been running when he sees lights in the distance. He runs toward them, hoping that somebody can help him if he's come upon a house or a store. He breaks out of the woods and joy floods over him when he sees that it's his grandmother's home. She's sitting on the porch. The lights outside are on. His grandmother was a religious woman, so she was reading her Bible at the time. It's embarrassing for him to admit now, but he said that he started screaming for her, tears falling down his cheeks, and she stands up and looks behind him. That's when she sees the hoof prints and hears the sounds herself. She holds her hand out to him and he grabs onto it tightly. She pulls him to her and then says loudly, you can't have him. He said that the silence that lingered after that was intense. He had buried his head into her shoulder. So when he looked up, all he could see were the hoof prints and the dead grass and leaves. She just held on to him as he cried, whispering to him that he was okay and that it was gone. He has no idea what was after him that night and he doesn't want to know, but he's pretty sure that his grandmother saved his life that night. Thank you.